Introduction and Theses of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Lang. The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walker. Translated by W. H. T. Dow. Introduction. The treatise which is herewith offered to the public will be found in the last analysis to be a searching study of the will of God as related to the will of man. From Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures teach us that the will of God is directed toward man along two distinct lines. While the divine will itself is always one and never self-contradictory, it operates from distinct purposes and for distinct ends. But no matter how it operates, the element of man's sin is always a factor in its operations. The will of God is related to the possibility and actuality of man's sinning, and exerts itself in two peculiar ways against man's sin and all its effects, by denouncing, opposing, fighting, and destroying them. In the first place, God has willed, is now willing, and will never cease willing, that man shall not sin. Sin is the absolute negation of that moral order and rule which God has set up for the universe that he created, and in which he placed man as his foremost creature. Sin is lawlessness, and constitutes the doer thereof a rebel against the righteous rule of his sovereign Lord. God created man in his own image. That means that the original human being, whom the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth and all their substance fashioned from a clod of earth, and made a living soul by breathing into him the breath of life, that this original primeval man was holy and righteous as his Creator is. He was holy because his entire being, body, soul, and spirit, with all their faculties and functions throughout man's life on earth, were consecrated solely and entirely to the service of God in whatever station the divine ruler might place him, or to whatever task he might appoint. He was righteous because his essence and actions were in perfect conformity with the will of his Maker. His human intellect, will, and affections were at no point out of harmony with the divine intellect, will, and affections. God had put the attributes of holiness and righteousness, which exist in him as his very essence, in to man as created gifts and as reflections of that perfection which exists in him essentially. God has worked into the very nature of man the rule of right, of being right and doing right. This rule has been permanently fixed in man. St. Paul says it is written in man's heart. Even sin does not wholly eradicate it. For the pagans who are without a divine code of law, still do by nature the things contained in the code of law which God published at a later time. Accordingly, what God is by a law of his own, and in autonomous fashion, that man is to be, by submitting to his divine ruler and potentate, and in a heteronomous fashion. In God, holiness and righteousness are the characteristics of the one sublime sovereign being, to whom no one can issue a command or lay down a law. In man, holiness and righteousness are concreated characteristics of an intelligent creature of God that was made dependent upon and subaltern to God, of a being that was never meant to be a law unto himself, or the sole arbiter of his volitions, judgments, and desires, or answerable to no one for what he might choose to do. Of this fact, that a divine norm of holiness and righteousness is implanted in him, man is made aware by a faculty which his Maker created for him when he made man in his likeness. This faculty is called the conscience in man. It is the natural, instinctive ability of man to apply the divine rule of right to himself, to his moral state, in any given moment of his existence, and to any action of his, or to any failure to act when action is demanded of him while the divine norm of right implanted may be viewed as a judge who measures actions by the law and the testimony of witnesses and renders a decision declaring a person guilty or not guilty. Furthermore, man is made conscious 
by the forces of nature that he is living in a moral universe this great wide world and its history throughout nearly sixty centuries is a witness of god's sovereign rule over man and serves only for the glory of god its powers are spent for the benign purposes of the great creator its forces move in a heavenly rhythm to silent laws which he made for them man discovers that this world was not made to sin in that even the laws of nature resist the effort to sin and the brute and inanimate creatures rebel as it were against being pressed into service to sin man finds out that it is really more proper easier and more advantageous not to sin in a world like ours and that under existing conditions a person invariably makes life hard here for himself and others by sinning fully to suit sinners the world would have to be made over again the divine norm of right concreated in the first human being and transferred in the course of natural propagation from him to all his descendants was afterwards published in writing in the form of ten words or commandments and delivered by moses to the chosen people of israel whom god has made the standard bearers of the norm of righteousness in a morally decaying world and the keepers of his oracles which from time to time he communicated to man through inspired writers these ten words or the decalogue which were published more than two thousand years after the creation of adam formed the subject of many a discourse delivered to the followers of the true god in old testament times by their prophets teachers priests lawyers and scribes and in new testament times by jesus christ and his apostles the inspired records of all those deliverances is called the law in holy scripture and in the theological literature of the church the unwritten law in men's hearts and the conscience have revealed their existence in the efforts of natural man to do right to lead an upright life to serve his fellow men and his country to practice the virtue of religiousness and the domestic and civil virtues the laws of nations the ethical codes of society are emanations and manifestations of the ineradicable notion of right and wrong implanted in man's heart or of the natural moral law the fearful operations of this law are also exhibited in every device which the retributive justice of legislators and courts has set up for the punishment of wrongdoing and the protection of the good furthermore the terrors of the law are produced in every human heart under the smitings of the conscience which rivets his guilt upon the wrongdoer the nemesis exhibited in the old greek drama in shakespeare and in every great drama since is nothing else than the cry of despair wrung from guilty souls by the accusing and damning conscience the moral law in both its unwritten and written form is made ever enduring no single or concerted effort of lawless spirits and men can put it out of commission there will never be a time while this universe lasts when men will not feel the power of the moral law in their private and public lives nor will the moral law ever lack advocates defenders and champions amidst the growing corruptions of the decadent world hastening to its final collapse to the end of all things up to the bar of the last assize and beyond the crack of doom the holy and righteous will of god will be asserted throughout eternity by the rightly reprobated in their endless legally inflicted misery and by the righteous one in heaven who has made himself the end of the law to all who believe in him the end of the law is paul really justified to apply a phrase like that to an interminable matter like the divine rule of right and wrong yes for god who maintains his moral rule over men for ever through the expression of his holy and righteous will in the law has willed in the second place that the breakers of his law shall be given another chance to become righteous in his sight the hater of sin and sinners romans five ten ephesians two three is at the same time the lover of sinners and he has declared his good and gracious intentions to the breakers of his law by the same serious energetic and complete will which has been expressed in his holy and righteous law this second manifestation of the will of god for the secure of sinners from the fatal effects of their sinning 
viewed from our position in time and space, has occurred after and in consequence of sins coming into the world. To us this second manifestation of the divine will looks like an afterthought, somewhat like this. After beholding the wreckage which the sinner has made of the original plan of the Creator according to him, the Creator, instead of inflicting inexorably the condign punishment with which he had threatened the sinner, arrested himself, as it were, in his avenging act, and proposed to the sinner a way of escape from the doom of temporal corruption and eternal punishment which the sinner had merited. But this view would not be altogether correct. To God, nothing is an accident. He knows events before they occur, and he determines beforehand the limits of each happening. While in no causal relation to sin, God had foreseen in eternity its entrance into the world, and in eternity had prepared those safeguards against the ravages of sin which he afterwards proclaimed in the form of compassionate, merciful, comforting promises which he made to men in their ruined condition under sin. How these two forms of the divine will can coexist in God passes our comprehension. But that they always do exist in God at the same time, God has declared throughout his written revelation. In fact, the entire Bible which he breathed into the holy writers, from Moses to John, is nothing else than a continuous account and exposition of both his holy and righteous and his good and gracious will. While the former has been called the law, the latter has been given the endearing name of the gospel, that is, the goodly or godly spell or tale. So good that it could only come from God, the entire scriptures, which are chronologically divided into the Old and New Testaments, are topically or logically divided into the Law and Gospel, both of these running through both Testaments. In expounding to sinners his good and gracious will, God has stated in detail what all he purposes to do in order to help the sinner out of his sinful state. He has declared that in this divine endeavor to reclaim the sinner, the entire Holy Trinity is to be at work. As the manifestation of the Holy and Righteous Will is a manifestation by the entire Deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so the manifestation of the Good and Gracious Will embraces an account not only of the loving and gracious counsel of God in eternity, but also of the redeeming work performed by the Son of God and the sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost here in time. The contents of the Gospel have been enumerated by Christians in the three articles of the Apostles' Creed, as the contents of the Law have been condensed in the Ten Commandments. The Gospel, then, represents a profoundly thoughtful, elaborate, and orderly scheme of God to bring renegade man out of his rebel condition under sin into a state of loyalty to God under the Gospel. The sinner's rescue from his wretched condition by God's Gospel plan consists in this, that the sinner is told not only that God loves him in spite of his sin, but that he so loves the sinner, who is by nature a child of wrath, as to sacrifice his own son for him, and to send the Holy Spirit into his heart to produce in him repentance over his sins, and faith in the divine forgiveness of his sins. The love of God for sinners, of which the Gospel speaks, is not like the easy-going attitude which an indolent and indulgent parent assumes to the libertine son, when he tells him not to bother his mind about wrongdoing and its consequences, to forget it, and to consider himself still loved by his doting sire. No, the redemptive love of God works in conjunction with the righteousness and holiness of God. These divine attributes which God expounded to man in the law are not put out of commission by the love of God, but without destroying the sinner, as he has threatened to do, God, by his redeeming love, finds a way to meet the demands which God's righteousness and holiness make upon man, and to execute the lawful punishment which the sinner has incurred by breaking God's law. God sent his Son, co-equal and co-essential with himself, on earth in the form of a human being, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was made man and placed under the law that had been issued to man for the purpose of fulfilling it in man's place. Through the sinless life of Christ on earth, 
under every condition and in every relationship which the law of God determines for man, a treasurer of righteousness has been accumulated that balances even with all the demands of the divine law. This treasure Christ did not collect for himself, for he was in no need of it, being both the holy and righteous God and a holy and righteous man who never did the least wrong in thought, word, or deed. This treasure was designed by God to be given away to every sinner as his own, and to be regarded by God as the sinner's righteousness. In other words, God in his love decreed that the sinner who had lost the original righteousness of which he had been created, and who had spent his life in unrighteousness, should be made righteous by proxy, namely, by the foreign righteousness of the Son of God, who had spent his earthly life under the law as the sinner's substitute in the sinner's place. Furthermore, the sinless, impeccable Christ, at the end of his sojourn among men, suffered death, which no one has to undergo except sinners, for death is the wages of sin. There is only one explanation for the death of the incarnate Son of God. It is substitutive or vicarious. Just like his life under the law, Jesus died the death which sinners had deserved to die, and by his redeeming love God purposes to regard the death of his Son as the death which he would have to inflict upon every sinner for breaking his law. The gospel, then, embraces the entire work of Christ on earth as the evangelical teacher of men, as their evangelical high priest, who makes atonement for their iniquities, and as their evangelical regent, who sets up a new rule in their rebellious hearts by the power of his love. By his first sinful act, man had not only changed his relation to God from that of a loyal subject and loving friend to that of a mutinous rebel and hating enemy, but he had also changed his spiritual condition. The first sin was evidence that the human intellect, will, and affections no longer functioned as they had in the state of innocence. They had become blind, crooked, perverse, disorderly. Out of this changed condition, other sinful acts kept springing up, and this condition was passed on from father to child by natural propagation. The blight which had fallen on the bright intellect, the strong will, and the correct desires of Adam and Eve in their fatal hour of their first disobedience was inherited by their descendants. Fallen man no longer understood fully the will of God, no longer purposed to live according to that will, no longer desired to please God. Despite the thundering accusations of the divine law and his conscience against him, he continued to live for his pleasures and defied God continually. But he loved to cheat himself by believing that he was complying with the law of God, which he had grossly changed by his wanton misrepresentations. He managed to consider himself passing fair, and even better in God's sight. And he suppressed the misgivings and scruples which that would arise in him by reckless indifference or licentiousness or by increased hypocrisy. Of the divine law, then, he still retained a partial knowledge, but had no inclination sincerely to live up even to his partial knowledge. And of the divine gospel of the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake, he could have no knowledge, for by nature no man knew of this divine plan of salvation. The good and gracious will of God, then, had to embrace this kindness, that, after his Son had completed his work of redemption in the sinner's place on earth, God sent his Holy Spirit to men by means of his word. The Holy Spirit was to lead men to a true knowledge of their wretched and hopeless condition as lawbreakers, and lead them to genuine spiritual sorrow over their sins, crush their natural conceit and stubbornness, and make them contrite. Next, he was to make them understand the wonderful kindness of God in sending his Son to be their Savior. He was to make them accept by an act of faith the work of Christ as performed in their place, and then teach them to lead holy and righteous lives from gratitude to God after their pattern of Christ's life, until God would advance them after a life of progressive sanctification to be co-heirs of Christ in his everlasting glory. Since God confronts man at all times, both by his holy and righteous and by his good and gracious will, he wants him to understand clearly at any moment of his life on earth 
what his relation to God is when measured by either will. This is a task easy enough to grasp intellectually, but quite difficult to carry out amid the vicissitudes of a life in a world steeped in wickedness, and with a body very prone to sin. The task is to keep the law and the gospel of God strictly apart, using either for the better understanding of the other, but never mingling the teaching of the one into that of the other. Dr. Walther's treatise on this subject has been reproduced in this volume. It is one of the most searching disquisitions of the vitals of the truly Christian life. The reader will find in this treatise amazing insights opened up to him for his own inner life, and that of other Christians and fellow men in general. A word regarding the origin of this treatise and its English editions. The treatise is a posthumous product of the great Lutheran theologian. Walther was dead ten years when this treatise was first published. The manuscript of the treatise had been built up out of stenographic manuscripts made by a student who was listening to these lectures, which began Friday, September 12, 1884, and terminated Friday, November 6, 1885. Next to Walther's lectures on the inspiration of the Bible, this series of lectures is the most extensive and exhaustive series of lectures that Walther attempted in those gatherings on Friday evening during the scholastic year, when he loved to assemble the entire student body of Concordia Seminary and visiting clergymen and laymen around his desk and talk to them in a more or less informal manner on some doctrinal subject. It appears that in the introductory remarks at the opening of each lecture, Walther followed a manuscript of copious notes, but for the lecture itself he had, as a rule, a mere outline to guide him in his discourse. There's no doubt in the translator's mind that Rev. T. H. Klaus, whose stenographic reports of the lectures were used for the German edition in 1897, has correctly reported Dr. Walther, even to a fault. Dr. Ludwig Fairbringer, who acted as censor of the German edition, and had compared the manuscript of Rev. Klaus with his own notes, was likewise correct in seeing to it that the lecture form of this treatise, and therewith a good deal of the historical setting amid which the lectures were delivered, was preserved. A former listener of Walther can easily reproduce to his mind the events that happened in the Bayer Lars Hall on South Jefferson Avenue, Friday after Friday. Persons who never heard Walther can get a fair idea from these lectures how he addressed his students and handled the topic. A speaker, especially an extempore speaker, is not under the same restraints before his audience as an author before the reading public. Moreover, a greater freedom, even a certain abandon, is quite acceptable when an old, beloved professor is talking to an audience made up mostly entirely of his students. While Walther always strove to be very precise, very correct, and very decorous, in his personal behavior and speech, these lectures are evidence that he was human and could enjoy the nonchalance of familiar intercourse. A speaker can accomplish something by a gesture, a pose, a modulation of the voice, a pause, a change of the tempo of his address, which an author cannot achieve at all in its lifeless print, or but inadequately by illustrations. The translator heard this series of lectures except those between New Year and Easter, 1885. In reading the German edition, which has been built up from the transcript of a classmate, the translator has, in a number of places, felt that right here a picture of the speaker would have been of considerable help. It is a great question with the translator whether Dr. Walther, if he had lived, would have permitted the publication of the German treatise just in that form. At any rate, the translator, while striving heroically to preserve in his English reproduction every detail of the German original, has found it impossible to follow the German print. For instance, in its treatment of citations, which Walther introduced in his lectures and usually broke up by a multitude of side remarks, the German print inflicts an unnecessary hardship on the reader by the form in which these citations, with the intercalations, have been printed purely for the sake of historical accuracy. In the English reproduction, the form of the German edition has not always been followed, but the citation has been given entire, and the intercalations have been 
given after the citation. In one instance, where it seems the bell rang for the close of the lecture, a citation has been cut in two, the second half being given after the introduction of the next lecture. In the English edition, this citation has been given entire in the lecture in which it was introduced. A number of inaccuracies in the German original have been removed in this English edition, which, while striving to retain all of the charm and flavor of the German of Dr. Walther, is not a slavish and labored verbatim translation, but a reproduction in the English idiom. Every one who has ever attempted work of this kind knows that very often compound German clauses have to be recast, and the German adverbial connectives at times require a circumlocution in English. May this treatise work for the upbuilding of genuine Christian lives in its English readers, as it did in its German readers, and to the listeners of Dr. Walther's matchless discourses. W. T. H. Dow, Valparaiso University, Valparaiso, Indiana, Thanksgiving Day, 1928. Thesis 1. The doctrinal contents of the entire scriptures, both of the Old and the New Testament, are made up of two doctrines differing fundamentally from each other, namely, the law and the gospel. Thesis 2. Only he is an orthodox teacher, who not only presents all articles of faith in accordance with scripture, but also rightly distinguishes from each other the law and the gospel. Thesis 3. Rightly distinguishing the law and the gospel is the most difficult and the highest art of Christians in general, and of theologians in particular. It is taught only by the Holy Spirit in the school of experience. Thesis 4. The true knowledge of the distinction between the law and the gospel is not only a glorious light affording the correct understanding of the entire Holy Scriptures, but without this knowledge, Scripture is and remains a sealed book. Thesis 5. The first manner of confounding law and gospel is the one most easily recognized and the grossest. It is adopted, for instance, by Papists, Socinians, and Rationalists, and consists in this, that Christ is represented as a new Moses or lawgiver, and the gospel turned into a doctrine of meritorious works, while at the same time those who teach that the gospel is the message of the free grace of God in Christ are condemned and anathematized, as is done by the papists. Thesis 6. In the second place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is not preached in its full sternness, and the gospel not in its full sweetness. When, on the contrary, gospel elements are mingled with the law, and law elements with the gospel. Thesis 7. In the third place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the gospel is preached first and then the law, sanctification first and then justification, faith first and then repentance, good works first, then grace. Thesis 8. In the fourth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror on account of their sins, or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. Thesis 9. In the fifth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when sinners who have been struck down and terrified by the law are directed not to the word and the sacraments, but to their own prayers and wrestlings with God in order that they may win their way into a state of grace. In other words, when they are told to keep on praying and struggling until they feel that God has received them into grace. Thesis 10. In the sixth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the preacher describes faith in a manner as if the mere inert acceptance of truths, even while a person is living in mortal sins, renders that person righteous in the sight of God and saves him, or as if faith makes a person righteous and saves him for the reason that it produces in him love and reformation of his mode of living. Thesis 11. In the seventh place, the word of God is not rightly divided when there is a disposition to offer the comfort of the gospel only to those who have been made contrite by the law, not from fear of the wrath and punishment of God, but from love of God. Thesis 12. 
in the eighth place the word of god is not rightly divided when the preacher represents contrition alongside of faith as a cause of the forgiveness of sin thesis thirteen in the ninth place the word of god is not rightly divided when one makes an appeal to believe in a manner as if a person could make himself believe or at least help towards that end instead of preaching faith into a person's heart by laying the gospel promises before him thesis fourteen in the tenth place the word of God is not rightly divided when faith is required as a condition of justification and salvation, as if a person were righteous in the sight of God and saved, not only by faith, but also on account of his faith, for the sake of his faith, and in view of his faith. Thesis 15. In the eleventh place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the gospel is turned into a preaching of repentance. Thesis 16. In the twelfth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the preacher tries to make people believe that they are truly converted as soon as they have become rid of certain vices and engaged in certain works of piety and virtuous practices. Thesis 17. In the thirteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when a description is given of faith, both as regards its strength and the consciousness and productiveness of it, that does not fit all believers at all times. Thesis 18. In the fourteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided, when the universal corruption of mankind is described in such a manner as to create the impression that even true believers are still under the spell of ruling sins, and are sinning purposely. Thesis 19. In the fifteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the preacher speaks of certain sins as if they were not of a damnable, but of a venial nature. Thesis 20. In the sixteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when a person's salvation is made to depend on his association with the visible Orthodox Church, and when salvation is denied to every person who errs in any article of faith. Thesis 21. In the seventeenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when men are taught that the sacraments produce salutary effects ex opera operato, that is, by the mere outward performance of a sacramental act. Thesis 22. In the eighteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when a false distinction is made between a person's being awakened and his being converted. Moreover, when a person's inability to believe is mistaken for his not being permitted to believe. Thesis 23. In the nineteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided, when an attempt is made by means of the demands, or the threats, or the promises of the law, to induce the unregenerate to put away their sins, and engage in good works, and thus become godly. On the other hand, when an endeavor is made by means of the commands of the law rather than by the admonitions of the gospel to urge the regenerate to do good. Thesis 24. In the twentieth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the unforgiven sin against the Holy Ghost is described in a manner as if it could not be forgiven because of its magnitude. Thesis 25. In the twenty-first place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the person teaching it does not allow the gospel to have a general predominance in his teaching. End of the Introduction Lecture 1 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Evening Lecture, September 12, 1884 My dear friends, if you are to become efficient teachers in our churches and schools, it is a matter of indispensable necessity that you have a most minute knowledge of all doctrines of the Christian revelation. However, having achieved such knowledge, you have not yet attained all that is needed. 
what is needed over and above your knowledge of the doctrines is that you know how to apply them correctly you must not only have a clear apperception of the doctrines in your intellect but all of them must have entered deeply into your heart and there manifested their divine heavenly power all these doctrines must have become so precious so valuable so dear to you that you cannot but profess with a glowing heart in the words of paul we believe therefore we have spoken and in the words of all the apostles we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard you have indeed not seen these things with your physical eyes or heard them with your physical ears like the apostles but you ought to have an experience of them through your spiritual eyes and ears while in my dogmatic lectures i aim to ground you in every doctrine and make you certain of it i have designed these evening lectures on fridays for making you really practical theologians i wish to talk the christian doctrine into your very hearts enabling you in your future calling to come forward as living witnesses with a demonstration of the spirit and of power i do not want you to stand in your pulpits like lifeless statues but to speak with confidence and with cheerful courage offering help where help is needed now of all the doctrines the foremost and most important is the doctrine of justification however immediately following upon it as second in importance is this how law and gospel are to be divided the distinction between the law and the gospel shall now claim our attention and form the subject of our earnest study true luther says that he is willing to place him who is well versed in the art of dividing the law and the gospel at the head of all and call him a doctor of holy writ but i would not have you believe that i intend to place myself ahead of everybody else and be regarded as a doctor of the sacred scriptures that would be a great mistake i admit that people sometimes call me a doctor of theology but for myself i rather wish to remain a humble disciple and sit at the feet of our dr luther to learn this doctrine from him even as he learned it from the apostles and prophets as often as you attend these lectures i want you to come breathing a silent prayer in your hearts that god may grant us his holy spirit abundantly you to the end that you may profitably hear me to the end that i may teach effectively let us then take up our task with firm confidence that god will bless both our own souls and the souls of those whom we are to rescue comparing holy scripture with other writings we observe that no book is apparently so full of contradictions as the bible and that not only in minor points but in the principal matter in the doctrine how we may come to god and be saved in one place the bible offers forgiveness to all sinners in another place forgiveness of sins is withheld from all sinners in one passage a free offer of life everlasting is made to all men in another men are directed to do something themselves toward being saved this riddle is solved when we reflect that there are in the scriptures two entirely different doctrines the doctrine of the law and the doctrine of the gospel thesis one the doctrinal contents of the entire scriptures both of the old and the new testament are made up of two doctrines differing fundamentally from each other namely the law and the gospel it is not my intention to give a systematic treatment of the doctrine of the law and the gospel in these lectures my aim is rather to show you how easy it is to work a great damage upon your hearers by confounding law and gospel in spite of their fundamental differences and thus to frustrate the aims of both doctrines you will not begin to be interested in this point until you place before yourselves in clear outlines the points in which the law and the gospel differ the point of difference between the law and the gospel is not this that the gospel is a divine and the law a human doctrine resting on the reason of man not at all whatever of either doctrine is contained in the scriptures is the word of the living god himself nor is the difference that only the gospel is necessary not the law as if the latter were a mere addition that could be dispensed with in a strait no both are equally necessary without the law the gospel is not understood without the gospel the law benefits us nothing nor can this naive yet quite current distinction be admitted that the law is the teaching of the old while the gospel is the teaching of the new testament by no means there are gospel contents in the old 
and law contents in the New Testament. Moreover, in the New Testament the Lord has broken the seal of the law by purging it from Jewish ordinances. Nor do the law and the gospel differ as regards their final aim, as though the gospel aimed at men's salvation, the law at man's condemnation. No, both have for their final aim man's salvation. Only the law, ever since the fall, cannot lead us to salvation. It can only prepare us for the gospel. Furthermore, it is through the gospel that we obtain the ability to fulfill the law to a certain extent. Nor can we establish a difference by claiming that the law and the gospel contradict each other. There are no contradictions in Scripture. Each is distinct from the other, but both are in the most perfect harmony with one another. Finally, the difference is not this, that only one of these doctrines is meant for Christians. Even for the Christian, the law still retains its significance. Indeed, when a person ceases to employ either of these two doctrines, he is no longer a true Christian. The true points of difference between the law and the gospel are the following. 1. These two doctrines differ as regards the manner of their being revealed to man. 2. As regards their contents. 3. As regards the promises held out by either doctrine. 4. As regards their threatenings. 5. As regards the function and the effect of either doctrine. 6. As regards the persons to whom either one or the other doctrine must be preached. All other differences can be grouped under one of these six heads. Now, let us have the scripture proof for what I have said. In the first place, then, law and gospel differ as regards the manner of their being revealed to man. Man was created with the law written in his heart. True, in consequence of the fall, this script in the heart has become quite dulled, but it has not been utterly wiped out. The law may be preached to most ungodly person, and his conscience will tell him that is true. But when the gospel is preached to him, his conscience does not tell him the same. The preaching of the gospel, rather, makes him angry. The worst slave of vice admits that he ought to do what is written in the law. Why is this? Because the law is written in his heart. The situation is different when the gospel is preached. The gospel reveals and proclaims nothing but free acts of divine grace, and these are not at all self-evident. What God has done according to the gospel, he was not obliged to do, as though he could not possibly have remained as just and loving God if he had not done it. God would still have been eternal love if he had allowed all men to go to perdition. Romans two fourteen and 15 we read, when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Here we have the Apostle's testimony that even the blind pagans bear the moral law with them in their heart and conscience. No supernatural revelation is needed to inform them concerning the moral law. The Ten Commandments were published only for the purpose of bringing out in bold outline the dulled script of the original law written in men's hearts. On the other hand, we have from the same apostle and in the same epistle this statement concerning the gospel, Romans sixteen twenty-five and 26. To him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ Jesus, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. In clear terms, the apostle here testifies that it was impossible since the beginning of the world to discover the gospel. It became known only through an act of the Holy Spirit, who inspired men to write its message. Try and realize this important distinction. All religions contain portions of the law. Some of the heathen, by their knowledge of the law, have advanced so far that they have even perceived the necessity of an inner cleansing of the soul, a purification of the thoughts and desires. But of the gospel, not a particle is found anywhere except in the Christian religion. Had the law not been written in men's hearts, no one would listen to the preaching of the law. Everybody would turn away from it and say, That is too cruel. 
nobody can keep commandments such as these. But, my friends, do not hesitate to preach the law. People may revile it, yet they do so only with their mouths. What you say when preaching the law to people is something that their own conscience is preaching to them every day. Nor could we convert any person by preaching the gospel to him unless we preached the law to him first. It would be impossible to convert any one if the law had not been written in men's hearts. Of course, God could save all men by a mere act of his will, but he has not revealed to us that he intends to do so, and the definite order of salvation which he has appointed for us does not indicate any intention of this kind. The second point of difference between the law and the gospel is shown by the contents of either. The law tells us what we are to do. No such instruction is contained in the gospel. On the contrary, the gospel reveals to us only what God is doing. The law is speaking concerning our works, the gospel concerning the great works of God. In the law we hear the tenfold summons, Thou shalt. Beyond that the law has nothing to say to us. The gospel, on the other hand, makes no demands whatever. But does not the gospel demand faith? Yes. That, however, is just the same kind of command as when you say to a hungry person, Come, sit down at my table and eat. A hungry person will not reply, Bosh! I will not take orders from you. No, he will understand and accept your words as a kind invitation. That is what the gospel is, a kind invitation to partake of heavenly blessings. Galatians 3.12 we read, The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. This is an exceedingly important passage. The law has nothing to say about forgiveness, about grace. The law does not say, if you are contrite, if you begin to make amends, the remainder of your trespasses will be forgiven. Not a word of this is found in the law. The law issues only commands and demands. The gospel, on the other hand, only makes offers. It means not to take anything, but only to give. Accordingly, we read John 1.17, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What a momentous statement this is. The gospel contains nothing but grace and truth. When reading the law, pondering it, and measuring our conduct against its teachings, we are terrified by the multitude of demands which it makes upon us. If nothing else were told us, we should be hurled into despair. We should be lost. God be praised, there is still another doctrine, the gospel. To that we cling. Law and gospel differ in the third place by reason of their promises. What the law promises is just as great a boon as what the gospel promises, namely, everlasting life and salvation. But, at this point we are confronted with a mighty difference. All promises of the law are made on certain conditions, namely, on the condition that we fulfill the law perfectly. Accordingly, the promises of the law are the more disheartening, the greater they are. The law offers us food, but does not hand it down to us where we can reach it. It offers us salvation in about the same manner as refreshments were offered to Tantalus in the hell of the pagan Greeks. It says to us, indeed, I will quench the thirst of your soul and appease your hunger, but it is not able to accomplish this because it always adds, all this you shall have, if you do what I command. Over and against this, note the lovely, sweet, and comforting language of the gospel. It promises us the grace of God and salvation without any condition whatsoever. It is a promise of free grace. It asks nothing of us but this. Take what I give, and you have it. That is not a condition, but a kind of invitation. Through Moses, God says, Leviticus 18.5, Ye shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which, if a man do, he shall live in them. This means that only the person who keeps the law, and no one else, shall be saved by the law. Luke 10.26 and following, Christ meets the question of the self-righteous scribe with the counter-question, What is written in the law? How readest thou? The scribe answers correctly, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And now Christ says to him, This do, and thou shalt live. The Lord on this occasion testified, 
that if salvation is to come by way of the law, only he who fulfills the law can obtain it. By the way, we are not to think that to those who do the will of God salvation must come as a reward of their merit. By no means, their salvation too would be owing to the goodness of God. But to return to our discussion, the aforementioned condition which is attached to the law hurls us into despair. On a certain occasion, when the Lord wished to instruct his disciples as to what they must preach, he said, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark sixteen, fifteen, and 16. This shows that no condition whatever is attached to the gospel. It is a promise of grace. Furthermore, we read Romans three twenty-two through 24 There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Again, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unconditional promises of grace and salvation, that is what we find in the gospel. Verily, a precious difference. When the law has laid us low, we can cheerfully raise our heads again, because, besides the law, we have another doctrine which proposes to us no demands of any kind. Were we to ask Christ, what is expected of me in order that I may be saved? He would answer, No works. I have done all the works that had to be done. You need not drink one drop of the cup that I had to drink. A person entering fully into the meaning of this fact must be moved to leap for very joy that these glad tidings have been brought to him. A person who, in spite of this message, continues to be despondent and muses, I am an abominable man, there is no forgiveness for me, does nothing less than reject the gospel, reject Christ. Though I had committed the grossest sins, and had to say with Paul, I am the chief of sinners, though I had committed the sin of Judas, or the sin of Cain, nevertheless I am to accept the gospel, because it demands nothing of us. The fourth difference between the law and the gospel relates to threats. The gospel contains no threats at all, but only words of consolation. Wherever in Scripture you come across a threat, you may be assured that that passage belongs to the law. He would indeed be a blessed person who could fully realize this comforting truth. The Holy Spirit produces this knowledge wherever it exists. Without the Holy Ghost, this knowledge cannot be attained. Every person remains an unbeliever unless the Holy Ghost works this knowledge in him. However, we are not to imagine that the gospel makes men secure because it has no threats to hurl at men. On the contrary, the gospel removes from believers the desire to sin. The law, on the other hand, is nothing but threats. As Abraham sent Hagar away into the desert with a loaf of bread and jug of wine, so the law hands us a piece of bread and then thrusts us into the desert. Deuteronomy 27.26 God says through Moses, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say Amen. Indeed, man is invited by the law to pronounce a curse upon himself. Only a person engulfed by infernal darkness can believe that the law will give him no trouble. The gospel proceeds in an entirely different fashion. Paul says, 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Hence, even the foremost among sinners is not made to hear threats, but only the sweetest promise. Luke 4, 16-21 We have this record. He, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the broken-hearted, 
to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. On this occasion the Lord announced the contents of his doctrine, or of the gospel. He meant to say, I am not come to bring a new law, but to proclaim the gospel. Happy the man who realizes this fact. May God help us all to attain to this knowledge. End of Lecture 1Lecture 2 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walker Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Evening Lecture, September 19th, 1884 My friends, a person may pretend to be a Christian while in reality he is not. As long as he is in this condition, he is quite content with his knowledge of the mere outlines of the Christian doctrines. Everything beyond that, he says, is for pastors and theologians. To perceive as clearly as possible everything that God has revealed, that is something in which a non-Christian has no interest. However, the moment a person becomes a Christian, there arises in him a keen desire for the doctrine of Christ. Even the most uncultured peasant who is still unconverted is suddenly roused in the moment of his conversion and begins to reflect on God and heaven, salvation and damnation and so forth. He becomes occupied with the highest problems of human life. An instance of this kind is afforded by those Jews who flocked to Christ and also by the apostles. Those multitudes heard Christ with great joy and were astonished because he preached with authority and not as the scribes. But the majority of these hearers never advanced beyond a certain feeling of delight and admiration. The apostles, too, were uneducated people, but they acted differently. They did not stop where the rest stopped, but propounded all manner of questions to Christ. After hearing one of his parables, they said, Declare unto us this parable, Matthew 13.36. Similar to this was the conduct of the Bereans, who searched the scriptures daily, Acts 17.11. It is therefore quite true what the Apology says. Men of good conscience are crying for the truth and proper instruction from the word of God. Even death is not as bitter to them as when they find themselves in doubt regarding this matter or that. Accordingly, they must seek where they can find instruction. Triglot Concordia, page 290. Striving to obtain the truth and divine assurance is a necessary criterion already of an ordinary Christian, in a still higher degree, however, in the case of a theologian. A theologian who has not the greatest interest in the Christian doctrines is unthinkable. Even where there is but the beginning of faith in the heart, a person regards no point of doctrine as trifling, and every doctrine is to him as precious as gold, silver, and rubies. God grant that this may be your case. If it is, you will not come surfeited into these lectures, but will ask again and again what is truth, not in the spirit of Pilate, but of Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and listened raptly to every word he spoke. Then, too, every one of these lectures will be of great blessing to you, even though the instrument through which the truth is to be conveyed to you is inferior. Now, the first matter that you are to consider is the points of difference between these two doctrines, the law and the gospel. We have heard that there are six points of difference, four of which we have reviewed. Let us pass on to the fifth point. The fifth point of difference between the law and the gospel concerns the effects of these two doctrines. What is the effect of the preaching of the law? It is threefold. In the first place, the law tells us what to do, but does not enable us to comply with its commands. It rather causes us to become more unwilling to keep the law. True, some treat the law as if it were a rule in arithmetic. However, let the law once force its way into a person's heart, and that heart will strain with all its force against God. The person will become furious at God for asking such impossible things of him. 
yea, he will curse God in his heart. He would slay God if he could. He would thrust God from his throne if it were possible. The effect of preaching the law, then, is to increase the lust for sinning. In the second place, the law uncovers to man his sins, but offers him no help to get out of them, and thus hurls man into despair. In the third place, the law does indeed produce contrition. It conjures up the terrors of hell, of death, of the wrath of God, but it has not a drop of comfort to offer the sinner. If no additional teaching besides the law is applied to man, it must despair, die, and perish in his sins. Ever since the fall, the law can produce no other effects in man. Let us ponder this well. That this is so, we can see from Romans 7, 7 through 9, where Paul relates his personal experience under the law thus. I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead, but when the commandment came, sin revived. No heathen knows that even evil lust in the heart is sin. The greatest moralists have said, It is not my fault that I sin, I cannot help it, I cannot prevent myself from sinning. But the law shouts, Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not lust. Yea, we are told that we must be free even from inherited lust. While a person gives no thought to the law, sin goes in and out at his heart, and he is not conscious of sinning. Ask a worldly person about this matter, and he will be surprised, and say, I have done no evil, I have slain no one, I have not committed adultery, I have not been a thief, and so forth. He is not noticing at all that sin is a constant guest with him, but when the law strikes him like a bolt of lightning, he perceives how great a sinner he is, what horribly ungodly thoughts he is cherishing. That is what the apostle means when he says, Sin revived when the law came. The law uncovers sin, but offers us no comfort. If we had the law only, as we have it now, and nothing besides, we should have to perish forever and go to hell. The smiting effects and the curse of the law will first be felt in hell, for the law must be fulfilled, it must preserve its divine authority. Take Second Corinthians 3, 6, where we read, The letter killeth. The apostle calls the law, the letter, because God has inscribed it in the form of letters upon tables of stone. Even pagans have observed that the law produces an effect opposite to that which it commands. The statement of the profligate poet Ovid is well known, Nitimur in vititum, semper cupumusque negata. We strive after the forbidden things, and always lust after those things which are denied us. Ovid himself was a swine, and he says bluntly, See, this is how I do. I always do those things which others regard as forbidden. When the Israelites at Mount Sinai were given the Ten Commandments, they were all a tremble. Their natural behavior revealed the condition of their hearts. On that occasion God wanted to point out to us for all time to come. Behold, that is the effect of the law. Accordingly, when the rich young man came to Christ asking how he might be saved, and was so utterly blind that he did not at all perceive his sinful corruption, we are told, He went away sorrowful. Matthew 19.22 Christ could not yet apply the gospel to this young man. He first had to convince him and that he was utterly incapable of fulfilling the law. Again, when Paul preached to Felix the governor concerning righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come, we read that Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Acts 24.25 But he never called for Paul again. He wanted to be rid of the thunder and lightning of the law. Again, when Peter, on the first Christian festival of Pentecost, had preached the law to his hearers, we are told that they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Namely, to be saved. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
The effects of the gospel are of an entirely different nature. They consist in this, that, in the first place, the gospel, when demanding faith, offers and gives us faith in that very demand. When we preach to people, do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God gives them faith through our preaching. We preach faith, and any person not willfully resisting obtains faith. It is, indeed, not the mere physical sound of the spoken word that produces this effect, but the contents of the word. The second effect of the gospel is that it does not at all reprove the sinner, but takes all terror, all fear, all anguish from him, and fills him with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. At the return of the prodigal, the father does not with a single word refer to his horrible, abominable conduct. He says nothing, nothing whatever about it, but falls upon the prodigal's neck, kisses him, and prepares a splendid feast for him. That is a glorious parable, exhibiting to us the effect of the gospel. It removes all unrest, and fills us with a blessed heavenly peace. In the third place, the gospel does not require anything good that man must furnish, not a good heart, not a good disposition, no improvement of his condition, no godliness, no love either of God or men. It issues no orders, but it changes man. It plants love into his heart and makes him capable of all good works. It demands nothing, but it gives all. Should not this fact make us leap for joy? The effects of the gospel are exhibited to us in Acts 16, in the case of the jailer of Philippi. He asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And received this answer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The jailer does not say to the apostles, How am I to go at this? No, he promptly believes. For the apostles' words have spoken faith into his heart. The story concerning him goes on immediately. He rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Observe that the gospel bestows the faith which it demands. In the demand for faith there is nothing of the nature of the law. It is a demand of love. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Here we have a record of something glorious. Can there be anything more glorious, more beautiful, more blessed, more precious than what the gospel gives, eternal salvation? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we have a brief description of the gospel as seen in its effects. The apostle says, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. The gospel does not say, you must do good works, but it fashions me into a human being, into a creature of such a kind as cannot but serve God and his fellow man. Verily a precious effect. To the renegade Christians, Paul appears in Galatians 3, 2, saying, This only would I learn of you, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Of course they had to answer, It was through the preaching of faith which we heard that we were given a new heart. For prior to that we could do no good. We have been made over into new creatures. You don't have to tell the sun to shine, and it would be just as useless to say to one of those new creatures, You must do this or that. Finally, there is a sixth point of difference between the law and the gospel. It relates to the persons to whom either doctrine is to be preached. In other words, there is a difference in the subjects to whom they must be applied, the persons on whom either doctrine is to operate, and the end for which it is to operate are utterly different. The law is to be preached to secure sinners, and the gospel to alarmed sinners. In other respects, both doctrines must indeed be preached. But at this point, the question is, which are the persons to whom the law must be preached rather than the gospel, and vice versa? 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, Paul writes, We know that the law is good if a man useth law fully, knowing this, 
that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. To all persons of this description, then, the law only is to be preached, and they are not to have a drop of gospel. As long as a person is at ease in his sins, as long as he is unwilling to quit some particular sin, so long only the gospel which curses and condemns him is to be preached to him. However, the moment he becomes frightened at his condition, the gospel is to be promptly administered to him, for from that moment on he no longer can be classified with secure sinners. Accordingly, while the devil holds you in a single sin, you are not yet a proper subject of the gospel to operate upon. Only the law must be preached to you. A prophetic utterance of our Lord prior to his incarnation was cited by him afterwards in the days of his flesh. Luke 4, 16-21. It is found Isaiah 61, 1-3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the broken-hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. The day of vengeance of our God in this test is the judgment which God is to execute upon hell and the devil. Can there be a more glorious message than this? The devil has horribly disfigured the human race and hurled men into deep distress. Christ has avenged this. He has proclaimed to the devil, I have conquered thee, and men created after the image of God shall not be lost. I have procured salvation for them. Only those perish who absolutely refuse to be saved, for God coerces no one in this matter. Now to such poor, sad-hearted sinners, I repeat it, not a word of the law must be preached. Woe to the preacher who would continue to preach the law to a famished sinner. On the contrary, to such a person the preacher must say, Do but come. There is still room. No matter how great a sinner you are, there is still room for you. Even if you were a Judas or a Cain, there is still room. Oh, do, do come to Jesus. Persons of this kind are proper subjects on whom the gospel is to operate. Let me now cite to you a passage from Luther's Sermon on the Distinction between the Law and the Gospel. He writes, St. Louis edition 9, 802 and following, By the term law, Nothing else is to be understood than a word of God that is a command, that enjoins upon us what we are to do and what we are to shun, that requires from us some work of obedience. This is easily understood when we look only at the form of speech in which God expresses a certain word of His, in causa formali. But it is very difficult in the execution, in causa finale. Now, there are many kinds of laws or commandments that refer to works which God requires of each person individually, according to his natural disposition, his standing in society, his office, and according to the particular season and other circumstances that have a bearing on the doing of such works. Hence, the commandments tell each man what tasks God has laid on him, and what he requires of him, agreeably to his natural disposition and his office. For instance, a wife must tend her children, and let the master of the house do the governing, and so forth. That is the task required of her. A servant is to obey his master, and do all other things which it behooves a servant to do. In like manner, a maidservant has a law to govern her conduct. However, the universal law that pertains to all of us is this. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Give him advice and aid in emergency. If he is hungry, feed him. If he is naked, clothe him, and so on. This is properly delimiting the law and sequestering it from the gospel. 
law is to be called and to be anything that refers to what we are to do on the other hand the gospel or the creed is any doctrine or word of god which does not require works from us and does not command us to do something but bids us simply accept as a gift the gracious forgiveness of our sins and everlasting bliss offered us in accepting these gifts we surely are not doing anything we merely suffer to be given to us what is given and presented to us by means of the word as when god gives you a promise like this i make thee a present of this or that and so forth for instance in holy baptism which i have not ordained which is not my work but the word and work of god he says to me come hither i baptize thee and wash thee from all thy sins accept this gift and it shall be thine now when you are thus baptized what else do you do than receive and accept the gracious gift the difference then between the law and the gospel is this the law makes demands of things that we are to do it insists on works that we are to perform in the service of god and our fellow man in the gospel however we are summoned to a distribution of rich alms which we are to receive and take the loving kindness of god and eternal salvation here is an easy way of illustrating the difference between the two in offering us help and salvation as a gift and donation of god the gospel bids us hold the sack open and have something given to us the law however gives nothing but only takes and demands things from us now these two giving and taking are surely far apart for when something is given me i am not doing anything towards that i only receive and take i have something given to me again when in my profession i carry out commands likewise when i advise and assist my fellow-man i receive nothing but give to another whom i am serving thus the law and the gospel are distinguished as to their formal statements in causa formali the one promises the other commands the gospel gives and bids us take the law demands and says this you are to do we note that luther does not develop this doctrine in scientific fashion but he proclaims it like a prophet that is why he makes such a great impression if he had written a scientific treatise in latin on this subject with systematic divisions and subdivisions marked capital a small a italicized a alpha small b italicized a alpha small c italicized a alpha capital b small a etc the people would have marveled and said that man is a great scholar but he would not by this method have made the impression which he did make in the writings of the church fathers we find hardly anything concerning the distinction between the law and the gospel end of lecture two lecture three of the proper distinction between law and gospel by c f w walther translated by w h t dow this librivox recording is in the public domain third evening lecture september twenty sixth eighteen eighty four my friends christ himself has described the way to heaven as a narrow path just so narrow is the path of the pure doctrine for the pure doctrine is nothing else than the doctrine regarding the way to heaven it is easy to lose your way when it is narrow and rarely travelled and leads through a dense forest without intending to do so and without being aware of it you may make a wrong turn to the right or left it is equally easy to lose the narrow way of the pure doctrine which likewise is travelled by few people and leads through a dense forest of erroneous teachings you may land either in the bog of fanaticism or in the abyss of rationalism this is no jest false doctrine is poison to the soul an entire banqueting party drinking from cups containing an admixture of arsenic can drink physical death from its cups so an entire audience can invite spiritual and eternal death by listening to a sermon that contains an admixture of the poison of false doctrine a person can be deprived of his soul's salvation by a single false comfort or a single false reproof administered to him this is all the more easy because we are all naturally more accessible to the shining and dazzling light of human reason than to the divine truth 
For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. 1 Corinthians 2.14 From what has been said, you can gather how foolish it is, yea, what an awful delusion has taken hold upon so many men's minds who ridicule the pure doctrine and say to us, Ah, do cease clamoring, pure doctrine, pure doctrine, that can only land you in dead orthodoxism. Pay more attention to pure life, and you will raise a growth of genuine Christianity. That is exactly like saying to a farmer, Do not worry forever about good seed, worry about good fruits. Is not a farmer properly concerned about good fruit when he is solicitous about getting good seed? Just so, a concern about pure doctrine is the proper concern about genuine Christianity and a sincere Christian life. False doctrine is noxious weed, sown by the enemy to produce a progeny of wickedness. The pure doctrine is wheat seed. From it spring the children of the kingdom, who, even in the present life, belong in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and in the life to come will be received into the kingdom of glory. May God even now implant in your hearts a great fear, yea, a great abhorrence of false doctrine. May he graciously give you a holy desire for the pure, saving truth revealed by God himself. That is the chief end which these evening lectures are to serve. We shall now proceed with our study. Even to-night we cannot take leave of our thesis at once. We have indeed observed the points of difference between the law and the gospel. By hearing two testimonies of Luther on the subject, we have also been strengthened in our conviction that what we have heard about these differences is true. Now I must give you a practical exhibition of the manner of which these two doctrines must be proclaimed, without mingling the one with the other. To this end, let me submit a passage from Luther's exposition of chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the Gospel of St. John, written in the years 1530 to 1532. There is a general tendency among young people to value the beautiful language and style of an author more than the contents of his writings. That is a dangerous tendency. You must always have a greater regard for the matter, quid, than the manner, quomodo, of a treatise. The law must be preached in all its severity, but the hearers must get this impression. This sermon will help those still secure in their sins toward salvation. Whenever the gospel is preached, this is the impression that the hearers are to receive. This sermon applies only to those who have been smitten by the law and are in need of comfort. On the words of Christ, John 7.37, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Luther offers this comment. These are the two subjects on which we preach. The law produces thirst. It leads the hearer to hell and slays him. The gospel, however, refreshes him and leads him to heaven. Luther speaks of this difference not only when explaining passages in which the terms law and gospel occur, but whenever he has an opportunity to preach these two subjects. The law tells us what we are to do and charges us with not having done it, no matter how holy we are. Thus the law makes us uncertain. It chases me about and thus makes me thirsty. Now, when Christ invites those who thirst, he means such as have been crushed under the hammer blows of the law. Directly, Christ invites only these to come to him. Indirectly, indeed, he invites all men. A person thus thirsting is not to do anything but drink, that is, receive the consolations of the gospel. When a person is really thirsty and is handed but a small glass of water, how greatly refreshed he feels. But when a person is not thirsty, you may fill one glass of water after another for him, and it will do him no good. It will not refresh him. Luther proceeds. The law says, Thou shalt not kill. Its whole urging is directed towards what I am to do. It says, Thou shalt love God with all thy heart, and thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not commit adultery, nor swear, and not steal. And then it speaks out thus, See that you have lived, or are now living according to what I command you to do. When you have reached this point, you will find that you do not love God with your whole heart as you should, and you will be forced to confess, O oh my God, I have not done what I should, I have not kept the law, for neither did I love thee from my heart today, nor will I do so tomorrow. 
I make this same confession year after year, namely, that I have failed to do this or that. There seems to be no end to this confessing of my trespasses. When will there be an end of this? When shall I find rest unto my soul and be fully assuaged of divine grace? You will ever be in doubt. Tomorrow you will repeat your confession of today. The general confession will always apply to you. Now, where will your conscience find rest and a foothold? Because you assuredly know how God is disposed towards you. Your heart cannot tell you, even though you may be doing good works, to the limit of your ability. For the law remains in force with its injunction, Thou shalt love God and man with your whole heart. You say, I am not doing it. The law replies, You must do it. Thus the law puts me in anguish. I have to become thirsty, feel a terror, tremble, and exclaim, How am I to act in order that God may lift up his gracious countenance upon me? I am to obtain the grace of God, but on condition that I keep the Ten Commandments, that I have good works and many merits to show, but that will never happen. I am not keeping the Ten Commandments, therefore no grace is extended to me. The result is that man can find no rest, trusting in his good works. He would be glad to have a good conscience. He yearns for a good, cheerful, peaceful conscience, and for real comfort. He thirsts for contentment. That is the thirst of which Jesus speaks. It lasts until Jesus comes and asks, Would you like to be at ease? Would you like to have rest and a good conscience? I advise you to come to me. Dismiss Moses, and no longer think of your own works. Distinguish between me and Moses. From Moses you have the thirst which you are suffering. He has done this part for you. He has discharged his office to you. He has put you in anguish and made you thirsty. I am a different teacher. I will give you to drink and refresh you. A person who has not been put through this experience is a sound without meaning, sine mente sonans, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But a preacher who has personally passed through this experience can really speak from the heart, and what he says will go into the hearts of his hearers. It is a mere accident when someone is awakened from sin and converted by a preacher who himself is unconverted. Accordingly, when preparing to preach, the preacher must draw up a strategical plan in order to win his hearers for the kingdom of God. Otherwise the hearers may say of his sermon, Oh, that was nice, but that will be all. They will leave the church with an empty heart. If anyone were well versed in this art, I mean, whoever could properly make this distinction, he would deserve to be called the doctor of theology. For the law and the gospel must be kept apart, the one from the other. The law is to terrify men and make them shy and despairing, especially rude and vulgar people, until they learn that they cannot do what the law demands, nor achieve God's favor. That will make them despair of themselves, for they can never accomplish this aim obtaining God's favor by their efforts to keep the law. Dr. Staupitz, I remember, said to me on a certain occasion, I have more than a thousand times lied to God and that I would become godly, and never did what I promised. Now I shall never again make up my mind to become godly, for I see that I cannot carry out my resolution. I shall never lie to God any more. That was also my experience under the papacy. I was very anxious to become godly, but how long did it last? Only until I had finished reading Mass. An hour later I was more evil than before. This state of affairs goes on until a person is quite weary and is forced to say, I shall put away from me being godly according to Moses and the law. I shall follow another preacher who says to me, Come to me if you are weary. I will refresh you. Let this word, Come to me, sound pleasant to you. This preacher does not teach you that you can love God, or how you must act and live, but he tells you how you must become godly and be saved, spite of the fact that you cannot do as you should. That preaching is wholly different from the teaching of the law of Moses, which is concerned only with works. The law says, Thou shalt not sin. Go ahead and be godly. Do this, do that. But Christ says, Thou art not godly, but I have been godly in thy place. Take from me what I give thee. 
thy sins are forgiven thee. Remissa sunt tibi peccata. These two sermons must be preached and urged upon all men at the same time. It is not right for you to stick to one doctrine only, for it is only the law that makes men thirsty, and it does this only to terrify men's hearts. But it is the gospel alone that satisfies men, makes them cheerful, revives them, and comforts their consciences. Now, lest the preaching of the gospel only produce lazy, frigid Christians, who imagine that they need not good works, the law says to the old Adam, Sin not, be godly, shun that, do this, and so forth. But when the conscience feels these smitings, and realizes that the law is not a mere cipher, man becomes terror-stricken. Then you must hear the teaching of the gospel, because you have sinned. Then hear the teacher Christ, who says to you, Come, I will not let you die of thirst, I will give you a drink. If these two facts had been preached to me, Dr. Luther, when I was young, I should have spared my body considerably, and should not have become a monk. But now that these truths are preached, the people of this godless world despise them, for they have not endured the sweat-bath through which I and others had to pass under the papacy. Not having felt the agony of conscience, they despise the gospel. They have never thirsted, therefore they start all manner of sects and fanatical doings. It is a true saying, Dulcia non meminit, qui non gustavit amara. He does not remember sweet things, who has not tasted bitter things. He who has never been a thirst has no taste. Thirst is a good hostler, and hunger is a good cook. But where there is no thirst, even the best drink is not refreshed. The doctrine of the law, then, was given for this purpose, that a person be given a sweat-bath of anguish and sorrow under the teaching of the law. Otherwise men become sated and surfeited, and lose all relish of the gospel. If you meet with such people, pass them by. We are not preaching to them. This preaching is for the thirsty. To them the message is brought, Let them come to me. I will give them to drink and refresh them. In the manner here sketched by Luther, the law and gospel must be proclaimed without mingling one with another. A preacher who is not simple in his preaching preaches not Christ but himself, and any one preaching himself preaches people into perdition, even when they say of his preaching, Ah, but that was beautiful. This man is an orator. Even a true, honest preacher is visited by thoughts of vanity that spring from his sinful flesh. But as soon as he notices this, he casts these cursed thoughts of vanity from him, and cries to God to rid him of them. He enters his pulpit a humble man. People can tell whether his preaching comes from the heart or not. Of course you cannot speak like Luther. Still, you must resolve in your mind this problem. How can I preach the law to the secure and the gospel to crushed sinners? Every sermon must contain both doctrines. When either is missing, the other is wrong. For any sermon is wrong that does not present all that is necessary to a person's salvation. You must not think that you have rightly divided the word of truth if you preach the law in one part of your sermon and the gospel in the other. No, a topographical division of this kind is worthless. Both doctrines may be contained in one sentence, but in your audience everyone must get the impression this is meant for me. Even the most comforting and cheering sermon must contain also the law. Let me cite you a passage from Luther's exposition of Psalm 23, verse 3. He restoreth my soul. Luther says, Inasmuch as the Lord our God has a twofold word, the law and the gospel, the prophet by these words, he restoreth my soul, indicates with sufficient clearness that he is not speaking of the law, but of the gospel. When you meet with statements in your Bible containing threats of punishment, classify them with the law. Words that comfort, words that speak of giving, offering something, belong to the gospel. You will not find a gospel pericope from which you could not preach both the law and the gospel. Luther proceeds. The law cannot restore the soul, for it is a word that makes demands upon us and commands us to love God with our whole heart and so forth and our neighbor as ourselves. The law condemns every person who fails to do this, 
and pronounces this sentence upon him. Cursed is every one that doeth not all that is written in the book of the law. Now it is certain that no man on earth is doing this. Therefore, in due time, the law approaches the sinner, filling his soul with sadness and fear. If no respite is provided from its smiting, it continues its onslaught, forcing the sinner into despair and eternal damnation. Therefore, St. Paul says, By the law is only the knowledge of sin. Again, the law worketh nothing but wrath. The gospel, however, is a blessed word. It makes no demands upon us, but only proclaims good tidings to us, namely, that God has given His only Son for us poor sinners to be our shepherd, to seek us famished and scattered sheep, to give His life for our redemption from sin, everlasting death, and the power of the devil. The question might here be raised, why it is that the law leads men into horrible sin of despair. That is merely an accidental feature of its operation. In and by itself, the law too is good. Let me follow this up with a passage from Luther's commentary on Galatians. On Galatians 2, 3, and 4, Luther says, Accordingly, when your conscience is terrified by the law, and you are wrestling with God the judge, do not consult your reason or the law, but take your stand alone on the grace of God and his word of consolation. Cling to this, and act as if you had never heard a word of the law. Enter into that darkness, Exodus twenty twenty one, where neither the law nor human reason gives its light, but only the dark word of faith. The believer relies with a certainty on being saved in Christ without the law, and regardless of it. Thus the gospel, without and regardless of the light of the law and reason, leads us into the darkness of faith, where the law and reason exercise no authority. We must indeed hear the law also, yet in its proper place and at the proper time. When he has come down from the mountain, he is a legislator and governs the people with the law. In this manner our conscience is to be exempt from the law, but ours is to obey the law. Hence, any person who understands well how to distinguish the gospel from the law may thank God and know that he is a theologian. In times of tribulation, indeed, I do not know how to do this as efficiently as I should. Both teachings are to be distinguished in such a manner that you place the gospel in heaven, the law on earth, that you call the righteousness which the gospel proclaims a heavenly and divine righteousness, the righteousness which the law proclaims, an earthly and human righteousness, and that you are as careful to distinguish the righteousness of the gospel from the righteousness of the law, as God with great care has separated heaven from earth, light from darkness, day from night. One of these doctrines shall be the light of day, the other the darkness of night. Would to God that we could put them still farther apart. Therefore, when we are speaking of faith and are ministering to men's consciences, the law is to be utterly excluded. It must remain on earth. When you treat of what men are to do, light the night lamp of the works, or of the righteousness that is by the way of the law. Thus the sun and the unmeasured light of the gospel and of grace is to shine during the day, the lamp of the law, however, at night. A conscience, then, that has been thrown into terror by feeling its sin, should argue thus. I am now engaged in earthly tasks. Here let the donkey labor, slave, and carry the burden that is laid upon him. That is to say, let the body with its members be subject to the law. But when you ascend to heaven, leave the donkey with its burden on earth. For the conscience of a believer in Christ has nothing to do with the law and its works and the righteousness of this earth. Thus the donkey stays in the valley, while the conscience, with Isaac, goes up into the mountain, ignores the law and its works, and keeps its eye only on the forgiveness of sin, on nothing but the righteousness which is exhibited and given to us in Christ. This point of doctrine, namely, the distinction between the law and the gospel, we must needs know, because it contains the sum of all Christian teaching. Let every one who is zealous to be godly strive then with the greatest care to learn how to make this distinction, that is, in his heart and conscience. The distinction is made easily enough 
in words, but in affliction you will realize that the gospel is a rare guest in men's consciences, while the law is their daily and familiar companion. For human reason has by nature the knowledge of the law. Therefore, when the conscience is terrified by sin, which the law points out and magnifies, you are to speak thus. There is a time to die, and there is a time to live. There is a time for acting as if you were ignorant of the gospel. At this moment let the law be gone, and let the gospel come. For now is not the time to hear the law, but the gospel. But how about this? You have not done any good. On the contrary, you have committed grievous sins. I admit that, but I have the forgiveness of sins through Christ, for whose sake all my sins have been remitted. However, while the conscience is not engaged in this conflict, while you are obliged to discharge the ordinary functions of your office, at a time when you must act as a minister of the word, a magistrate, a husband, a teacher, a pupil, and so forth, it is not in season to hear the gospel but the law. At such time you are to perform the duties of your profession, and so forth. Our own righteousness is to serve us for this life, but the righteousness which the gospel brings us is a heavenly righteousness. We shall hear anon that law and gospel must be kept apart not only in the sermon, but above all in a person's own heart. End of Lecture 3Lecture 4 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C.F.W. Walther, translated by W.H.T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourth Evening Lecture, October 3, 1884 When a theologian is asked to yield and make concessions in order that peace may at last be established in the Church, but refuses to do so even in a single point of doctrine, such an action looks to human reason like intolerable stubbornness, yea, like downright malice. That is the reason why such theologians are loved and praised by few men during their lifetime. Most men rather revile them as disturbers of the peace, yea, as destroyers of the kingdom of God. They are regarded as men worthy of contempt. But in the end it becomes manifest that this very determined, inexorable tenacity in clinging to the pure teaching of the divine word by no means tears down the church. On the contrary, it is just this which, in the midst of greatest dissension, builds up the church and ultimately brings about genuine peace. Therefore, woe to the church which has no men of this stripe, men who stand as watchmen on the walls of Zion, sound the alarm whenever a foe threatens to rush the walls, and rally to the banner of Jesus Christ for a holy war. Try and picture to yourselves what would have happened if Athanasius had made a slight concession in the doctrine of the deity of Christ. He could have made a compromise with the Arians, and put his conscience at ease, for the Arians declared that they too believed Christ to be God, only not from eternity. They said, Ein hota up hain there was a time when he did not exist, meaning he had become God. But, they added, nevertheless he is to be worshipped, for he is God. Even at that remote time, had Athanasius yielded, the church would have been hurled from the one rock on which it is founded, which is none other than Jesus Christ. Again, imagine what would have happened if Augustine had made a slight concession in the doctrine of man's free will or rather of the utter incapacity of man for matter spiritual. He too could have made a compromise with the Pelagians and put his conscience at ease, because the Pelagians declared, well, yes, indeed, without the aid of God's grace, no man can be saved. But by the grace of God, they meant the divine gift which is imparted to every man. Even at that time, had Augustine yielded, the church would have lost the core of the gospel there would have been nothing left of it but the empty, hollow shell. Aye, the church would have retained nothing but the name of the gospel, for the doctrine of the gospel, that man is made righteous in the sight of God and saved by nothing but the pure grace of God through the merits of Jesus Christ, is, as everybody knows, the most important doctrine, the marrow and substance of Christian teaching. Wherever this doctrine is not proclaimed, there is no Christ, no gospel, no salvation, there men perish, and, for such people, 
it is in vain that the Son of God has come into the world. Lastly, picture to yourselves what would have happened if Luther had made a slight concession in the doctrine of the Holy Supper. At the time of the Marburg Colloquy, he could have made a compromise with Zwingli and put his conscience at ease, because the Zwinglians said, We too believe in a certain presence of the body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper, but not in the presence of Christ's corporeal substance, because God does not set up such sublime, incomprehensible things for us to believe. By this claim, Zwingli made Christianity in its entirety a questionable matter. And even Melanchthon, who was usually greatly inclined to make concessions, declared that Zwingli had relapsed into paganism. Had Luther yielded, the church would have become a prey to rationalism, which places man's reason above the plain word of God. Let us, therefore, bless all the faithful champions who have fought for every point of Christian doctrine, unconcerned about the favor of men, and disregarding their threatenings. Their ignominy, though it often was great, has not been born in vain. Men cursed them, but they continued bearing their testimony until death, and now they wear the crown of glory, and enjoy the blissful communion of Christ, and of all the angels and the elect. Their labor and their fierce battling has not been in vain, for even now, after fifteen hundred years, or, in the last name case, after several centuries, the church is reaping what they sowed. Let us then, my friends, likewise hold fast the treasure of the pure doctrine. Do not consider it strange if, on that account, you must bear reproach the same as they did. Consider that the word of Sirach, chapter 4, verse 33, Even unto death fight for justice, and God will overthrow thy enemies for thee, will come true in our case too. Let this be your slogan. Fight unto death in behalf of the truth, and the Lord will fight for you. We now take up a thesis for study which tells us that since the two doctrines of Scripture, law and gospel, are so different from each other, we must keep them distinct also in our preaching. Thesis 2. Only he is an orthodox teacher who not only presents all the articles of faith in accordance with Scripture, but also rightly distinguished from each other, the law and the gospel. This thesis divides into two parts. The first part states a requisite of an orthodox teacher, namely, that he must present all the articles of faith in accordance with Scripture. This, in our day, is regarded as an unheard-of demand. Even in circles of so-called believers, people act as if they were shocked when they hear some say, I have found the truth. I am certain concerning every doctrine of revelation. Such a claim is considered a piece of arrogance. Young students in particular dare not set up such a claim. In Germany they are told, Whatever you do, do not believe that you have already found the truth. Keep on studying until you have reached the goal. Never say you have already reached it. Even the German professors who speak thus to their students never reach the goal. If one of them claims that he has, he is immediately regarded with suspicion. There are people who find their delight not in eating and drinking, or in hoarding up wealth, or in a life of ease, but in quenching their thirst for knowledge. True, in theory this tendency is not approved, but that is practically what the professors are advising when they say warningly to their students, never speak of the Christian doctrine in terms of finality. They are afraid that someone might speak with finality on an article of faith instead of ceaselessly rolling the stone of research, as Sisyphus of the Greek hell is rolling the stone that he wants to bring to a higher level and which always slips from him. That was the reason, too, why Conus, who had been a faithful Lutheran, sought to justify himself in the preface of his miserable dogmatique by citing the Latin proverb, Dies diem docet, one day is the teacher of the next. He meant to say, a year ago I believed this and that, but other thoughts came to me, and I found other doctrines. That is a miserable, yes, an appalling position for a theologian to take. Scripture requires that we have the word of God absolutely pure and unadulterated, and that we are able to say when coming down from the pulpit, I could take an oath upon it that I have rightly preached the word of God. Even to an angel coming down from heaven, I could say, My preaching has been correct. 
that explains the paradox remark of luther that a preacher must not pray the lord's prayer when coming down from the pulpit but that he should do so before the sermon for an orthodox preacher need not pray after delivering his sermon forgive me my trespasses since he can say i have proclaimed the pure truth in our day men have become merged in scepticism to such an extent that they regard any one who sets up the aforementioned claim as a semi-lunatic the word of god tells us in a passage where the lord is introduced as speaking jeremiah twenty three twenty eight he that hath my word let him speak my word faithfully what is the chaff to the wheat saith the lord our sermons then are to contain only wheat and no chaff the apostle paul warns the galatians chapter five verse nine a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump he means to say a single false teaching vitiates the entire doctrine the warning with which john concludes the last book of the bible is sounded as far back as in the days of Moses, who says, Deuteronomy 4, 2, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. It is then a diabolical teaching to say, You shall never achieve the ability to give a scriptural presentation of the articles of faith. Especially when students hear a statement like this, it is as if some hellish poison were injected into their hearts for after that they will no longer show any zeal to get to the bottom of the truth to have clear conceptions of the truth but suppose some one could truthfully say there was no false teaching in my sermon still his entire sermon may have been wrong can that be true the second part of our thesis says so only he is an orthodox teacher who in addition to other requirements rightly distinguishes law and gospel from each other that is the final test of a proper sermon. The value of a sermon depends not only on this, that every statement in it be taken from the word of God and be in agreement with the same, but also on this, whether law and gospel have been rightly divided. Of the same building materials furnished two architects, one will construct a magnificent building, while the other, using the same materials, makes a botch of it. Crack-brained man that he is, he may want to begin at the roof, or place all windows in one room, or pile up layers of stone or brick in such a fashion that a crooked wall will be the result. The one house will be out of plumb, and such a bungling piece of work that it will collapse, while the other stands firm, and is a habitable and pleasant abode. In like manner, all doctrines may be treated by sermons by two preachers. The one sermon may be a glorious and precious piece of work, while the other is wrong throughout. Note this well. When you hear some sectarian preaching, you may say, what he said was the truth, and yet you do not feel satisfied. Here is the key for unlocking this mystery. The preacher did not rightly divide law and gospel, and hence everything went wrong. He preached law where he should have preached gospel, and he offered gospel truth where he should have presented the law. Now anyone following such a preacher goes astray. He does not arrive at the sure foundation of the divine truth. He does not attain to an assurance of grace and salvation. Not infrequently this happens in sermons of students. There are found in them comforting remarks like these. It is all by grace. And then we are told, we must do good works. And then again, with our works we cannot gain salvation. There is no order in a sermon of this kind. Nobody understands it, least of all the person who needs it most. There must be a proper division of law and gospel. Be careful to follow this rule in writing your sermons. Perhaps, for once, the words veritably flowed into your pen, but I would advise you to read your sermon over and see whether you have rightly divided law and gospel. For then you may often discover that there is where you made a mistake. In that case, your sermon is wrong, although it contains no false doctrine. Now let me also give you the Bible texts which testify to the truths just stated. We read Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The term orthotomain in this text, which has been rendered by rightly dividing, is plainly used in a metaphorical sense 
It is derived either from the action of priests, when dividing the sacrificial offerings, or from that of the head of a family, when he apportions food and drink to the members of his household. The latter meaning seems to be the correct one. However, many of our theologians adopt the former. Luke 12.42, the Lord says, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Two things are here required of a good householder. In the first place, he must give to each individual his due portion, exactly what he or she needs. If a steward were to do no more than bring out of his larder and cellar all that is in them, and put it on a pile, he would not act wisely. The children probably would grab large portions, and the rest might not get anything. He must give to each the right quantity, according to the amount of work that has been done. When children are at the table with adults, he would be foolish to set meat and wine before children, and milk and light food before adults. But how difficult it is to perceive that these very mistakes are often made in sermons. A preacher must not throw all doctrines in a jumble before his hearers just as they come into his mind, but cut for each of his hearers a portion just as he needs. He is to be like an apothecary, who must give that medicine to the sick, which is for the particular ailment with which they have been afflicted. In the same manner, a preacher must give to each of his hearers his due. He must see to it that secure, carefree, and willful sinners hear the thunderings of the law. Contrite sinners, however, the sweet voice of the Saviour's grace. That is what it means to give to each hearer his due. Ezekiel 13, 18-22, we read, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to them that sow pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people, and will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley, and for pieces of bread, to slay the souls that should not die, and to save the souls alive that should not live, by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye hunt your souls to make them fly, and I will tear them down from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall no more be in your hand to be hunted. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Here you have an instance of the execration of a preacher who knows that his congregation needs an application of the law, but who for a piece of bread keeps silent. Verily, let woe be cried, woe upon every one who furnishes soft pillows and cushions for secure sinners. They are lulling those to sleep with the gospel who ought to be roused from their sleep by means of the law. It is a wrong application of the gospel to preach it to such as are not afraid of sinning. On the other hand, an even more horrible situation is created if the pastor is a legalistic teacher who refuses to preach the gospel to his congregation because he says, these people will misuse it anyway. Are poor sinners on that account to be deprived of the gospel? Let the wicked perish. Nevertheless, the children of God shall know how near at hand their help is, and how easily it is obtained. Any one withholding the gospel from such as are in need of consolation fails to divide law and gospel. Woe, and again woe, to such a one. Zechariah relates the following, chapter 11, verse 7. I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock, and I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. A real spiritual shepherd has two staves, or rods. The rod beauty is the gospel, and the rod bands is the law. He must be well informed as to the persons to whom he is to ply either the one or the other of these staves. The Messiah, who is the speaker in this passage, says that he used the rod bands against the flock of slaughter, that is, 
against sheep which were to be slaughtered and not to be led to the pasture. The poor of the flock represent poor sinners. Among them he uses the comforting staff and rod of the gospel. Most preachers make the mistake of hurling the rod bands among the sheep and using the rod beauty for wicked knaves. By the way, Luther's translation of this passage is unexcelled. Would that the people who want to revise Luther's Bible would stick to their private affairs. Even nature teaches that certain materials must not be mixed if they are to retain their salutary virtue. There are certain substances that are by themselves salutary, but when they are mixed they are turned into poison. That is what happens when law and gospel are mingled. Or take an instance from colors. When you combine yellow and blue, it is neither yellow nor blue, but green. In like manner there arises a third substance, heteritium genus, when law and gospel are confounded in a sermon. The new substance is entirely foreign to either original substance, and causes both of them to lose their virtue. In his Sermon on the Distinction between the Law and the Gospel, St. Louis edition 9, 799 and following, Luther writes, It is therefore a matter of utmost necessity that these two kinds of God's word be well and properly distinguished. Where this is not done, neither the law nor the gospel can be understood, and the consciences of men must perish with blindness and error. The law has its goal fixed, beyond which it cannot go or accomplish anything, namely, until the point is reached where Christ comes in. It must terrify the impenitent with threats of the wrath and displeasure of God. Likewise, the gospel has its particular function and task, namely, to proclaim forgiveness of sins to sorrowing souls. These two may not be commingled, nor the one substituted for the other, without a falsification of doctrine. For while the law and the gospel are indeed equally God's word, they are not the same doctrine. You may correctly state what the law says and what the gospel says, but when you form your statement so as to commingle both, you produce poison for souls. Remember, Law and gospel are God's word, but different kinds of doctrine. A person who does not understand this difference, the true difference, has nothing whatever to offer people. But even the mere knowledge or memorizing of this difference does not prove helpful, for one can learn the facts of this difference in a few hours when preparing for an examination. This knowledge must be reinforced by experience. Not until that is done, will a person understand that the distinction between these two doctrines is a glorious one. In the beginning of the sermon just referred to, Luther says, This is the meaning of St. Paul. Among Christians, both preachers and hearers must adopt and teach a definite distinction between the law and the gospel, between works and faith. Accordingly, Paul enjoins this distinction upon Timothy when he exhorts him, 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly to divide the word of truth, and so forth. This distinction between the law and the gospel is the supreme art among Christians. Each and all of those who glory in the name of Christian, or have adopted it, may and should understand this art. For wherever there is a deficiency in this respect, it is impossible to distinguish a Christian from a Gentile or Jew. So important is this distinction. For this reason, Paul so strenuously insists that these two doctrines, the law and the gospel, be well and properly distinguished among Christians. Both the law, or the Ten Commandments, and the gospel are indeed God's word. The latter was given by God at the beginning, in paradise, the former on Mount Sinai. But the matter of decisive importance is this, that these two words be properly distinguished and not commingled. Otherwise, the true meaning of neither will be known nor retained. Yea, imagining that we have both, we shall find that we possess neither. End of Lecture 4Fifth Evening Lecture, October 17th, 1884 It is a glorious and marvelous arrangement, passing comprehension, 
that God governs the kingdoms of this world, not by immediate action, but through the agency of men, who, not to mention other things, are far too short-sighted and far too feeble for this task. But it is marvellous beyond comparison with this arrangement, that even in his kingdom of grace God performs the planting, ministering, extending, and preserving of his kingdom, not in an immediate manner, but through men who are altogether unfit for this task. This is proof of a loving kindness and condescension to men on the part of God, besides of a wisdom of his that no intellect of man can encompass or sound to its depth. For who can measure the greatness of God's love, which is revealed in the fact that God desires not only to save this world of apostate men, but also to employ men from this very world, fellow sinners, for this task? Who can compute the riches and the wisdom of God? Who knows how to accomplish the work of saving men by the agency of other men who are quite unfit and unqualified for this work, and that he has hitherto gloriously pursued, and still is pursuing this work? My dear friends, you are beholding in this arrangement a mighty reason not only for humble wonder, but also for heartfelt joy and exultation. For in days to come God wants to make you instruments of his grace for this work stop and consider if you could learn at this place how to prolong the life of those who will be entrusted to your care by fifty years or even to raise the dead to a new lease of life here in time how great and glorious your calling would appear not only to you but to all men in what great demand you would be how you would be esteemed as extraordinary men what a treasure men would think they had obtained if they had obtained you and yet all this would be as nothing compared with the sublimeness and glory of the calling for which you are to be trained here. You are not to prolong this poor temporal life of those who will be entrusted to your care, but you are to bring them the life that is the sum of all bliss, the life that is eternal, without end. You are not to raise those entrusted to your care from temporal death to live once more this poor temporal life, but you are to pluck them out of their spiritual and eternal death and usher them into heaven. Oh, if you would seriously consider what a great honor God means to confer on you, you would go down on your knees every day, yea, every hour. You would prostrate yourselves in dust and exclaim with the psalmist, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Psalm 144, verse 3. At the same time, you would receive an incentive from God's choice of you to surrender yourself to the merciful God every day and every hour, and say, Lord, here I am with my body and soul and all my strength. I am willing to consume them all in your service. How glad and ready you would be to make every sacrifice in the interest of your calling and allow yourselves to be fashioned into tools of God. However, the matter of primary importance to you is that before teaching others, you first obtain a very thorough and vital knowledge yourselves of those things which God by his prophets and apostles has revealed for the salvation of men. Let us then cheerfully proceed in the consideration of our highly important subject. To begin with, let me submit two testimonies from John Gerhardt. True, he cannot speak of facts of experience with the divine rhetoric that was granted to Luther. However, Gerhard made a thorough study of Luther and gave a systematic presentation of Luther's teaching. In the chapter on the Gospel, paragraph 55, he says, The distinction between the law and the Gospel must be maintained at every point. Mark well, at every point. There is not a doctrine that does not call upon us rightly to divide law and Gospel. Gerhard proceeds. However, this distinction must be observed above all at two points. First, in the article of justification, which, owing to the corruption and weakness of our flesh, is in a certain way, though accidentally, incapacitated for this task. Romans 8.3. The law does not belong in the doctrine of justification. What is a most important point? We cannot be saved by the law. Accordingly, God provides another means for us by which we can be saved. Gerhard continues, But our justification is from the gospel, 
in which the righteousness that is valid in God's sight is revealed without the law. Romans 3.21 For it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Romans 1.16 All now depends on this other means which God has provided, on our accepting these tidings of great joy, the gospel, and in it the doctrine of justification, without which the Bible would sink to the level of any other book of morals. To return to Gerhard, for this reason men should be exhorted, yea, urged, to perform good works according to the norm of the law. These works, however, must not be brought into the august place where our justification in the sight of God occurs. For at that point there is a ceaseless conflict between man's doing and his believing, between God's grace and man's works, between law and gospel. Woe to us! if, when about to expound the gospel, we mingle the law with it. That is what we are doing when, in expounding the gospel, we say more than, accept this message. Every addition would be law. The gospel demands nothing of us. It only says, come, eat, and drink. What it offers to us is the great supper. Here is where most preachers make their mistake. They are afraid that by preaching the gospel too clearly, they will be the fault if people lapse into sin. They imagine that the gospel is food for the carnal-minded. True, to many the gospel becomes a savor of death unto death, but that is not the fault of the gospel. That happens only because men do not accept, do not believe the gospel. Faith is not the mere thought, I believe. My whole heart must have become seized by the gospel and have come to rest in it. When that happens, I am transformed, and cannot but love and serve God. Most urgent admonitions must indeed be administered to men, even after they have become believers. But these admonitions must not be brought into the solemn meeting where God justifies the sinner. The law must first discharge its functions in order that those who hear it may accept the gospel with a hungering and thirsting soul, and drink their fill of it. As soon as a person has become a poor sinner, as soon as he is aware of the fact that he cannot be saved by his own effort, even before a spark of love has been kindled in him, Christ says, There is my man. Come to me just as thou art. I will help thee. I will take from thee the burden that oppresses thee, and what I shall lay on thee is a light burden and an easy yoke. The principal thing that I have to tell a person when explaining to him how he can become righteous is that I announce to him the free grace of God, concealing nothing, saying none other things to him than what God says in the gospel. A hedge must be made around Mount Sinai, but not around Golgotha. At the latter place all wrath of God has been appeased. Now, the Lord has given two keys to the church, and through the church to all ministers, the binding and the releasing key. The binding key locks heaven. The releasing key opens it. These two wonderful keys the preacher holds in his hand, for the church gave them to him when it conferred on him the office of the ministry. Continuing, Gerhard tells us that the distinction between the law and the gospel must be observed. Secondly, in using the keys of the church, forgiveness of sin must not be proclaimed to impenitent and secure sinners. That would be an abominable commingling of the law and the gospel. That would be like stuffing food into the mouth of a person who is already filled to the point of vomiting. What must be announced to such a person, Gerhardt says, is rather the wrath of God from the law, Romans 2.9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, 1 Timothy 1.9. The law is made for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, whom it crushes with the weight of its damning accusations. To contrite hearts, not the threats of the law, but the oil of evangelical consolation must be administered. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Where is the place of my rest? To this man I will look, even to him that is poor, and of contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Matthew eleven five. The poor have the gospel preached to them. When I know that a person is not in a condition to have the gospel preached to him, I must not proclaim it to him. However, when I speak in public, the situation is different. 
There I must take into consideration chiefly the elect children of God. Still, I must preach the law even there. A sermon that does not contain any law is worthless. In every gathering of people, there are always impenitent persons who must be roused from their sleep of sin and terrified. Any one who, on being admonished, promptly says, Ah, bosh! That does not concern me, shows that his heart has not yet been crushed. In another place, in the same chapter, paragraph 52, Gerhard writes, there are several reasons why this distinction between the law and the gospel must be accurately defined and strictly adhered to. In the first place, many instances from the history of the church of days gone by might be adduced to show that the pure teaching of the article of justification is not preserved, and absolutely cannot be preserved, if the distinction of these two doctrines is neglected. Woe to him who injects poison into the doctrine of justification! He poisons the well which God has dug for man's salvation. Whoever takes this doctrine away from man robs him of everything, for he takes the very heart out of Christianity, which ceases to pulsate after this attack. The ladder for mounting up to heaven is taken away, and there is no longer any hope of saving men. In the second place, Gerhard continues, when the doctrine of the gospel is not separated from the law by definite boundary lines, the blessings of Christ are considerably obscured. By ascribing to man some share in his own salvation, we rob Christ of all his glory. God has created us without our cooperation, and he wants to save us the same way. We are to thank him for having created us with a hope of everlasting life. Even so, he alone wants to save us. Woe to him who says that he must contribute something towards his own salvation. He deprives Christ of his entire merit. For Jesus is called the Savior, not a helper towards salvation, such as preachers are. Jesus has achieved our entire salvation. That is why we were so determined in our predestinarian controversy. For the basic element in the controversy has been that we insisted on keeping law and gospel separate, while our opponents mingle the one with the other. When they hear from us this statement, Out of pure mercy God has elected us to the praise of the glory of His grace. God vindicates for Himself exclusively the glory of saving us, and so forth. They say, That is a horrible doctrine. If that were true, God would be partial. No, He must have beheld something in men that prompted Him to elect this or that particular man. When He beheld something good in a person, He elected him. If that were so, man would really be the principal cause of his salvation. In that case, man could say, Thank God I have done my share towards being saved. However, when we shall have arrived in our heavenly fatherland, this is what we shall say. If I had my own way, I should never have found salvation. And even supposing I had found it by myself, I should have lost it again. Thou, O God, didst come and draw me to thy word, partly by tribulation, partly by anguish of heart, partly by sickness, and so forth. All these things thou hast used as means to bring me unto heaven, while I was always striving for perdition. Yonder we shall see and marvel that there has not been an hour when God did not work in us to save us, and that there has not been an hour when we wanted to be saved. Indeed, we are forced to say to God, Thou alone hast redeemed me. Thou alone dost save me. Verily, as sure as there is a living God in heaven, I cannot do anything towards my salvation. That is the point under discussion in this controversy. In conclusion, Gerhard says, In the third place, commingling law and gospel necessarily produces confusion of consciences because there is no true reliable and abiding comfort for the consciences that have been alarmed and terrified if the gracious promises of the gospel are falsified commingling law and gospel brings about unrest of conscience no matter how comforting the preaching is that people hear it is of no help to them if there is a sting in it the honey of the gospel may at first taste good but if a sting of the law goes with it everything is spoiled my conscience cannot come to rest if I cannot say, 
Nevertheless, according to his grace, God will receive me. If the preacher says to me, Come, for all things are now ready, provided you do this or that, I am lost. For in that case I must ask myself, Have I done as God desires? And I shall find no help. End of Lecture 5Lecture 6 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixth Evening Lecture, October 23, 1884. A godly Lutheran theologian of a former age, among other things, gives the following description of students of theology. When they arrive at the university, they know everything. In their second year of study, they become away of something that they do not know. At the close of their last year of study, they are convinced that they know nothing at all. We can easily see the lesson which the old theologian wished to convey, namely, that there is no worse delusion than this, to think that one has advanced very far in the acquisition of knowledge, and that the knowledge of one who is conceited because of what he knows surely is but very superficial. There is no doubt that what the old theologian said is quite right. It perfectly agrees with the statement of the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 8, 2. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Accordingly, all great pedagogues and teachers have warned their pupils, saying, Non multa, said multum. Do not study many different things, but much of one thing. Everything depends, not on how much we know, but on how well we know it. The greater the progress a person makes in his science, the more rapidly does he become convinced that he is still lacking many things. He does not adopt the slogan of our times, Quantum est quod schemus. Oh, how gloriously much we know! But repeats the confession of the great philosopher, Quantum est quod nescimus. Alas, how great is our ignorance! The more truly learned a person is, the humbler he is, for he knows how much he is still lacking, within what narrow boundaries his knowledge is confined, and how much there still remains unexplored. Now if this observation applies to every kind of knowledge, to every department of science, it applies with special emphasis to the domain of theology. Here is where the well-known saying of the Apostle Paul applies, which he uttered not concerning genuine knowledge, but about the conceited knowledge to which I referred. Accordingly, Luther addresses this word of warning to every lazy student. Study. Attende lectioni. Keep on reading. You cannot read too much in the Scriptures, for what you read you cannot too fully comprehend, what you understand you cannot teach too well, and what you are teaching well you cannot put into practice too well. Experto crede, Ruperto. Believe, Rupert, for he knows from experience. Every true understanding, every genuine knowledge in theology is obtained with great difficulty, but the greatest difficulty occurs in the study of the doctrine which is discussed in these evening lectures. The third thesis, now before us, furnishes an excellent opportunity for making this point clear to us. Thesis 3. Rightly Distinguishing the Law and the Gospel is the most difficult and the highest art of Christians in general, and of theologians in particular. It is taught only by the Holy Spirit, in the school of experience. Possibly someone among you is thinking, Is this thesis really true? I have now heard five lectures on this subject, and it is perfectly clear to me. If this is the most difficult art, I know it. But my dear friend, you are greatly mistaken. Consider that the thesis does not mean that the doctrine of the law and the gospel is so difficult that it cannot be learned without the aid of the Holy Spirit. It is easy, easy enough for children to learn. Every child can comprehend this doctrine. It is contained in every catechism. It is not strong meat but milk. It is the first letters of the alphabet. It belongs to the rudiments of Christianity, for without this doctrine no person can be a Christian. Even a small child soon learns these facts. The first part of the Catechism treats of the Ten Commandments, the second part of the Creed. 
we are first told what we must do, next, that a person need only believe to be saved. In other words, the child observes that the second part does not, like the first, make demands. This doctrine of the distinction of law and gospel is entirely different from the doctrine of the attributes by which the three persons of the Godhead are distinguished from one another, or the doctrine of predestination with its many inscrutable mysteries, or the doctrine of the communication of the divine attributes to the human nature of Christ. These doctrines exceed the grasp of children and cannot be comprehended by them. But the doctrine of the distinction between the law and the gospel is different. You know it now. But at the present time we are studying the application and the use of this doctrine. The practical application of this doctrine presents difficulties which no man can surmount by reasonable reflections. The Holy Spirit must teach men this in the school of experience. The difficulties of mastering this art confront the minister, in the first place, in so far as he is a Christian, in the second place, in so far as he is a minister. In the first place, then, the proper distinction between the law and the gospel is a difficult and high art to the minister, in so far as he is a Christian. Indeed, the proper distinction between the law and the gospel is the highest art which a person can learn. We read Psalm fifty one, ten and eleven. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Here David prays God for a right spirit. After his horrible fall, the shedding of innocent blood, and the sin of adultery, David had lost assurance of divine grace. Absolution was indeed pronounced to him when he had come to a penitent knowledge of his sin but we do not hear that he forthwith became cheerful. On the contrary, many of his psalms plainly show that he was in very great misery and affliction. When the messenger of God approached him with a declaration, The Lord hath put away thy sin, his heart sighed, Ah, no, that is not possible. My sin has been too great. We behold him watering his couch with his tears, Psalm 6.6, 6, going about a bent and broken man, his body drying up like grass in the drought of summer. This exalted royal prophet knew the doctrine of the law and the gospel full well. All his psalms are full of references to the distinctions between the two. But when he fell into sin himself, he lacked the practical ability of applying this message. He cried, Renew a right spirit within me. It is a characteristic of Christians to regard the Scriptures as the true, infallible word of God. But when they are in need of comfort, they find none. They cry for mercy. They supplicate God on their knees. God made David taste the bitterness of sin. In general, we behold David after his fall more frequently in sadness than in joyful spirits, and we see that one misfortune after the other befalls him. God did not permit these misfortunes to afflict David because he had not forgiven his sin but in order to keep him from falling into another sin. It was nothing but love and mercy that prompted God to act like this. Naturally, a person still dead in his sin thinks, why was David so foolish as to torment his mind with a sin that had been forgiven by God? A person reasoning thus makes of the gospel a pillow for his carnal mind to rest on. He continues his sinful life and imagines that he will, after all, land in heaven. His gospel is a gospel for the flesh. Luke 5, 8, we have the cry of Peter, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Is not this a remarkable incident? The Lord comes to the disciple, whom he had named Petros, a rock man, and bids him and his fellow fishermen, after an unsuccessful night on the lake, to drop their nets in deep water. Peter complied most likely expecting, however, that he would catch nothing. But, lo, they caught such a multitude of fishes that their nets broke. Now Peter is seized with fear. He reflects, That must be the Almighty God Himself who has spoken to me. That must be my Maker. He will one day be my judge. He falls down at Jesus' knees and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He expects the Lord to say to him, Look at the multitude of sins thou hast committed. Thou art worthy of everlasting death and damnation. Whence, then, came P 
Peter's fright. Why did he not thank Jesus when he fell down at his knees? Because his many sins passed before his mind's eye, and in that condition it was impossible for him to express cheerful gratitude, but had to drop trembling to his knees and cry to the Lord and Saviour those awful words, Depart from me, O Lord. The devil had robbed him of all comfort, and whispered to him that he must speak thus to Jesus. He expected nothing else than to be slain by the Lord. He was incapable of distinguishing law and gospel. If he had been able to do this, he could have approached Jesus cheerfully, remembering that he had forgiven all his sins. Many a time in his later life he probably said to himself, Peter, you were a great simpleton on that occasion. Instead of what you did say to Jesus, you should have said, O Lord, abide with me, for I am a sinful man. That is what he did on later occasions when he had fallen into another sin. Then he was filled with joy unspeakable when Jesus gave him that look full of gracious compassion. 1 John three nineteen and 20 we read, Hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. When our heart does not condemn us, it is easy to distinguish law and gospel. That is the state of a Christian. But he may get into a condition where his heart condemns him. Do what he will, he cannot silence the accusing voice within. It calls to him again and again, reminding him of his former sins. The recollection of some long-forgotten sin may suddenly start up in him, and he is seized with a terrible fright. Now, if in that moment a person can rightly divide law and gospel, he will fall at Jesus' feet and take comfort in Jesus' merit. That, however, is not easy. One who is spiritually dead regards it as foolish to torment himself with former sins. He becomes increasingly indifferent towards all sins. A Christian, however, feels his sin, and also the witness of his conscience against him. But in the end, after Christians had learned to make the proper practical use of the distinction between the law and the gospel, they joined St. John in saying, God is greater than my heart. He has rendered a different verdict on men's sinning, and that applies also to me. Blessed are you if you have learned this difficult art. If you have learned it, do not imagine yourselves perfect. You will always be more than beginners in this art. Remember this. When the law condemns you, then immediately lay hold upon the gospel. Since the days of the apostles, there has not been a more gracious teacher of this art than Luther. Yet he confesses that in an effort to reduce his teaching to practice, he was often defeated. Spite of the fact that he had led a decent life and was not guilty of gross sins, the devil often vexed him. He tormented him with the sins of his inner life. Nonplussed, Luther would often come to Bugenhagen, his confessor, with his worries, and kneeling, receive absolution, whereupon he would depart rejoicing. Luther writes, St. Louis edition 9, 806 and following, God has given us his word in these two forms, the law and the gospel. The one is from him as well as the other, and to both he has attached a distinct order. The law is to require of every one perfect righteousness. The gospel is to present gratis the righteousness demanded by the law to those who have it not, that is, to all men. Now then, Whoever has not satisfied the demands of the law, and is captive under sin and the power of death, let him turn to the gospel. Let him believe what is preached concerning Christ, namely, that he is verily the precious Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, that he has reconciled man with his Father in heaven, and from pure grace, freely and for nothing, gives to all who believe this everlasting righteousness, everlasting life and bliss. Let him cling solely to this message. Let him call upon Christ, beseeching him for grace and forgiveness of sin. And since this great gift is obtained by faith alone, let him firmly believe the message, and he shall receive according as he believes. This is the proper distinction, and verily it is the utmost importance that it be correctly perceived. Oh yes, we can readily make the distinctions in words and preach about it. But to put it into use and reduce it to practice, that is a high art and not easily attained. Papists and fanatics do not understand it at all. 
I observe in my own case and that of others, who know how to talk about this distinction in the very best fashion, how difficult it is. To talk about the laws being a different word and doctrine from the gospel, that is a common achievement, soon accomplished. But to apply the distinction in our practical experience, and to make this art operative, that is labor and sorrow. Again, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 9, 808 and following, This distinction must be observed all the more when the law wants to force me to abandon Christ and his gospel boon. In that emergency I must abandon the law, and say, Dear law, if I have not done the works I should have done, do them yourself. I will not, for your sake, allow myself to be plagued to death, taken captive, and kept under your thraldom, and thus forget the gospel. Whether I have sinned, done wrong, or failed in my duty, let that be your concern, O law. Away with you, and let my heart alone. I have no room for you in my heart. But if you require me to lead a godly life here on earth, that I shall gladly do. If, however, like a housebreaker, you want to climb in where you do not belong, causing me to lose what has been given me, I would rather not know you at all than abandon my gift. Like two hostile forces, law and gospel sometimes clash with each other in a person's conscience. The gospel says to him, You have been received into God's grace. The law says to him, do not believe it, for look at your past life, how many and grievous are your sins. Examine the thoughts and desires that you have harbored in your mind. On an occasion like this, it is difficult to divide law and gospel. When this happens to a person, he must say to the law, Away with you, your demands have all been fully met, and you have nothing to demand of me. There is one who has paid my debt. This difficulty does not occur to a person dead in his trespasses and sins. He is soon through with the law. But the difficulty is quite real to the person who has been converted. He may run to the opposite extreme and come nigh to despair. Luther says, St. Louis edition 9, 802, Place any person who is well versed in this art of dividing the law from the gospel at the head and call him a doctor of holy writ, for without the Holy Ghost it is impossible to master this distinction. That is my personal experience. Moreover, I observe in the case of other people how difficult it is to separate the teaching of the law from that of the gospel. The Holy Ghost is needed as schoolmaster and instructor in this task. Otherwise, no man on earth will be able to understand or learn it. That is the reason why no pope, no false Christian, no fanatic can divide these two from each other especially in causa materiali, et in objecto. Luther means to say, It is not difficult to say what the contents of the law and the gospel are, nor at what persons they are aiming. But it is difficult to say, on the one hand, whether this particular statement is part of the law or of the gospel, and, on the other hand, to whom, in an individual case, the law must be applied, and to whom the gospel. The greatest difficulty is encountered with the theologians themselves. In his table talk, Luther says, Valk edition, 22, page 65, There is not a man on earth who knows how properly to divide the law from the gospel. When we hear about it in a sermon, we imagine that we know how to do it, but we are greatly mistaken. I imagined I understood it because during so long a time I had written a great deal about it. But believe me, when I come to a pinch, I perceive that I have widely missed the mark. Accordingly, God the Holy Spirit alone must be regarded as master of and instructor in this art. Mark this confession of Luther, the man who had written large tomes on this subject in many years. Let me remark in passing that we are always more inclined to give ear to the law than to the gospel. In his commentary on Psalm 131, St. Louis edition 4, 2077, Luther writes, There are some who imagine that they understand these matters quite well. But I warn you to beware of such a presumptuous thought, and to remember that you must remain pupils of the word. Satan is such an accomplished juggler that he can easily abolish the difference and make the law force itself into the place of the gospel and vice versa. We often meet with people in their last agony who, with a stricken conscience, 
sees a few sayings which they suppose to be gospel, while in reality they are law, and thus forfeit the consolation of the gospel. For instance, the statement in Matthew 19.17, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Likewise this one in Matthew 7.21, Not every one who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. The devil approaches men who are in anguish of death, and in their last hour seeks to pluck them away from the gospel. When Christians are departing into eternity, they reflect whether they are worthy. They may review a multitude of texts, and hit upon one like this, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Then their heart tells them, You are not fit, you cannot be saved. You see, they cannot distinguish between law and gospel. Therefore it is good for you to be taught this art while you are young. But you must not think, I have been thoroughly grounded in this doctrine, and when I shall be in anguish of death, I shall simply cling to what I have been taught. Ah, yes, if that were within your power. But the devil will throw you into such confusion that you will not find a way of escape out of your dilemma. Nor must you think, Oh, I am still young. Does not God frequently snatch one away in the flower of his youth, or in order to impress upon others how necessary it is for everybody to consider that he too must die? Luther continues, By tests like those cited, the hearts of men are often led astray, so that they cannot think of anything except what they have done and should have done, likewise of what God commands and forbids. While keeping their minds on these things, they forget all that Christ has done, and God has promised to do through Christ. Therefore, no one should be so presumptuous as to imagine that he has attained to perfection in this matter. You remember that the point we are discussing now is how a preacher, in as far as he is a Christian, is to divide the law and the gospel. For he must be a Christian, or else he ought not to be a preacher. Now anyone who fails to attain the knowledge of and the practical ability to apply this distinction is still a heathen or a Jew. The forma of a Christian, that which makes a person a Christian, is that he knows how to seek salvation in Christ, and thus escape the law. I wish to cite Luther once more. He writes, St. Louis edition 9, 161, In your tribulations you will become aware that the gospel is a rare guest in men's consciences, while the law is their daily and familiar companion. For man has by nature the knowledge of the law. Unless a person learns this by experience, he will not learn it at all. If you are Christians, you will admit that you are far oftener troubled and worried than comforted. When you feel the comfort of the gospel in your heart, that is a glimpse of the light that may come to you on a certain day. But then, several days may pass when you will not catch that glimpse again. Always keep this reflection present. For such poor sinners as I am, the gospel, the sweet gospel, has been provided. I have forgiveness of sins through Christ. Luther proceeds. There is a time to die, and there is a time to live. There is a time for hearing the law, and there is a time to be unconcerned about the law. There is a time to hear the gospel, and there is a time to be unconcerned about the gospel. At this moment, let the law be gone, and let the gospel come. For that is not the time to hear the law, but the gospel. However, how about this? You have not done any good. On the contrary, you have committed grievous sins. I admit that, but I have forgiveness of sins through Christ, for whose sake all my sins have been remitted. However, while the conscience is not engaged in this conflict, while you are obliged to discharge the ordinary functions of your office, at a time when you must act as a minister of the word, a magistrate, a husband, a teacher, a pupil, and so forth, it is not in season to hear the gospel, but the law. At such a time you are to perform the duties of your profession, and so forth. Accordingly, when you are called upon to do what is right in public, that is not the time to hear the gospel, but the law, and to remember your calling or profession. Whenever your relation to God is not under review, you must act in accordance with the law, yet not like a slave, but like a child. End of Lecture 6
Translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventh Evening Lecture, November 7, 1884. Fourteen days ago, I communicated to you Luther's statement that without illumination by the Holy Spirit, no person can properly distinguish the law from the gospel, and that Luther had declared himself to be nothing but a feeble novice in this exalted and glorious art. My intention was not at all to cast you down and to discourage you. On the one hand, I wanted to cure those among you of their egregious self-conceit, who have hitherto imagined that distinguishing the law and the gospel is quite an easy accomplishment. On the other hand, I wanted to relieve the pusillanimous among you, and encourage those who may be reasoning thus. Well, if it was such a difficult task for Luther to acquire this art, I shall be much less capable of acquiring it. If you will consider that it is only in the school of the Holy Spirit and of genuine Christian experience that the proper distinction between law and gospel is learned, you can easily perceive how it is possible that a person may be a graduate of all schools in existence and yet not have acquired this art. He must not think that the difficulties which have been noted in connection with this matter relate only to poorly gifted youths. They relate also to those highly endowed and well informed. As a matter of fact, the better gifts and the greater knowledge a person possesses, the more easily he is tempted to self-esteem and self-reliance, the more he is apt to take matters easy, and accordingly he never arrives at the knowledge of the proper connection and the proper distinction of these doctrines. Chrysostom, you remember, was a great scholar and an excellent orator. His original name was John, but because of his oratorical gifts he was called the golden-mouthed, that is, Chrysostom. He seemed to have the gift to do with his audience anything he pleased. He was equally able to make them glad or sad, to exalt or to wail, weep and sob according to his pleasure. And yet the good man, upon the whole, accomplished little, because he was poor in distinguishing the law from the gospel, habitually mingling the one doctrine with the other. Andrew Osiander, furnishes another instance. He was a scholar with a keen intellect and an orator without a peer. At first he divided law and gospel in a very excellent manner. The draft which he sketched for the Augsburg Confession shows this. That was his status as long as he was pleased to be Luther's pupil. However, he became proud of his splendid gifts and great knowledge, and at length was utterly blinded in his judgment of himself. The consequence was that he had got to commingle law and gospel in the most horrible fashion. He taught that a person becomes righteous in the sight of God, not by the righteousness which Christ, by his bitter suffering and death, had acquired for him, but by the indwelling of Christ with his essential divine righteousness in a person. Ah, do heed these warning examples. Now, since a person under the pedagogy of the Holy Spirit learns rightly to distinguish the law from the gospel and to divide both, it follows that genuine Christians, be they never so feeble otherwise, as long as they have duly experienced the force of the law and the consolation of the gospel, or the power of faith, are best prepared to apply to others what they have experienced in their own lives. Accordingly, ministers who may be classed among the poorest intellectually not infrequently, are found to be the best preachers. There is no doubt that in the past ages many a simple, poor presbyter of no renown in a small rural parish divided law and gospel better than Chrysostom, the great orator in the metropolis of Constantinople, better than the philosophically trained Clement of Alexandria, better than that universal scholar, Origen. We observe the same phenomenon at the time of the Reformation. A simple parson like Cordatus, the intimate friend of Luther, unquestionably divided law and gospel a thousand times better than Melanchthon, called preceptor of all Germany. This view will not be altered by the fact that Melanchthon tried to ridicule Cordatus by calling him Quadratus, a clumsy quadruped, because he had unmasked Melanchthon when the latter had begun to err in the doctrine regarding man's free will. Accordingly, though it is a difficult achievement to divide law and gospel. He will best learn this art who has attained to the love of his Lord Jesus, and has experienced the power of the law and the gospel. This evening, 
we are to consider that also for theologians as such the proper distinction between law and gospel is the highest and most difficult art and that everything else that a theologian must know is of less value than this art we read second timothy two fifteen study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth the apostle's admonition to timothy to study indicates does it not that dividing law and gospel properly is a great difficult art our lord declares luke twelve forty two through forty four who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season blessed is that servant whom his lord when he cometh shall find so doing of a truth i say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath what the lord in this text terms a great achievement is not the mere recital of the word of god or to stick to the simile the apportioning of some food to every member of the household but this that every one is given his due portion in the proper time that each one is treated as his spiritual condition requires this must be done at the proper time it is a poor steward that gives the servants something now and then allows a long time to pass before he gives them something again and is unconcerned about the quantity of food that he must provide and about the proper time to serve it the lesson conveyed by this simile is this a preacher must be well versed in the art of ministering to each in season exactly what he needs either the law or the gospel that this art can be learned only from the holy spirit we see from second corinthians two sixteen who is sufficient for these things and chapter three four through six such trust have we through christ to god word not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of god who also hath made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit from god alone the apostle expects his qualification for this high and difficult art by the term letter he understands the law by spirit the gospel we have here a plain testimony that both must be preached alongside of one another the ability to do this no person possesses by nature god must bestow it upon him for this reason such a person must be divorced from the spirit of the world no one still lugging with him the spirit of the world can ever properly learn how to make this distinction for the spirit of god does not dwell in a heart in which the spirit of the world still claims a place that is the reason why the world cannot receive the spirit accordingly any one desiring to become a genuine documus a servant approved of the lord must first become a christian he may possibly make a correct presentation of every dogma but that is not sufficient he must understand besides to minister to each soul in his audience the very thing it needs this is possible when the preacher is able to make an exact investigation of the condition of each soul true that is very difficult just as the diagnosis is the most difficult part of a physician's skill using the quick and sharp word of god is not all that you have to do with this sharp sword you may very easily slay souls if you do not minister to their necessities accordingly a minister must be able to distinguish whether he is facing a hypocrite or a true christian a person still spiritually dead or one that has already been roused from his sleep of sin one who is tempted by the devil and his own flesh or one who has been given over to the rule of the devil because of his malice an inexperienced person readily takes a hypocrite for a true christian and so forth preach so that every hearer feels he means me he has painted the hypocrite exactly as i am again the pastor may have described a person afflicted with temptation so plainly that the actual victim of a temptation has to admit that is my condition the penitent person must soon feel while listening to the pastor that comfort is meant for me i am to appropriate it the alarmed soul must be led to think oh that is a sweet message that is for me yea the impenitent too must be made to acknowledge the preacher has painted my exact portrait accordingly the preacher must understand how to depict accurately the inward condition of every one of his hearers 
A mere objective presentation of the various doctrines is not sufficient to this end. A person may be orthodox, may have apperceived the pure doctrine, but he is not in personal communion with God, has not yet settled his account with God, has not yet attained it to the assurance that his debt of sins has been remitted. How can such a person prepare a Christian sermon? Here is where the saying which was current among the pagans applies, pectus facet desertum, that is, true oratory is a matter of the heart. Indeed, the distinction between the law and the gospel is properly learned only in the school of the Holy Spirit, in tribulation. That is what makes people love to read Luther's sermons. At the start, his sermons do not please. But when people conquer their dislike, perhaps because the pastor had pronounced the book of Luther's sermons a precious book, they are finally so highly pleased with it that they want no other. It is, indeed, a delight to read Luther's sermons. One finds his own likeness on every page. At first they give one a terrible fright, stunning and stupefying one. At first Luther hurls one into the abyss. But when that has been done, he says, Do you believe this? Answer, yes. Then Luther says, Very well, you may come up again. Luther's sermons are full of thunder and lightning, but these are speedily followed by the soft blowing of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel. It is impossible for the reader to resist. He cannot but admit that this is good, nourishing bread, the proper daily food for his soul. Luther does not point a long way. He does not propound many teachings how to get out of the abyss. As soon as he has made a person see that he is a poor sinner, he says to him, Quit your despair. The grace of Christ is greater than the sins of the whole world. At all times, Luther preaches the law and the gospel alongside of each other in such a manner that the law is given the illumination by the gospel, which makes the former much more terrible, while the sweetness and the rich comfort of the gospel is greatly increased by the law, that is, by contrast. That is what you will have to learn from our dear father Luther. That will make people listen to you. That will rouse their interest. They will get the impression that you want to lift them out of perdition this very hour and send them away from church rejoicing. But a preacher must exercise great care lest he say something wrong. Again and again he must go over his sermon and consider whether everything is quite as it should be that there is nothing in the sermon contrary to either the law or the gospel. For instance, it would be incorrect to say, as long as a person is afraid of dying, he is not a child of God. That is a great falsehood. True, it is correct to say that Christians are not afraid to appear before God, but that they still dread becoming a prey to corruption and decomposition in the grave, and so forth. A statement of that kind must properly be struck from the sermon. Again, Young ministers who are very desirous of achieving results and accomplishing something, may there be many of them, love to speak before worldlings of the blessed state of being a Christian. However, not infrequently they exceed the bounds of propriety by saying, O oh, those poor worldly people, they are without any joys, any peace, any rest. That is not true at all. When worldly people hear a statement of that kind, they think, that preacher is a simpleton, to be sure. What does he know about this? I have joy, peace, and quiet indeed. The preacher must express himself differently. He must admit that worldly people have their delights and enjoyments, but at the same time he must frequently remind them that they are frequently visited with such thoughts as these. What if it were true what the Christians are saying? If they are right, what will be my fate? Amidst their riotous orgies, the thought of death suddenly looms like a spectre and turns their joys to bitterness. If the preacher addresses them thus, he forces them to acknowledge, that man can give you a true picture of yourself. Again, if you were to portray Christians as being exceedingly happy people, utterly without worry and trouble of any kind, you would again not paint a true picture. Christians are in far greater anxiety, worry, and tribulation than worldly people. Yet, spite of all this, the Christian is far happier than worldly men. If God were to come this night and demand his soul from him, he would say, Praise God, my race is run, soon I shall be with my Saviour. Amidst his tribulations, this is his reflection. Surely it will not be long before I shall come home to my Father in heaven. 
and all the misery and woe of this earth will be past and forgotten. While Christians are weeping, the angels are rejoicing over them. While Christians are in anguish of soul and terror, God is cherishing the most cordial thoughts of love for them, and calls them his beloved children. These are a few instances that serve to illustrate the danger of exceeding the limits of propriety, even with the best intention. Another point that you will have to bear in mind while writing your sermons is not to say anything that may be misunderstood. For instance, this statement is liable to misconstruction. Any one sinning purposely and knowingly falls from grace. For true Christians occasionally sin with intent and knowledge, namely, when they are, so to speak, rushed by sinful passion from within, or by allurements from without. Such sins are called hasty sins. Here is one with a wrathful temper, though as a rule amicable. Something crosses his path, and suddenly he boils over in angry speech. In such a case the Spirit of God will administer to the culprit this rebuke. Behold, what a miserable creature thou art, and prompt him to ask God's forgiveness. It is true, indeed, that a Christian sinning intentionally grieves the Spirit of God every time. The Holy Spirit will not take part in his action. Regarding this matter we must therefore speak to people in this manner. You are treading on dangerous ground. The Holy Spirit will withdraw from you, and instead of making progress in your Christianity, you will be thrown back. If you do not repent and remain genuinely penitent, this sin may be your ruin. Equally liable to misconstruction would be this statement. Good works are not necessary, only faith. It would be correct to say, good works are not necessary to obtain salvation. But I cannot remain on the way to heaven if I am doing no good works. Besides, God has certainly commanded good works. He demands that we do good works. The following statement, too, would be liable to be misunderstood. Sin does not harm a Christian. True, a sin committed because of the frailty of our flesh does not immediately hurl the doer into disfavor with God. Nevertheless, it harms him. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, says Paul. But he does not say there is nothing sinful to them. In fine, you cannot be too careful in your preaching. It is faulty, likewise, not to explain some points at greater length. Here is an instance. Agadius Hunius, during his college years, on a certain occasion heard this statement during a service at church. However, there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. That is the sin against the Holy Ghost. Like a dagger, that statement entered the young student's heart. He promptly imagined that he had committed that sin. The result was that he planned suicide. He remembered that the Holy Spirit had indeed many a time knocked at the door of his heart for admission while he had been listening to the sermon, but in his youthful light-heartedness he had allowed these invitations to pass out of his mind. In a miraculous manner, however, God rescued him from his great anguish of conscience. Approaching his seat in the classroom one day, he found a leaf torn from a precious book of devotion written by Magister Spangenberg. It contained remarks about the very sin against the Holy Spirit, this statement in particular, that a person, after committing this sin, is unwilling to repent until his death. That saved Hunius. And it is due to the fact that even in his youth he had to pass through such great tribulations that he became the great theologian he was. The difficulty of properly dividing law and gospel is still greater in the pastor's private ministrations to individuals. In the pulpit he may say sundry things, hoping that they will strike home. But when people seek his pastoral counsel, he is confronted with a far greater difficulty. He will soon observe which of his callers is a Christian, which not. This is not saying that the pastor may not be deceived by the pious mien and manners of a hypocrite. However, if he can rightly divide law and gospel, his callers may have deceived him, but it is their own fault if they applied the wrong teaching to themselves. A fearful responsibility is assumed by the pastor only in case he himself is to blame if his people misunderstand him. If people act like Christians only to deceive me, they deceive themselves rather than me. A pastor must treat any person as a Christian when he appears to be one, and vice versa. However, not all unchristians are alike. One is a crass and scurrilous irreligionist and a scorner of the Bible. 
another is orthodox and possesses the dead faith of the intellect only the minister unless he is himself a slave of sin and incapable of forming a judgment of a person before him recognizes in the latter a person spiritually blind and still in the bonds of spiritual death now if an unchristian has become truly alarmed and filled with an unnamed dread though he is still unbroken the pastor must say to himself this person must first be crushed some are addicted to a vice others are self-righteous to discover to which class these various unconverted persons belong and to apply the proper medicine to them that is the very difficulty of which i am speaking my object is to convince you that a preacher can be truly fitted out for his calling only by the holy spirit finally the greatest difficulty is encountered in dealing with true christians according to their particular spiritual condition one has a weak another a strong faith one is cheerful another sorrowful one is sluggish another burning with zeal one has only little spiritual knowledge another is deeply grounded in the truth a word in conclusion in order that a pastor may correctly judge and treat people it is of the utmost importance for him to understand temperaments when observing a fault of temperament my intellectual vision must not become blind to a person's good traits for instance a person of sanguine disposition is always of good cheer never troubled with gloomy thoughts and yet he may not be a christian these traits are inborn in him now if you discover the sanguine temperament in a certain person and he becomes sad when you preach the law to him you may take it for granted that the word has taken effect in his soul when you meet a person of melancholy disposition and observe that he is habitually sad and of an austere mien you must not forthwith conclude that he is sorrowing over his sins but when he suddenly becomes lively while you proclaim the gospel to him and you observe something in his demeanour contrary to his natural temperament you may safely conclude that the gospel has taken effect in him or you may meet with a phlegmatic person who loves his ease and hates to be disturbed in his reflections do not think when you have calmed such a person that you have done so by preaching the gospel or lastly you may have to deal with a person of choleric disposition when he becomes despondent under your ministration you may be assured that it was through the effect which god's word had upon him when listening to the sermons of inexperienced preachers you may not be able to say that they have perverted either the law or the gospel but you will frequently have to say that law and gospel have been merged the one into the other that the proper division of law and gospel is the highest art of theologians luther testifies in his sermon on the distinction between the law and the gospel st louis edition nine eight hundred and six and following to express in words that the law is a different kind of teaching than the gospel that is something everybody can do but to reduce this distinction to practice and make it operative that is a huge task st jerome among others has written a great deal concerning this matter but he talks like a blind man about colors luther treated learned men with great respect he called erasmus a valuable man because he had caused the study of the languages to flourish but he did not call him a doctor of holy writ why not because this one art erasmus did not understand a person may be highly gifted and may have been trained fifty years for the sacred office of the ministry and still he will not properly distinguish between the law and the gospel if he has not received the holy spirit here is where the theologian meets his scylla and charybdis in either direction he can lead souls to perdition and become guilty of a grievous offence to poor christians in his comment on galatians two fourteen luther says st louis edition nine one hundred and fifty nine let any one who knows well how to distinguish the law from the gospel thank our lord god for he can easily pass for a theologian in my tribulations i did not alas understand this as well as i should have an ordinary preacher may be an excellent theologian and another though he has studied all the languages and god knows what other things besides may not even be worthy of the name of theologian not man but god makes theologians 
If you think that this statement goes too far, you are still blind. If you have had any experience, you would admit that this is a very difficult art. End of Lecture 7《Lecture 8 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel》by C. F. W. Walter, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eighth Evening Lecture, November 14, 1884 If the Holy Scriptures were really so obscure a book that the meaning of all those passages which form the basis of articles of the Christian creed could not be definitely ascertained, and if, as a result of this, we should have to acknowledge that without some other authority it would be impossible to decide which of two or several interpretations of Scripture passages is the only correct one, if these conditions, I say, were true, the Scriptures could not be the Word of God. How could a book that leaves us groping in darkness and uncertainty regarding its essential contents serve as a revelation? The old Jewish Bible scholars of the Middle Ages in particular declared the meaning of the Scriptures was indeed plain, but that there was a secret meaning of Scripture that is of the highest importance, and this secret meaning could not be explored without the aid of the Kabbalah. For instance, they pointed out that in the first as well as in the last verse of the Hebrew text, the letter Aleph occurs six times. Now an ordinary person, they say, cannot know why that is so. But the Kabbalah gives the explanation, namely, that the world is to last six thousand years. This claim is, of course, quite absurd. However, even with the Christian Church, in the papacy, the teaching is current that the scriptures are so obscure that you can scarcely understand a single passage in them. At any rate, very many important teachings of the Christian religion, it is asserted, cannot be substantiated from scripture. To this end, the traditions of the Church are said to be absolutely necessary. This claim of the Papists is evidence of their blindness. To them applies what Paul says, Second Corinthians 4.3, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Luther is right when he says in his exposition of Psalm 37, St. Louis edition 5.335, There is not a plainer book on earth than the Holy Scriptures. It is, in comparison with all other books, what the sun is compared with all other luminaries. The papists are giving us their twaddle about the scriptures for the sole purpose of leading us away from the scriptures, and raising up themselves as masters over us, in order to force us to believe their preaching of dreams. It is an abomination, a disgraceful defamation of holy writ, and the entire Christian church, to say that the holy scriptures are obscure that they are not clear enough to be understood by everybody, and to enable everybody to teach and prove what he believes. In his appeal to the counselors of all cities of Germany, on behalf of the establishment and maintenance of Christian schools, Luther says, St. Louis edition 10, 473, The sophists have claimed that the scriptures are obscure, meaning that it is the very nature of the word of God to be obscure and to speak in strange fashion but they do not see that the whole trouble is caused by the languages. If we understood the languages, there would not be anything that has ever been spoken easier to understand than the word of God. Of course, a Turk will talk obscure things to me because I do not know Turkish, but a Turkish child, seven years old, understands him readily. Luther is entirely right. The Holy Scriptures are not only as perspicuous as the plainest writing of men, but they are much clearer because they have been set down by the Holy Spirit, the creator of the languages. It is therefore absolutely impossible to prove an error or even a contradiction in Scripture if you stick to its words. It is truth, then, that we express in our beautiful communion hymn, Lord Jesus, Thou art truly good, when we sing, Firm as a rock thy word still stands, unshaken by the enemy's hands, though they be e'er so cunning. However, while the historico-grammatical meaning of Scripture can readily be opened up by any one who understands its language, it is impossible without the Holy Spirit for any one to understand the Holy Scriptures unto his salvation, no matter how great a linguist, 
how famous a philologist, how keen a logician he may be. The Apostle Paul declares, 1 Corinthians 2.14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Again, the same Apostle says, 1 Corinthians 1.23, We preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now the primary requisite for a salutary knowledge of the Holy Scriptures is the correct understanding of the distinction between the law and the gospel. The Bible is full of light to every one who has this knowledge. Wherever this knowledge is lacking, all Scripture remains a book sealed with seven seals. We now proceed to Thesis 4. The true knowledge of the distinction between the law and the gospel is not only a glorious light, affording the correct understanding of the entire Holy Scriptures, but without this knowledge, Scripture is and remains a sealed book. Turning the leaves of the Holy Scriptures while still ignorant of the distinction between the law and the gospel, a person receives the impression that a great number of contradictions are contained in the Scriptures. In fact, the entire Scripture seems to be made up of contradictions, worse than the Quran of the Turks. Now the Scriptures pronounce one blessed, now they condemn him. When the rich youth asked the Lord, What good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The Lord replied, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. When the jailer at Philippi addressed the identical question to Paul and Silas, he received this answer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. On the one hand, we read in Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. On the other hand, we note that John, in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 7, says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Over and against this, the Apostle Paul declares, All have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. On the one hand, we note that Scripture declares God has no pleasure in sinners. On the other hand, we find that it states, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In one place Paul cries, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And Psalm 5, 4, we read, Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. In another place we hear Peter saying, Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. On the one hand, we are told that all the world is under the wrath of God. On the other hand, we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Another remarkable passage is 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, through 11, where the apostles first make this statement, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then adds, And such were some of you. But you are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Must not a person who knows nothing of the distinction between the law and the gospel be swallowed up in utter darkness when reading all this? Must he not indignantly cry out, What, that is to be God's word, a book full of such contradictions? For the situation is not this, that the Old Testament reveals a wrathful, the New Testament a gracious God, or that the Old Testament teaches salvation by a person's own works, the New Testament by faith. No, we find both teachings in the Old as well as in the New Testament. But the moment we learn to know the distinction between the law and the gospel, it is as if the sun were rising upon the scriptures, and we behold all the contents of the scriptures in the most beautiful harmony. We see that the law was not revealed to us to put that notion into our heads that we can become righteous by it, but to teach us that we are utterly unable to fulfill the law. When we have learned this, we shall know what a sweet message, what a glorious doctrine the gospel is, and shall receive it with exuberant joy. 
The history of the church, too, illustrates the importance of understanding this distinction. Corruption entered the church when law and gospel began to be confounded. A perusal of the writings of the church fathers soon reveals the cause of the church's misery in those early days. People did not know how to distinguish properly between law and gospel. Up to the sixth century we still find glorious testimonies exhibiting this distinction, but from that time on we notice that this light is growing dim, and that the distinction is gradually forgotten. An instance illustrating this fact is the monastic life, which is seen to rise to ever greater distinction. The reply of the Lord to the rich young man was understood as showing what is necessary for a person's salvation. The preachers in those days proclaimed the law to people to whom they should have proclaimed the gospel. Following the course of history to the time when the papacy had become dominant, we find that the knowledge of this distinction became utterly extinct. A truly abysmal darkness settled upon the church, and sheer paganism and idolatry gained their way into it. Remember the agonies of our dear Luther. Consider the darkness which reigned in his day. We must say that, compared with others, he had acquired a great deal of knowledge at the beginning of his career. But he did not know how to distinguish the law from the gospel. Oh, the toil and torments he had to undergo! His self-castigation and fasting brought him to the point of death. The most crushing, the most appalling statement in his estimation at that time was this that the righteousness which is valid in the sight of God is revealed in the gospel. Alas, he mused, what a woeful state of affairs! First we are approached by the law which demands of us that we fulfill it, and now, in addition, we are to be made righteous by obeying the gospel? Luther confesses that there were times in his life when he was harassed with blasphemous thoughts. Suddenly a new light shone upon him showing him of what kind of righteousness the gospel is speaking. He relates that from that moment he began to run through the whole scriptures in an endeavor to obtain a clear understanding as to which portions of the scriptures are law and which gospel. He says that he pried into every book in the Bible, and now all its parts became clear to him. The birth of the Reformer dates from the moment when Luther understood this distinction. The tremendous success of his public activity, moreover, is due to the same cause. By his new knowledge, Luther liberated the poor people from the misery into which they had been driven by the law-preaching of their priests. You are to become pastors, my friends. Do you not sense the immense importance of this matter for your future vocation? Someone who is in anguish and distress will come to you. In every instance the cause of such anguish of soul will be that the law has taken effect upon your parishioner, and it does not occur to him that he can be saved by the gospel. He does not think of that while he wails, Alas, I am a poor sinner, I am worthy of damnation, and so forth. To such a person you must say, You are indeed a lost and condemned creature, but the passage of Scripture which has told you that is law. There is, however, another teaching in Scripture. The law has done its work in you. By the law is to come the knowledge of sin. You must now quit Sinai and go to Golgotha. See yonder your Saviour, bleeding and dying for you. Not until you enter the ministry will you realize the great importance of the distinction between law and gospel, and the fact that only the knowledge of this distinction and nothing else will make you capable to discharge the office that is to save the world. The matter of paramount importance, of course, will always be this, that you have experienced this distinction upon yourself. I am not referring to those among you who have never been in anguish over your sins, who consider themselves orthodox because they have been reared in Christian homes. I am referring to those who are concerned about their salvation. There will be moments when such of you will imagine that you are God's children. Again there will be times when you think that your sins have not been forgiven you. If on such occasions you desire genuine peace, it can come to you only through the knowledge of the distinction between law and gospel. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Triglot Concordia, page 173, we read, For rightly to understand the benefit of Christ and the great treasure of the gospel, which Paul extols so greatly, we must separate as far as the heavens are from the earth the promise of God 
and the grace that is offered on the one hand, from the law on the other. The word of God may preach the gospel to us with ever so great comfort. We shall nevertheless not obtain the peace it offers, unless we know that Holy Writ contains also the law from which we have escaped, and that being lost and doomed sinners, we have embraced the gospel. We may hit upon a comforting passage and say to ourselves, I, I have the forgiveness of sins. And then we may strike another passage, which makes us believe that we are lost. All this, because we do not know the distinction between law and gospel. The formula of concord in the epitome, Triglot Concordia, page 801, says, We believe, teach, and confess, that the distinction between the law and the gospel is to be maintained in the church with great diligence, as an especially brilliant light, by which, according to the admonition of St. Paul, the word of God is rightly divided. This is repeated in the declaration of Article 5, Triglot Concordia, 951, as follows. As the distinction between the law and the gospel is a specially brilliant light, which serves to the end that God's word may be rightly divided, and the scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles may be properly explained and understood, we must guard it with especial care, in order that these two doctrines may not be mingled with one another, or a law be made out of the gospel, whereby the merit of Christ is obscured, and troubled consciences are robbed of their comfort, which they otherwise have in the Holy Gospel, when it is preached genuinely, and in its purity, and by which they can support themselves in their most grievous trials against the terrors of the law. If these two doctrines are not kept separate, the merit of Christ is obscured. For when I am afraid of the threatening of the law, I have forgotten Christ, who says to me, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, do but come, and you shall find rest unto your souls. These facts will not be rightly proclaimed by the preacher unless he has received an indelible impression of the distinction between the law and the gospel. Only he, moreover, can lie down and die in peace. The devil may whisper all manner of insinuations to him, but he will say to him, Your charges against me are quite correct, but I have another doctrine which tells me something altogether different. I am glad that the law has put me in such a woeful plight, for now I can relish the gospel all the more. At the conclusion of Article 5, we read in the Formula of Concord, Triglot Concordia 961. Now, in order that both doctrines, that of the law and that of the gospel, be not mingled and confounded with one another, and what belongs to the one may not be ascribed to the other, whereby the merits and benefits of Christ are easily obscured, and the gospel is again turned into a doctrine of the law, as has occurred in the papacy. And thus Christians are deprived of the true comfort which they have in the gospel against the hearers of the law, and the door is again opened in the church of God to the papacy. Therefore the true and proper distinction between the law and the gospel must with all diligence be inculcated and preserved. And whatever gives occasion for confusion, iter legum et evangelium, between the law and the gospel. That is, whereby the two doctrines, law and gospel, may be confounded and mingled into one doctrine, should be diligently prevented. We, too, are in the great danger here sketched. Read the writings of those who claim to be the best preachers. They terrify, to be sure, but their incisiveness is due to the fact that they confound the law and the gospel. As a result, people who have read these writings are on their dying bed often harassed with doubts. Many a one among them dies with the thoughts in his heart, I'll see whether God will receive me. Anyone dying in such uncertainty does not depart in saving faith. Now whose fault is it, at least in many instances? The preacher's. However, the preacher must also be careful not to say that the law has been abolished, for that is not true. The law remains in force. It is not abrogated. But we have another message besides that of the law. God does not say, By the law is righteousness, but by the law is the knowledge of sin. Yea, we read in the epistle to the Romans, To him that believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Hence we are on the right way to salvation the moment we are convinced 
that we are ungodly. Commenting on Galatians 3, verse 19, Luther says, St. Louis edition 9, 415, If the gospel is not fundamentally and plainly set apart from the law, it is impossible to keep the Christian's doctrine unadulterated. Again, when this distinction has been correctly and firmly established, we can have a fine and correct knowledge of the manner how and by what means we are to become righteous in the sight of God. Where this illuminating knowledge prevails, it is easy to distinguish faith from works, Christ from Moses, the gospel from the law of Moses and all other secular laws, statutes, and ordinances. In conclusion, Chemnitz writes in his Chapters on Theology, Loki Theologici, in the chapter on Justification, Folio 206, Paul states distinctly that the righteousness which is valid in the sight of God is revealed in the gospel apart from the law. Hence, the principal matter in this inquiry regarding justification is that the true and proper distinction between the law and the gospel be fixed and carefully maintained. Is there any other light besides the one furnished by the true distinction between the law and the gospel, that has so forcibly broken up the dense darkness of the Pope's dominion? The darkness of the papacy has not been dispelled by any other light than the appearance of the teaching that there is a distinction to be made between the law and the gospel. Great councils of the church wanted to make an attempt at reforming the church. Mighty emperors had undertaken this task. What did they accomplish? Nothing. Matters went from bad to worse. What is the reason why a poor, miserable monk succeeded in this work? No doubt it was because he put the candlestick of this doctrine back in the holy place. He might have preached in ever so evangelical a fashion. Christians would not have been comforted. For the moment they would have come across the law, they would have exclaimed, Ah, I have been in error after all. I have to keep the commandments of God if I want to enter life. Here is the point where most of the reformers before the Reformation were at fault. Huss preached the gospel exceedingly well, but he did not show his hearers the proper distinction between the law and the gospel. For that reason, his work, his attempt at Reformation, did not endure. May God, then, who has kindled this light for us, preserve it unto us. I am thinking of you in particular when I say this. We who are old will soon be in our graves. The light began to shine once more in our time. See to it that it is not put out again. You are following a wrong track if you imagine that you have comprehended this whole teaching in these few hours. If this light is not carefully guarded, it will soon go out. For instance, we find that this light was still burning in the days when the earliest writings of the Church Fathers were composed. But in the writings of the ecclesiastical teachers who followed them, no definite statement is found regarding the distinction between the law and the gospel. That is the reason why the papacy, in a later age, made such rapid headway. The same danger is now threatening us. The principal passage of Scripture establishing our thesis is Romans 10, 2-4. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. To what ignorance of the Jews does the Apostle refer in this passage when he says, Not according to knowledge? This, they do not recognize the righteousness that is valid in the sight of God. That is their lack of understanding. They imagined they must be zealots on behalf of the law. For as it was most assuredly God's law, how might anyone dare depart from it? If they had paid attention to Paul's preaching, they would soon have observed that Paul allowed the law to remain in force. Seeing that, they would not have become enemies of the gospel, and the dreadful darkness which settled upon them like the pall of night would have been dispelled. End of Lecture 8。Lecture 9 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. D. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Ninth Evening Lecture, November 21st, 1884 The latest statistics of ethnologists figure the present population of the earth at 1,400 millions of human beings. Not quite 400 million of these, that is, not quite one-third of the race, profess faith in Christ as the only Savior. Verily, this is an appalling state of affairs, pitiful enough to draw tears from us. However, still more appalling and lamentable is the fact that of these 400 million nominal Christians, nearly one-half are still followers of the Pope, the Antichrist. The mystery surrounding these shocking and depressing conditions is such that even sincere Christians dread looking with open eyes into this abyss of indescribable misery and wretchedness. True, quite a few, in fact the majority of those who claim to be Lutherans, refuse to believe that the Pope is the Antichrist and the Papacy the anti-Christian power. With the entire Church of the Reformation, and in accord with the confessions of this Church, the Orthodox American Lutheran Church of our time still in full earnest maintains the position that the Pope is the Antichrist. But that is, at best, regarded as an odd fancy of narrow-minded men who refuse to keep step with the times. If you ask why this is so, I answer that it is chiefly because people no longer know what constitutes the Antichrist and the Antichristian dominion. People say, we admit that, especially in the Middle Ages, there were many popes who were veritable abominations, and even in the view of Romish writers were swallowed up by hell. It is admitted that many shocking abominations are still practiced by the papacy, but this is offset by the reminder that there is not a church free from errors and even from Judases. It is furthermore admitted that the papacy is propagating the most horrible heresies, but over against this the fact is stressed that even the papacy holds strictly to the three ecumenical creeds. For at the opening session and solemn organization of the Council of Trent in 1545, those three creeds were recited. Our attention is also called to the fact that the popes believe the Bible of the Old and New Testaments to be the revealed word of God, God to be triune, and Christ to be God and man in one person, and the Savior of the world. We are told, the papists confessed, just as we do, their faith in a future resurrection of the dead, a last judgment, before which all men will be cited, and a heaven and a hell. Far then from being the dominion of Antichrist, these people say, the papacy is rather a powerful dam shutting out the fearful deluge of unbelief that has come down on the Christian church. People see the rule of Antichrist in pantheism, materialism, atheism, socialism, nihilism, anarchism, and other horrible isms to which the modern age has fallen heir. But why is it that from the aforementioned premises men will draw the conclusion that the papacy is not the rule of Antichrist and the Pope not the veritable Antichrist? The chief reason is that people fail to consider what it means when the Pope claims to be the vice-regent of Christ on earth and the visible head of the entire Christian Church. In order to be this, he must, of course, profess many Christian doctrines. He has to put on a mask, otherwise Antichrist could not possibly exist in the midst of the Christian Church. Moreover, he has to declare war against the enemies of all religions, and against the enemies of the Christian religion, to support his claim of being the vice-regent of Christ. He knows that when Christ falls, Antichrist too must fall. For when he falls, whose vice-regent the Pope claims to be, there is an end of the vice-regency. When the Pope apparently fights for Christ and the Christian Church, he fights for himself and his dominion. But the point of supreme importance is this. Passing by those societies which deny the triune God, and which are outside of the pale of the Christian Church, I find that the Pope is the only one in the entire Christian Church who is an outspoken enemy of the free grace of God in Christ, an enemy of the gospel, under the guise of the Christian religion, and aping its institutions. We are led to a consideration of this fact by Thesis 5. The first manner of confounding law and gospel is the one most easily recognized, and the grossest. It is adopted, for instance, by Papists, Socinians, and Rationalists, and consists in this, that Christ is represented as a new Moses, or lawgiver, and the gospel turned into a doctrine of meritorious works. 
while at the same time those who teach that the gospel is the message of the free grace of God in Christ are condemned and anathematized, as is done by the papists. I offer two testimonies to show that the papists are doing what this thesis charges. Two months before Luther's death, as you know, the Council of Trent was opened. It was to heal the mortal wounds that had been dealt the papacy by the reformation of Luther and rebuild the papacy. In its fourth session, in a preamble to a decree, the Council says, The most holy ecumenical and universal Council of Trent, lawfully convened in the Holy Spirit, always bearing in mind to remove errors and to preserve in the church the purity of the gospel, namely, that which was first promised by the holy prophets in their writings, then preached with his own mouth by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, then commanded to be preached to all creatures by his apostles, both as a source of all saving truth, and a moral norm, and so forth. This preamble does not sound so awful, we hear this vermin of anti-Christian iniquity speaking of the gospel as containing the doctrines of salvation. However, they add immediately that the gospel also prescribes morals. That is the interpretation they put on the intention of Christ when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16.15 They evidently do not intend to accept the gospel in the true sense of the word. In the meaning in which they understand it, it is at best a law such as Moses proclaimed. Nor do they urge upon the people only the commandments of God, but much more the commandments of the church. They do not trouble a person who has transgressed the commandments of God. But if anyone transgresses the commandments of their church, for instance, if he has eaten meat on Friday, he is tortured until he acknowledges that he has committed a mortal sin. In Canon 21, adopted at its sixth session. This synagogue of Satan decrees, If any one says that Jesus Christ has been given by God to men, that he should be their Redeemer, in whom they are to trust, and not also their lawgiver, whom they are to obey, let him be anathema. This decree overthrows the Christian religion completely. If Christ came into the world to publish new laws to us, we should feel like saying that he might as well have stayed in heaven. Moses had already given us so perfect a law that we could not fulfill it. Now, if Christ had given us additional laws, that would have driven us to despair. The very term gospel contradicts this view of the papists. We know that Christ himself has called his word gospel, for he says in Mark 16:15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In order that the meaning which he connected with the word gospel might be understood, he states the contents of the gospel in these concrete terms. He that believeth and is baptized, and so forth. If the teaching of Christ were a law, it would not be an oiangelion, a glad tiding, but a sad tiding. Reverting to the Old Testament, we see even there what the character of the teaching of Christ is. We read Genesis 3.15, it, the woman's seed, shall bruise thy head. What is the import of these words? It is this. The Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior, is not come for the purpose of telling us what we are to do, what works we are to perform in order to escape from the terrible dominion of darkness, sin, and death. These feats the Messiah is not going to leave for us to accomplish. But he will do all that himself. He shall bruise the serpent's head. That means nothing else than this, that he shall destroy the kingdom of the devil. All that man has to do is to know that he has been redeemed, that he has been set free from his prison, that he has no more to do than to believe and accept this message, and rejoice over it with all his heart. If the text were to read, He shall save you, that would not be so comforting. Or, if it read, You must believe in him, we should be at a loss to know what is meant by this faith. This proto-evangelium, this first gospel in Genesis, was the fountain from which the believers in the Old Testament drew their comfort. It was important for them to know, there is one coming who will not only tell us what we must do to get to heaven. No, the Messiah will do all himself to bring us there. Now that the rule of the devil has been destroyed, anything that I must do cannot come into consideration. 
if the devil's dominion is demolished i am free there is nothing for me to do but to appropriate this to myself that is what scripture means when it says believe that means claim as your own what christ has acquired many additional prophecies might be cited to prove the correctness of this interpretation let me call your attention only to one which shows clearly what the doctrine of the gospel really is jeremiah thirty one thirty one through thirty four we read behold the days come saith the lord that i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah not according to the covenant that i made with their fathers in the day that i took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of egypt which my covenant they break although i was an husband unto them saith the lord but this shall be the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days saith the lord i will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their god and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother saying know the lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the lord for i will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. A new covenant, then, God is going to make. Note this well. This covenant is not to be a legal covenant like the one which he established with Israel on Mount Sinai. The Messiah will not say, You must be people of such and such character. Your manner of living must be after this or that fashion. You must do such and such works. No such doctrine will be introduced by the Messiah. He writes his law directly into the heart, so that person living under him is a law unto himself. He is not coerced by a force from without, but is urged from within. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. These words state the reason for the preceding statement. They are a summary of the gospel of Christ, forgiveness of sin by the free grace of God, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Any one, therefore, imagining that Christ is a new lawgiver and has brought us new laws, cancels the entire Christian religion, for he removes that by which the Christian religion differs from all other religions in the world. All other religions say to man, You must become just so and so, and do such and such works if you wish to go to heaven. Over against this, the Christian religion says, You are a lost and condemned sinner. You cannot be your own Saviour. But do not despair on that account. There is one who has acquired salvation for you. Christ has opened the portals to heaven to you, and says to you, Come, for all things are ready. Come to the marriage of the Lamb. That is the reason, too, why Christ says, I heal the sick, not them that are whole. I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Everywhere in his conversation among men we see the Lord Jesus surrounded by sinners, and behind him stand lurking the Pharisees. Sinners, hungering and thirsting, stand around about him. He has won their hearts. Though the divine majesty shines forth from him, they are not afraid to approach him. They have confidence in him. The Pharisees utter the bitter reproach, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. The Lord overhears the remark, and even if he had not heard it, he nevertheless would have known it. What does he do? He makes no apologies. He does not say, I do not wish to have sinners, but only righteous people about me. No, he confirms the truth of their statement, which by them was meant as a reproach, by continuing the censured action, as if he wished to say, Yes, I want sinners about me, and then proceeds to prove this by telling the parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd picks up the lost sheep, no matter how torn and bruised it is. He places it on his shoulder and rejoicing carries it to the sheepfold. The Lord explains his conduct also by the parable of the lost piece of silver. The woman seeks her lost coin throughout the house, searching for it even in the dirt. When she has found it, she calls her friends, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Lastly, the Lord adds the incomparably beautiful parable of the prodigal son. Practically, the Lord says by telling these parables, There you have my doctrine. I, 
and come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you take a survey of the entire life of Jesus, you behold him going about not like a proud philosopher, not like a moralist, surrounded by champions of virtuous endeavor, whom he teaches how to attain the highest degree of philosophic perfection. No, he goes about seeking lost sinners, and does not hesitate to tell the proud heresies that harlots and publicans will enter the kingdom of heaven rather than they. Thus he shows us quite plainly what his gospel really is. All the apostles corroborate his teaching. John says in his gospel, chapter 117, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He places the law over against grace and truth. I need not explain what grace is. When John speaks of the truth that is come, he views Jesus as saying, I teach the essence of the things which were foreshadowed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament presented emblems. I bring realities. The entire temple service of the Levites was figurative. Christ actually brought what was typified in the Old Testament. In chapter 317, the same apostle says, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Quite plainly, the thought that Christ came into the world to proclaim a new law is barred here. Had that been his object, he would have come to judge the world, for the law passes judgment on sinners. However, God did not send his Son to pass judgment on the world, but to save the world through him. By the term world, the Lord refers to mankind in its apostate and lost condition, to the lost, accursed, and condemned sinners that make up the world. To these the Saviour brings this blessed doctrine. Though you have broken every commandment of God, do not despair. I am bringing you forgiveness and salvation, here and hereafter. In language so plain that it requires no comment, the Apostle states in Romans Chapter 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.15 we read, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In view of these plain passages, is it not a horrible teaching of the papists that what is called gospel in the scriptures according to them is nothing else than a new law? In sundry other places of their confessions, they explain their meaning more fully thus. Many laws were uttered by Christ, of which Moses knew nothing. For instance, the law to love our enemies the law not to seek private revenge, the law not to demand back what has been taken from us, and so forth. All these matters the papists declare to be new laws. This is wrong, for even Moses had said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus 19:18. Now Christ did not abrogate this law of Moses, but neither did he publish any new laws. He only opened up the spiritual meaning of the law. Accordingly, he says in Matthew 5.17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That means that he did not come to issue new laws, but to fulfill the law for us, so that we may share his fulfillment. In its sixth session, the Council of Trent passed this decree. If any one says that men are made righteous solely through the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, or solely through the forgiveness of sin, to the exclusion of the grace and love which by the Holy Spirit is poured out in their hearts and is inherent in them, or that the grace by which we are made righteous is nothing else than the favor of God, let him be accursed. If any one says that the faith which makes men righteous is nothing else than trust in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is only this trust that makes us righteous, let him be accursed. 
If any one says that a justified person does not by reason of the good works which are done by him through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and the actual obtainment of eternal life, provided he dies in grace, let him be accursed. Unless you are utterly blind and know nothing of the Christian religion, I believe that a plainer proof that the Pope is the Antichrist cannot be offered you. Everywhere the Papists set up the cross and make the sign of the cross, but that is sheer hypocrisy. They have the cross, but without its meaning in connection with Christ. Again and again we read that they call upon Mary to keep the ship of Peter from perishing. They do not readily say, Christ is our fortress, our rock, and so forth. Verily, the worst sects in the Christian church are less harmful than the Pope. For all sects, without exception, admit that the only way in which a person may be saved is by faith in the grace of God and Jesus Christ. All sects, by their teaching, obscure the gospel. But they do not, as the Pope does, anathematize and curse it. Inasmuch as all sects allow this thesis, that salvation is by the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus, to stand. They are incomparably superior to the papacy. They are corrupted churches, but the papacy is a false church. Just as counterfeit money is no money, so the papal church, being a false church, is no church. Compared with the corrupted sectarian churches, the papacy is a non-church, a denial of the church of Christ. I am not speaking of the Roman Catholic, but of the papistic church. The church which submits to the Pope, accepts his decrees, and repeats his anathemas. This church is the one which history knows as the Ecclesia Maligna, the malign, pernicious church, and the synagogue of Satan. However, the objection is raised, Does not Christ say, Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30 Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here we have it that Christ, too, lays a burden on his followers. Yea, the Romanists claim this yoke and burden of Christ, which they interpret to mean self-abnegation and cross-bearing, is much more grievous than the law of Moses. Moses, they say, prohibited only gross outward acts. They think that the remark of Christ ye have heard it was said to them of old time, refers to Moses. What Christ really means to say is this, your elders have taught you by their traditions that you were keeping the law when you refrained from the gross acts prohibited by the law. And then he proceeds to expound the true meaning of the law. Regarding this matter, Luther writes in his Glosses on the Gospel of Matthew, St. Louis edition 7, 143, those are greatly in error who interpret the yoke of Christ in this passage, Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30, to mean the so-called evangelical law, that is, commands issued by Christ. In the opinion of Romanists, the gospel and the evangelical law are synonymous. They also term it the new law, nova lex. Luther proceeds, In expounding this text, the sophists, have been at great pains to show that the yoke of Christ is easier than the yoke of Moses, spite of their belief that Moses has prohibited merely the external act, while Christ lays his injunction even on every useless word that man speaks in their whole heart. By their contention that the yoke of Moses had been easier for the reason stated, the sophists to whom Luther refers meant to prove that in the Old Testament people were saved by the law, because that was not hard to keep. The law in the gospel, they say, is easy only in so far as it has abolished circumcision and the ceremonial ordinances. But the yoke and the burden of which Christ speaks is nothing else than the cross which his followers bear from love of him. Luther continues, Finally, these blind people arrived at the conclusion that the law and the gospel were related to one another like the excedentia to the excessa that which exceeds something to that which is exceeded. Namely, this way, 
the law is easier than the gospel because it lays its injunctions not on the heart but on the hand or the gross external act on the other hand the gospel is easier than the law in this respect that it has done away with circumcision in the mosaic ceremonies that is indeed a blindness befitting people who despise the gospel and refuse to read it this is what they should have taught the power of christ is marvellous in his saints for by faith in the hearts of these men christ changes death into laughter punishment into joy and hell into heaven for those who believe in him laugh to scorn all those ills which worldly and carnal minds dread and flee and abominate that is what christ calls a pleasant yoke and a light burden namely to bear the cross joyfully even as paul did who says we glory in tribulations also romans five three the moment a person through genuine repentance attains to a living faith he has become a blessed man he has arrived at the very gate of heaven when death comes the doors are opened and he enters but since it is dangerous for a christian to pass his days in ease in this present life the saviour has taken the precaution of putting the cross upon him whenever a christian professes his faith by word and deed people become hostile to him even where this enemy is not manifested publicly it is still noticeable and vexes him not a little how many have had to lay down their lives for christ but how light is the burden of christ compared with that of the law feeling the burden of the law a person will groan oh i am most miserable of men it makes him despondent and fills him with despair some spend their lives subject neither to the law nor to the gospel well they live like animals but alas for them when their eyes are opened after death a christian is able to rejoice in the hope that god will deliver him from the misery and suffering of this life he can even hear sing alleluias the examples of the martyrs shows this they did not go weeping and wailing to their execution but met their martyrs fate with joy and exultation in them the words of christ were fulfilled my yoke is easy and my burden is light i pray god that my addressing these talks to you may not be labor misspent do apply what i say to yourselves to advance you and your Christianity is the paramount object of these evening lectures. End of Lecture 9。Lecture 10 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walter, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tenth Evening Lecture, November 28, 1884. The most important resolution a person can make by the almighty grace of God is to become a true Christian. Yet this resolution cannot make him truly happy and save his soul if he is not in full earnest when forming this resolution. Many thousands have resolved to quit the world, body and soul, and to choose the narrow path of the children of God. They did this after they had quaffed the cup of the world's joys to the dregs many after learning by some sad experience the truth of the bible passage sin is a reproach to any people proverbs thirteen thirty four have made up their minds to quit their sins even their pet sins many thousands have been tormented with uncertainty day and night as to whether they were in a state of grace whether they were accepted by god as his dear children and whether their sins were forgiven they have been filled with anguish when they ask themselves the question, If I were to die today, would I be saved? In this state of mind, they have resolved to seek the grace of God and the forgiveness of their sins. What has been the outcome? The majority of those who had formed this resolution did not carry it out. They postponed the execution days, weeks, months, years. Forming the resolution is as far as they got. Finally, death overtook them, and they were lost forever. Why was this? They were not in earnest when forming their resolution. True, God is so patient, kind, and gracious as to forgive Christians their sins of weakness and frailties daily and richly. But he does this only to those who are really in earnest about being Christians. When this earnestness is lacking, a person is not a true Christian. 
Now a situation similar to this obtains when a person resolves to become a servant of Christ, a minister of the Church of Christ and His Word. This, too, is a momentous resolution, but a gratifying one only when backed by earnest endeavor. When a person wants to become a servant of the gospel, he must be so disposed toward his Lord Jesus Christ as to be able to say to him, My dear Lord Jesus, Thou art mine, therefore I wish to be Thine. All that I possess, my body and my soul, my strength and my gifts, and all that I do, my entire life, shall be consecrated to Thee, to Thee alone. Lay on me any burden Thou pleasest, I shall gladly bear it. Lead me anywhere, through sorrow or joy, through good fortune or misfortune, through shame or honor, through favor of men or their disfavor. Grant me a long life, or should I die an early death, I shall be satisfied with anything. Lead the way, and I shall follow. That is the sentiment which our dear Paul Gerhardt has expressed in one of his hymns. I cleave now and forever to Christ a member true. My head will leave me never, whate'er he passes through. He treads the world beneath his feet and conquers death and hell and breaks sin's thrall. I'm with him through it all. Such was the apostle's devotion from the moment when the Lord had appeared to him and had spoken to him. He relates himself that when he had received the divine call to go and preach the gospel of Christ among the heathen, he conferred not with flesh and blood, Galatians 1.16, but obeyed promptly. Blessed Paul, his activity was favored with success beyond telling, and now he is with God. He has beheld his Savior face to face for more than 1,800 years, and is praising and magnifying him world without end. Oh, my dear friends, I know you are all resolved to enter the holy ministry in which you intend to serve Christ and his church by preaching his saving word. Oh, be in full earnest about it. If not, your resolution will come to naught. If God has tried to lead you to this resolve at an early time, but you refuse to follow him and stifled the voice of the Holy Spirit in your hearts, all those blessed moments of prompting from God will bear testimony against you at his throne. On the other hand, you are blessed men if you have carried out your resolution. You will never complain about the heartache and the anguish and distress through which you had to pass. You will rather be full of joy on the day when the Lord will place his hand with the nail prints on you and put the crown of glory on your head. Now then, what is your chief task when about to enter the sacred ministry? You are to proclaim to a world of sinners both law and gospel. You are to do this clearly, perfectly, and with a fervent spirit. This reflection leads us to the consideration of Thesis 6. In the second place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is not preached in its full sternness, and the gospel not in its full sweetness, when, on the contrary, gospel elements are mingled with the law, and law elements with the gospel. Our object is to meditate upon the distinction between law and gospel, and on the ever-present danger and harm of mingling the one with the other. In our last lecture we began our review of the various occasions on which this danger confronts us. However, the commingling of both doctrines occurs also when gospel elements are mingled with the law, and vice versa. Let us investigate what Scripture says regarding this matter. To begin with, what does it say concerning the law? How does it show us that we must not mingle any evangelical ingredient into the law? The principal passage yielding us the desired information is Galatians 3, 11 and 13. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. A precious text. A person becomes righteous in the sight of God solely by faith. What conclusion must be drawn from this fact? This, that the law cannot make any person righteous because it has not a word to say about justifying and saving faith. That information is found only in the gospel. In other words, the law has nothing to say about grace. Romans 4.16, the apostle tells us, Therefore it, righteousness, is of faith that it might be by grace. 
to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of abraham who is the father of us all faith is demanded of us not in order that there might be at least some little work that we are to do as otherwise there would be no difference between those who go to hell and those to go to heaven no righteousness is of faith in order that it may be of grace both statements are identical when i say a person becomes righteous in the sight of god by faith i mean to say he becomes righteous gratuitously by grace by god's making righteousness a gift to him nothing is demanded of the person he is only told stretch out your hand and you have it just that is what faith is reaching out the hand suppose a person had never heard a word concerning faith and on being told the gospel would rejoice accept it put his confidence in it and draw comfort from it that person would have the true genuine faith although he may not have had a word concerning faith no gospel element then must be mingled with the law any one expounding the law shamefully perverts it by injecting into it grace the grace loving kindness and patience of god who forgives sins he acts like a sick nurse who fetches sugar to sweeten the bitter medicine which the patient dislikes what is the result why the medicine does not take effect and the patient remains feverish in order that it might retain its strength the medicine should not have been sweetened a preacher must proclaim the law in such a manner that there remains in it nothing pleasant to lost and condemned sinners every sweet ingredient injected into the law is poison it renders this heavenly medicine ineffective, neutralizes its operation. Matthew 5, 17-19, the Lord says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. When preaching the law, you must ever bear in mind that the law makes no concessions. That is utterly beside the character of the law. It only makes demands. The law says, you must do this. If you fail to do it, you have no recourse to the patience, loving-kindness, and long-suffering of God. You will have to go to perdition for your wrongdoing. To make this point quite plain to us, the Lord says, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. That does not mean he shall have the lowest place assigned him in heaven but he does not belong in the kingdom of heaven at all. Galatians 3.10, Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are in the book of the law to do them. If you would direct men to do good works, and for their comfort add a remark like this, you should indeed be perfect. However, God does not demand the impossible from us, do what you can in your weakness, only be sincere in your intention. I said, if you would speak thus, you would be preaching a damnable doctrine, for that is a shameful corruption of the law. God never spoke like that from Sinai. Romans 7.14, the same apostle writes, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. When a minister preaches the law, he must by all means bear in mind that the law is spiritual. It works on the spirit, not on some member of the body. It is directed to the spirit in man, to his will, heart, and affections. That is the way it operates in every instance. When the law says, Thou shalt not kill, that sounds as if it were applied only to the hand, but it applies to the heart, as we can see from the ninth and tenth commandment, which prohibit evil desires of the heart. A sermon on the law, which you deliver from your pulpit, to be a proper preaching of the law, must measure up to these requirements. There is to be no ranting about abominable vices that may be rampant in the congregation. Continual ranting will prove useless. 
people may quit the practices that have been reproved, but in two weeks they will have relapsed into their old ways. You must indeed testify with great earnestness against transgressions of God's commandments, but you must also tell the people, even if you were to quit your habitual cursing, swearing, and the like, that would not make you Christians. You might go to perdition for all that. God is concerned about the attitude of your heart. You may explain this matter with the most utmost composure, but you must state it quite plainly. Let me illustrate. You may say, listen, when God says, Thou shalt not kill, that does not mean that you are no murderers when your hand has slain no one, when you have not assaulted any one like a highway robber, nor put his life in jeopardy. Do not think that you have kept the fifth commandment if you have refrained from such outward acts. By no means. The law aims at the heart, at the spirit in man. If you say merely in passing, the law is spiritual, the people will not catch the drift of your speech. You must explain the matter to them quite thoroughly. If you do this, you will be handling a sharp knife that cuts into the life of people, and your hearers will go home dazed. From the effect of your preaching they will go down on their knees at home and make this self-confession. I am not as God would have me be. I shall have to become a different person. Romans 3.20 we read, By the law is the knowledge of sin. God does not tell you to preach the law in order thereby to make men godly. The law makes no one godly. But when it begins to produce its proper effects, the person who is feeling its power begins to fume and rage against God. He hates the preacher who has shouted the law into his heart, and he feels that he cannot slip off its coils. Where this has happened, you may hear people say, We shall never again go to that church. Why, that preacher strikes terror into my soul. I prefer to attend the services of the Reverend So-and-So. He makes you feel good. While listening to him, you discover what a good man you really are. Alas! In eternity these people will wish to take revenge on the preacher that preached them into perdition. There was nothing pleasant, nothing comforting at Sinai. On the previous day Moses had announced to the people that God was going to come to them. He did come with thunder and lightning. At early dawn a terrible tempest swept up from the horizon. Finally the mountain began to quake, and the people were thrown into a still greater fright by this trembling of the mountain. Flames of fire shot skyward. Dense clouds of smoke began to form. Suddenly a loud trumpet began to blare terribly, hurling its echoes like thunderclaps through the valleys that start from the sides of the mountain, and causing everyone to shake with dread. But the climax of this terrible phenomenon came when the people heard the voice of Jehovah reciting to them the Ten Commandments with their regular refrain of, Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Moreover, the speaker tells them, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and so forth. Exodus 20, verse 5. Everywhere in the camp of Israel people went to pieces from dread and fright. Do you think that the coming of this terrible tempest just on that day was an accident? Did not Moses have to set up a barrier around the mountain already on the preceding day, lest anybody approach the mountain? Did he not issue a warning to the people, telling them that they would drop dead if they crossed the barrier? In the wild tumult of the next day the people understood the truth of this warning, for no one could have come out alive from that fearful commotion. Only Moses was permitted to approach the mountain under the protecting hand of God. By this spectacle God has indicated to us how we are to preach the law. True, we cannot produce the thunder and lightning of that day, except in a spiritual way. If we do, it will be a salutary sermon when the people sit in their pews and the preacher begins to preach the law in its fullness and to expound its spiritual meaning. There may be many in the audience who will say to themselves, If that man is right, I am lost. Some, indeed, may say, that is not the way for an evangelical minister to preach. But it certainly is. He could not be an evangelical preacher if he did not preach the law thus. The law must precede the preaching of the gospel. Otherwise the latter will have no effect. First came Moses, then Christ. Or first John the Baptist, the forerunner, then Christ. 
At first the people will exclaim, How terrible is all this! But presently the preacher with shining eyes passes over to the gospel, and then the hearts of the people are cheered. They see the object of the preacher's preceding remarks. He wanted to make them see how awfully contaminated with sins they were, and how sorely they needed the gospel. For your catechizing you must adopt the same method. When explaining the law, do not mingle gospel elements with your catechization, except in the conclusion. Even little children have to pass through these experiences of anguish and terror in the presence of the law. The reason why so many imagine that they can pass for really good Christians is because their parents reared them to be self-righteous Pharisees. They never made them aware of the fact that they are poor, miserable sinners. A person may have fallen into the most dreadful sins, but if he has been brought up properly, he says to himself when he hears the law preached, Surely I am an awful sinner. A Pharisee who hears the same sermon may not repeat that confession, though he may have fallen into greater sins. The conversion of Pharisees is a far more difficult task than that of a person who acknowledges his sin. That was the deepest corruption of the Jews in the day of Christ, and it is that of the Papists in our time. The Jews had mingled gospel elements with the law by telling the people, if you do not actually slay somebody, you are not a murderer. If you do not commit manifest fornication, you are not guilty of adultery. Even concupiscence was declared a natural sensation. The papists say the same. When forced to admit that in the exposition of the law by Christ some things are named that cannot be classified with gross acts contrary to the law, they claim that these things are meant merely as good counsels of Christ which may be adopted by those who strive for an exceptionally exalted place in heaven. The good works resulting from following these good counsels of Christ, they call supererogatory. In his comment on the words of Christ, you have heard that it was said to them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and so forth. Luther says, St. Louis edition 7, 429 and following, Christ takes up some of the Ten Commandments for the purpose of explaining them properly. He shows that the Pharisees and scribes, when teaching the law, did not push their explanation and inculcation beyond the literal meaning of the commandments, and made them applicable only to gross external acts. For instance, in the fifth commandment, which he introduces first, they considered no more than the word kill, which they interpreted to mean actual slain, and they allowed the people to stick to the notion that nothing else is forbidden in this commandment. Moreover, in order to escape the charge of manslaughter for delivering a person to the magistrates to be condemned to death, as they delivered Christ to the pagan Pontius Pilate, they framed a pretty pretense for keeping their own hands from being sullied with blood. They argued their ceremonial purity and sanctity to the point of refusing to enter the governor's palace and forcing Pilate against his will to kill Jesus. John 18.28, following. Later, Still pretending perfect purity and innocence, they even rebuked the apostles for preaching Christ, and charged them with the intention of bringing this man's blood upon them. Acts 5.28 They mean to say, not we, but the heathen killed Christ. A similar trick is recorded regarding King Saul in 1 Samuel 18.25 and following. He was nursing a grudge against David, and would like to kill him, but since he wished to pass for a holy man, he planned to do the killing not with his own hand, but to send him against the Philistines, who he hoped would slay him. Thus his hand would be innocent of murder. What the Jews accepted of the fifth commandment was the more literal and crass meaning of the terms. The teachers told the people, If you omit such and such acts, you will pass for such as have well complied with the fifth commandment. These famous doctors who made their boast of the law had emptied the law of its contents and retained the mere shell. Our modern rationalists are doing the same. Their aim is merely to preserve the reputation of probity in their lives, hence not to rush into abominable vices of which any decent citizen would have to be ashamed. Upright conduct, too, is the sole object of their preaching. Even so-called Christian preachers are found to do this. The practice of the Pharisees has been taken up by the Papists. Papists and Pharisees resemble one another as closely as two eggs. The Papists 
when handing heretics over to the magistrates, declare ecclesia non sitit sanguinem, that is, the church does not thirst for blood. True, many of our heretical enemies have been slain, however, it was not we who did that, but the magistrates. But if the magistrates refused to do it, they were excommunicated by the church. Thus the papists want to wash their hands of the blood of the martyrs, but they will not succeed. Some day they will have to appear before God stained with the damning witness of this blood. The case of the Jews is similar. Had they known the spiritual meaning of the law, they would also have acknowledged, Yes, we are the ones who killed Christ. For it was we who cried, Crucify, crucify him. Luther proceeds. Behold here the pretty sanctity of the Pharisees, which can whitewash itself and retain the reputation of godliness provided it does not employ its own hand for killing, though the heart is filled with wrath, hatred, and envy, and conceals malignant and murderous intrigues, while the mouth spouts forth curses and blasphemies. Of the same strife is the sanctity of our papists, who have become past masters in these tricks. To guard their sanctity against censure, and not to be bound by the word of Christ, they found a fine subterfuge in the twelve evangelical councils, which they extracted from the teachings of Christ. They claimed that not all that Christ had taught was of the nature of a command and a necessity requisite for discipleship, but some of his teachings were meant as a good counsel, the following of which was left to everybody's discretion. These counsels were to be adopted by those who wished to achieve some especial merit before others. For the average person, these counsels were a superfluous teaching that he could well do without. When you ask them their reason for framing these counsels from the teaching of Christ, and how they proved their case, they would say, Well, you see it would be an excessive burdening of the Christian law. Nemus onerativum, legis Christianae. In other words, it would make Christianity too onerous an affair if all teachings of Christ were to be taken as actual commands. That is what the theologians of Paris unblushingly published in the treatise they directed against me. Forsooth, here we have some smart reasoning. Being kind to your neighbor, and not forsaking him in distress, as you would wish that people should treat you, that is to be an over-great burden. And inasmuch as they deem it too onerous, they decreed that it shall not be regarded as a command, but as a matter left to the opinion of such as would be glad to do it. Those, however, who are unwilling to do it are not to be burdened with it. That is the trick of directing Christ's speech, lording it over his word, and construing its meaning to suit our fancy. But he will not permit himself to be cheated thus, nor will he revoke the verdict which he has laid down when he said, except you have a better kind of godliness to show, heaven will be closed against you, and you will be damned. Or, as he expresses it in a later statement, if you say to your brother, thou fool, you shall be in danger of hell-fire. From this we can readily gather whether he offered counsels or issued commands. Christ says, If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. The papists construe these words thus. True, Christ did say that, but his words are merely evangelical counsels. If the question is how to get to heaven, you have to keep the law. But if your object is to climb to a high place in heaven, you must carry out these counsels. In his Chapters in Theology, Loki Theologici, Part 2, Folio 104, Chemnitz enumerates these counsels. By the way, the supererogatory works resulting from following these counsels, you know, are the treasure from which the Pope distributes his indulgences. All told, there are twelve counsels. One, voluntary poverty. The words of Christ, Sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Matthew 19.21, are understood by the papists as being merely a good counsel. In their view, this counsel is followed by those who enter a monastery. 2. Celibacy. This counsel the papists extract from Matthew 19.12, 
there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs by men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Behold, they say, our monks and nuns have adopted this good counsel. Or, they put it this way, they lead a life of chastity. 3. Unconditional obedience to the superior of an order. This good counsel, too, is followed by monks and nuns. 4. Pagan revenge. It seems almost beyond belief that anyone should arise in the church and declare the divine command not to take revenge to be merely a good counsel. That amounts to saying, you might revenge yourself. But if you decline to do so, that is a splendid good work. 5. Patiently suffering insult. 6. Giving alms. 7. Refraining from swearing. 8. Avoiding opportunities to commit sin. This is awful. It is not necessary, then, to avoid all opportunities for sinning, but if you do so, you climb to the top of perfection. 9. Having a right intention in whatever you do. This would mean that, no matter what prompts you to do a good work, it is in every case a good work in the sight of God. But if you are guided by a right motive, you are an exceptionally saintly person. 10. Doing what Christ says in Matthew 23, 3. They say and do not. And Matthew 7, 5. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. 11. Not being concerned about temporal affairs. In the view of papists, this too is merely a good counsel. 12. Admonishing a brother. Imagine, this is not to be regarded as a real duty, not being part of the law. You can see what an abominable perversion of the law has been perpetuated by the papists. Verily, they have dissipated the inmost spirit of the law. They imagine that it would be asking too much if everybody were required to obey all these teachings of Christ. Of course, all cannot enter a cloister. If they did, who would provide bread and meat? No, indeed, that would be asking too much. Oh, what an abomination! The Jesuits came forward with the proclamation, Heretofore the poor Christians have been unduly oppressed with moral precepts. Hence we, the Jesuits, have formed a society for relieving Christians of the most grievous moral precepts. And they actually put their plan in operation with this happy result, that according to their ethical standards, the most infamous scoundrel can still be a good Christian. Their moral code is the reverse of the Decalogue. A person may commit the most horrible abominations, provided he does so from a good intention. He may poison his father, if he has the good intention of becoming his heir. However, this entire ethical system of the Papists and Jesuits has been overthrown by the words of Christ. Whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell-fire. This means that anyone who fails to fulfill the law in its spiritual meaning deserves to perish. End of Lecture 10Lecture 11 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleventh Evening Lecture, December 5, 1884 Many solemn warnings against false teachers are found in Holy Scripture. One of the most solemn of them, if not the most solemn, is that found in Jeremiah 23.22, where the Lord says regarding false teachers, If they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, and from the evil of their doings. This shows that by teaching false doctrine a preacher may keep the souls entrusted to his care from being converted, and, as a result awful to contemplate, will cause them to be eternally lost. True, the people who permit themselves to be led astray by false teaching are lost by their own fault. For in innumerable passages of his word, God has with great earnestness warned men against false teachers and prophets, and has minutely described them. Any one then who despises these warnings will in the end have to blame himself amidst the wails of the hereafter. Still, 
This does not exculpate the false prophets and teachers who proclaim false teachings. On the contrary, their guilt is increased, because they did not only choose the false way for themselves, but also pointed that way to the souls entrusted to them. For it is written, Hebrews 13.17, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. Alas! What terror will seize all false teachers on the great day of account, when all the souls led astray by them shall stand before the judgment seat of God and raise accusations against them? What terror will seize Arius, who questioned the deity of Christ and wanted to snatch the crown of divine majesty from Christ's head? What terror will seize Pelagius, who denied that a person is made righteous and saved solely and alone by the grace of God? What terror greater than these will seize the popes, who have formed all Christian doctrines into a system? How will they quake with terror when the souls without number, whom they have led astray, and whose hearts they have poisoned, will stand in the presence of God? On that day every false teacher will wish that he had never been born, and will curse the day when he was introduced into the sacred office of the ministry. On that day we shall see that false teaching is not the trifling and harmless matter that people in our day think it is. My dear friends, heed well what God inspired his prophet Isaiah to write, chapter 66, 1. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Of the men who are serving in the sacred office of the ministry, and of those who are training for the same, of us all, God requires not only that we love his word, but also that we tremble at it, that is, that we sincerely dread to deviate from a single letter of the divine word, that we do not dare to add anything to it or take anything from it. We are to be ready to shed our blood rather than yield a tittle of God's word. Choose our beloved Luther for your model. He says, I have a sensation that one passage of Scripture could push me off the face of the earth. He means to say, Were I to note that the doctrine which I proclaim to the people is contradicted by one passage of Scripture, I should have no rest day or night. I would not know whither to flee. The situation would be too terrible for me. Strive to have the mind of David, the royal prophet, who says, Psalm 119, 120, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Such a mind, indeed, you cannot have, at least you cannot act upon it, while you are still without a clear and thorough knowledge of all doctrines of holy writ. For how can you keep what you do not possess? The course of study here at the seminary has been planned with the end in view of making you familiar with the entire holy scriptures, and enabling you to understand each article of faith by itself as well as in its connection with and in its relation to all the other doctrines. That is the object, likewise, of our Friday evening lectures, in which we are treating the distinction between the law and the gospel. For that is the paramount issue, that you learn rightly to divide the law and the gospel. I am not afraid, unless you become apostates, that you will set up new articles of faith, but I do fear that you will not rightly divide the law and the gospel. For this requires that you deviate neither to the right nor to the left, yielding neither to despondency nor to laxity. Thesis 7. In the third place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the gospel is preached first and then the law, sanctification first and then justification, faith first and then repentance, good works first and then grace. We are now to discuss a wrong division of the word of God which occurs when the various doctrines are not presented in their order, when something that should come last is placed first. By this practice immense damage can be wrought in the hearts and the understanding of your auditors. Four types of this perverse sequence are possible. In the first place, the order may be distorted if you preach the gospel prior to the law. You may think, can a person be so perverse? Why, every catechumen at school knows quite well that the law comes first and then the gospel. However, this can easily happen. We have instances in history which show that even entire religious associations became addicted to this error. For instance, the antinomians in Luther's time, with Agricola of Eisleben as their leader. 
and the heron hunters, Moravians, in the eighteenth century. The latter preferred not to have the law preached at all. Their chief tenet was, the gospel must be preached first, the suffering and bleeding of Christ must be presented to start with. This was fundamentally wrong. We shall readily admit that the heron hunters have made an impression on many, but it was a mere surface impression. Their hearers were never made aware of their deep, sinful depravity. They were never made to realize that they were enemies of God, worthy to be cast down to perdition rather than to be saved. By the way, when we use the term gospel in this connection, we refer, of course, to the gospel in the strict sense of the term, namely, as the opposite of the law. In Mark one fifteen, we read, Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Repent ye is plainly a law utterance. In the preaching of our Lord this comes first, being followed by the gospel summons, believe the gospel. In this practice the holy apostles were followers of Christ. Paul goes on record describing his method of preaching in Acts 20.21 20, thus, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle preached repentance first and then faith, the law first and then the gospel. In his valedictory remarks to his disciples, before ascending to heaven, our Lord said, Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The Lord does not reverse the divine order thus, remission of sins and repentance. No, that would be a way that would absolutely not lead to salvation. The second perversion of the true sequence occurs when sanctification of life is preached before justification, the preaching of forgiveness of sins. For justification by grace is nothing else than forgiveness of sins. I became righteous by appropriating the righteousness of Christ as my own. Psalm 130, verse 4, David says, There is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. The psalmist practically says to God, First thou must grant us remission of sins. After that we shall begin to reverence thee, by walking in a new sanctified life. The term fear in this text does not signify merely awe in the presence of God, but the whole work of sanctification. In Psalm 119.32 we read, I will run the way of thy commandments, when thou shalt enlarge my heart. First come the consolations of God, justification, the granting of pardon to the sinner, the remission of sins. After that, the psalmist expects to run the way of God's commandments. He means to say, Because thou, O God, receivest me into thy grace, therefore because of this gracious act of thine, I conceive a love for thy commandments. As long as my sins are still unforgiven, I cannot love thee and thy commandments. No, I hate thee. But as soon as I have been pardoned, I have obtained a new heart, and gladly quit the world, for I find with thee something better than what the world can give me. The Apostle tells the Corinthians in his first epistle to them, chapter 1, verse 30, Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Here we have the true sequence. The first requisite is to obtain wisdom, knowledge, and the way of salvation. This is the primary step. Next comes righteousness, which we obtain by faith. Not until this has been attained comes sanctification. I must first know that God has forgiven my sins, that he has cast them into the depths of the sea, before it affords me real joy to lead a sanctified life. Before that it was a grievous burden to me. At first I was angry with God. I hated him for demanding so many things of me. I should have liked to cast him from his throne. I mused in my heart, it would be better if there were no God. But when I had been pardoned and justified, I delighted not only in the gospel, but also in the law. John 15.5, the Lord says to his disciples, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. The Saviour desires that we be grafted in him like branches in a vine. That does not mean that we are to be physically incorporated in him, 
but that we believe in him with our whole heart, put our confidence and trust in him, and embrace him wholly with the arms of faith, so that we live only in him, our Jesus, who has rescued us and saves us. When this takes place, we shall bear fruit. The Saviour, then, shows that we must be justified before we can lead a sanctified life. If we become loose, severed branches, we wither and bear no fruit. In his address before the Apostles' Convention at Jerusalem, Peter, speaking of what God had done for the Gentiles, says, Acts 15.9, He put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. After being justified by faith, I am also purified, renewed, and sanctified by the same faith. To confound justification and sanctification is one of the most horrid errors. The most beautiful preaching is rendered useless by this error. Only by a strict separation of justification and sanctification a sinner is made to understand clearly and becomes certain that he has been received into grace by God, and this knowledge equips him with strength to walk in a new life. The third perversion of the true sequence, first law, then gospel, occurs when faith is preached first and repentance next, as was done by the antinomians, and is still done by the Herrenhutters of our time. Their current teaching is, Faith is the primary affair. After that you must become contrite and repent. What a foolish direction! How can faith enter a heart that has not yet been crushed? How can a person feel hungry and thirsty when he loathes the food set before him? No. Indeed, if you wish to believe in Christ, you must become sick. For Christ is a physician only for those who are sick. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Therefore you must first become lost and condemned sinner. He is the good shepherd who goes in search of the lost sheep. Therefore you must first realize that you are a lost sheep. Acts 2.38 The following incident at the conclusion of Peter's Pentecostal sermon is recorded. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is what Peter said in answer to the question of the Jews, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He preaches to them first repentance, next the remission of sins. Faith then follows repentance. Under this head belong also all the passages cited before, especially Acts 20.21. All who pervert this order have their teaching disapproved by the rule, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. For a preacher, these passages are the true guiding lights that keep him from straying from the right path. Finally, the fourth perversion occurs when good works are preached first, and then grace. The subjects mentioned in these four types are all analogous. One type is as bad as any of the others. There is a golden text in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The apostle does not say, We must do good works in order to have a gracious God but the very opposite, by grace are ye saved. But by grace ye are created unto good works. When you have received grace, God has created you anew. In this new state you have to do good works. You can no longer remain under the dominion of sin. Titus 2, 11 and 12, we read, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. Here we are told that grace is brought to us first, and then this grace begins a work of education upon us. We are placed under the divine pedagogy of grace. The moment a person accepts the grace which brought God down from heaven, that grace begins to train him. The object of this training is to teach him how to do good works, and lead an upright life. The character of the Old Testament is chiefly legalistic, although the gospel is proclaimed also in that part of the Bible. The character of the New Testament is chiefly evangelical, 
although the law portions are not lacking in it. The solemn revelation of the law took place in the Old Testament, that of the Gospel in the New Testament. The Gospel was indeed available as far back as the days of Paradise, but its solemn inauguration had not yet taken place. The full revelation of the law occurred on Sinai, amid thunder and lightning, and during an earthquake. It seems as if the end of the world had come. In the New Testament era, at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, there also appeared fire, but it did not consume anything. Tongues of fire were seen on the heads of the apostles, but their hair was not singed. A mighty wind came roaring out of the sky, but it destroyed nothing. Not a thing was moved out of its place. The purpose of the phenomenon was to indicate that, at that moment an entirely different, a comforting revelation was about to be made. Let us pass on to the apostolic epistles, especially to that addressed to the Romans, which contains the Christian doctrine in its entirety. What do we find in the first three chapters? The sharpest preaching of the law. This is followed towards the end of the third chapter, and in chapters four and five, by the doctrine of justification. Nothing but that. Beginning at chapter six, the apostle treats of nothing else than sanctification. Here we have a true pattern of the correct sequence. First, the law, threatening man with the wrath of God. This is followed by an instruction regarding the things we are to do after we have become new men. The prophets, too, when they wished to convert people, began by preaching the law to them. When the chaste means of the law had taken effect, they comforted the poor sinners. As to the apostles, no sooner had their hearers shown that they were alarmed than they seemed to know nothing else to do for them than to comfort them and pronounce absolution to them. Not until that had been done would they say to their people, Now you must show your gratitude towards God. They did not issue orders, they did not threaten when their orders were disregarded, but they pleaded and besought their hearers by the mercy of God to act like Christians. That is genuine sanctification which follows upon justification. That is genuine justification which comes after repentance. Let me illustrate by a few specimens of sermon outlines how you may even by these betray your ignorance of the distinction between law and gospel. I shall select very crass examples, as Luther was wont to do, for such examples readily help us to understand the matter under discussion. I love to do as Luther did, for if there is any good that I have achieved, I have learned it from him. Incorrect Sermon Outlines First subject, the way of salvation. It consists of 1. Faith, 2. True repentance. A perversion of this kind would constitute you genuine antinomians and parenthooders. Second subject, good works. We shall see, 1. Wherein they consist, 2. That they must be performed in faith. In such an outline you would state what good works are without having spoken of faith. A description of good works requires a statement that they are performed by believers. Otherwise, you would have to formulate your judgment on good works from the law. But that is wrong. For, viewed in the light of the law, any good work, even of a Christian, no matter how good it may appear, is damnable in the sight of God. Third subject, concerning prayer. 1. True prayer is based on the certainty of our being heard. 2. True prayer consists in faith. According to this outline, the first part of your sermon would be entirely wrong. Fourth subject. Promises and threatenings in the Word of God. 1. Promises. 2. Threatenings. When I hear these parts of the sermon announced, I say to myself, First, that preacher is going to comfort me, then he will proceed to throw rocks at me, causing me to forget everything that he said at the start. No. First you must come down on your hearers with the law, and then bind up their wounds with the divine promises. When a preacher concludes his sermons with threatenings, he has gone far towards making that sermon unproductive. Fifth subject. True Christianity. It consists, one, in Christian living, two, in true faith, three, in a blessed death. This outline is simply horrible. Sixth subject. 
What must a person do to become assured of salvation? 1. He must amend his life and become a different man. 2. He must repent of his sins. 3. He must also apprehend Christ by faith. How is it possible to lead a better life when I have not yet reached that stage where I abhor sin and abominate a wicked life? The worst part is part three, for there is nothing that gives me greater assurance of being saved than faith. Accordingly, the view of the pietists is certainly wrong, when they claim that the various stages of the order of salvation are described in the Sermon on the Mount. They were tempted to adopt this view by the fact that Christ, at the opening of this great sermon, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But that view is untenable, for the phrase poor in spirit signifies to have nothing to which the heart becomes attached. A millionaire may be poor in spirit if his heart has not become attached to his money and chattels. He does not really possess them. On the other hand, a beggar may be the very opposite when he puts his trust in the little money that he still has. The former is a blessed man, the latter is not. In the view of the pietists, the second beatitude which Christ pronounced, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, refers to mourning over sin. They called this the second stage in the order of salvation. But Christ refers to the sorrowing and cross-bearing which his followers have to do in this life for his name's sake. Continuing, Christ says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here the pietists have labored mightily to find a passable meaning. They were troubled by the fact that up to this point no mention has yet been made of justification by faith. That clogs their scheme of the order of salvation. They turn marvelous mental somersaults in an attempt to evolve their stages from the Beatitudes, but their efforts are futile. Next, Christ says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is to represent the fourth stage. Aye, but does meekness actually precede the other stages? If you ever preach on the Beatitudes, have a care not to follow pietistic preachers. Luther was forced to declare his position over against the antinomians. They contended that grace must be preached first, and then repentance. Indeed, they insisted that in the churches the law must not be preached at all. They claimed the law belongs in the courthouse and on the gallows. It is to be preached to thieves and murderers, not to honest people, least of all to Christians. In his treatise against the antinomians in the year of 1539, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 20, page 1618, The antinomians have invented a new method by which grace is to be preached first, and after that the wrath of God. The word law is not to be spoken at all within earshot of Christians. That is a pretty seesaw which pleases them wonderfully, because by this trick they can turn the scriptures up or down, and think they have become lux mundi, a world marvel. They force their notions upon the statement of St. Paul in Romans 1. The antinomians pointed to verse 16 in this chapter, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to every one that believeth. You see, they said, that the apostle begins with the gospel. But these words are preceded by the introduction. The sixteenth verse states the subject of the entire epistle. In verse 18 he begins the first part and concludes it by saying, What I have demonstrated so far is that all men are sinners and come short of the glory of God. Not until he enters upon his second part does he preach the gospel. Luther proceeds. They do not see that Paul teaches the very opposite. He begins by exhibiting first the wrath of God from heaven. He denounces all men as sinners and as guilty in the sight of God. After that, he teaches those who have been made conscious of their sin how to obtain grace and become righteous in the sight of God. That is his powerful and plain argument in the first three chapters. It is an extraordinary blindness and stupidity of the antinomians to imagine that the wrath of God is something distinct from the law. That cannot be, for the revelation of God's wrath is the law and its operation upon the intellect and the will of man. Paul expresses this fact when he says, The law worketh wrath. Lex irum operator. Now then, haven't they scored a fine point by doing away with the law? 
in consideration of the fact that, after all, they have to teach it when they teach the wrath of God. But they put the shoe on the foot the wrong way, trying to teach us the law after the gospel, and wrath after grace. I am well aware of the devil's aim. I see what abominable errors he is bent on introducing by means of this exegetical teeter-totter. But I cannot treat of them at this time. What Luther means to say by calling the scripture interpretation of the antinomians a katzenstuhlchen, seesaw or teeter-totter, is this. They have fixed matters so that they can set up a law or a gospel as they please. In his commentary on Genesis, chapter 21, 12, and 16, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 1, page 1427 and following, It is indeed correct to say that people must be raised up and comforted, but an additional statement must be made, showing who the people are that are to be comforted, namely those who, like Ishmael and his mother, have been thrust out of their home and fatherland, who are nearly famished with hunger and thirst in the desert, who groan and cry to the Lord, and are on the brink of despair. Such people are proper hearers of the gospel. Hagar and Ishmael had to be brought into mercy before they could be freed from their pride. Man is by nature a conceited being. He says, What wrong have I done? I have committed neither manslaughter nor adultery, nor fornication, nor larceny. Wrapped in these miserable rags of his civil righteousness, he purposes to make his stand before God. The spirit of pride in himself must be cast out. That requires an application of the hammer of the law which will crush his stony heart. Luther continues, Therefore the antinomians deserve to be hated by everybody, spite of the fact that they cite us as an example in order to defend their teaching. The antinomians pointed to the fact that Luther himself at first had preached nothing but comfort. They claimed that he had now departed from his former teaching, and had become a legalist. That, they said, explained his opposition to them. But they misjudged Luther. When he began his public activity, he did not have to instruct people at great length in the law. The people were so crushed that hardly one among them dared to believe that he was in a state of grace with God. For in their best efforts at preaching, the Roman priests preached the law, placing alongside of the divine law the laws of the church and the statutes of former councils, theologians, and popes. When Luther came forward, he had passed through the agony that harassed the people. He knew that no more effectual help could be provided for the people in their misery than the preaching of the gospel. That was the reason why the entire Christian church in those days experienced a sensation as if dew from heaven or life-giving spring showers were being poured out upon them. Accordingly, Luther proceeds, they cite us as an example to defend their teaching, while the reason why we had to start our teaching with the doctrine of divine grace is as plain as daylight. The accursed Pope had utterly crushed the poor consciences of men with his human ordinances. He had taken away all proper means for bringing aid and comfort to hearts in misery and despondency, and rescuing them from their despair. What else could we have done at this time? If Luther had smitten these miserable people still more, he would have been the meanest kind of torturer. Luther continues, However, I know, too, that those who are surfeited ease-loving and overfed must be addressed in a different strain we were all like castaways in those days and grievously tormented the water in the jug was gone that is there was nothing to comfort men with like ishmael we all lay dying under the shrub the kind of teachers we needed were such as made us behold the grace of god and taught us how to find refreshment the antinomians insist that the preaching of repentance must begin with the doctrine of grace I have not followed that method, for I knew that Ishmael must first be cast out and made despondent before he can hear the comforting words of the angel. Accordingly, I have followed the rule not to minister comfort to any person except to those who have become contrite and are sorrowing because of their sins. Those who have despaired of self-help, whom the law has terrified like a leviathan that has pounced upon them and almost perplexed them, for these are the people for whose sake Christ came into the world, and he will not have a smoking flax be quenched. Isaiah 42, 3. That is why he is calling, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. 
Ishmael had not been reduced to this strait before he was expelled from Abraham's home. He was proud and secure, and an antinomistic Epicurean. Because he had been born before Isaac, he would say, I am lord and heir of this house. Isaac and Sarah shall have to yield to me. Now, was this pride of his to be praised and tolerated, or was he to be rebuked for it? If the latter, in what other way could he have been rebuked than by being driven from the house with his mother, and not being permitted to take anything with him out of Abraham's house, except the wages of the law, bread and water? For that is the way the law usually acts. It leads the thief handcuffed to the gallows. Before he is throttled, it refreshes him with a draught of water. But at last there is no more water, and nothing remains to do but to die. More than this the law never does. Let us learn the lesson, then, namely, that God is an enemy of every proud person. But those who have been humbled and have felt the power of the law, he comforts, either by men or by an angel from heaven, for he does not want such people to perish. On the other hand, he will not suffer the secure and the proud to abide in Abraham's house. Now, a teacher and preacher must be trained in these two things, and possess skill and experience in them. Namely, he must both rebuke and crush the obstinate, and again he must be able to comfort those whom he has rebuked and crushed, lest they despair utterly and be swallowed up by the law. End of Lecture 11《Lecture Twelve of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel》by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twelfth Evening Lecture, December Twelfth, eighteen eighty four. The worst fault of modern preaching, my dear friends, is this: that the sermons lack point and purpose. And this fault can be noticed particularly in the sermons of modern preachers who are believers while unbelieving and fanatical preachers have quite a definite aim, pity that it was not the right one, believing preachers, as a rule, imagine that they can fully discharge their office, provided what they have preached has been the word of God. That is about as correct a view as when a ranger imagines he has discharged his office by sallying forth with his loaded gun and discharging it into the forest, or as when an artilleryman thinks he has done his duty by taking up his position with his cannon in the line of battle and by discharging his cannon. Just as poor rangers and soldiers as these latter are, just so poor and useless preachers are those who have no plan in mind, and take no aim when they are preaching. Granted, their sermons contain beautiful thoughts. They do not, for that matter, take effect. They may occasionally make the thunders of the law roll in their sermons, yet there is no lightning that strikes. Again, they may water the garden assigned to them with the fructifying waters of the gospel, but they are pouring water on the beds and paths of the garden indiscriminately, and their labor is lost. Neither Christ nor the holy apostles preached in this fashion. When they had finished preaching, every hearer knew he meant me, even when the sermon had contained no personal hints or insinuations. For instance, when our Lord Christ had delivered the powerful, awful parable of the murderous vine-dressers, the high priest and the scribes confessed to themselves, he means us. When the holy apostle Paul, on a certain occasion, had preached before the profligate and unjust governor Felix, concerning righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come, Felix perceived immediately that Paul was aiming his remarks at him. He trembled, but being unwilling to be converted, he said to Paul, Go thy way for this time, when I have convenient season, I will call for thee. But he never did call him. He had heard the sermon suited to his spiritual condition, and Paul's well-aimed remarks had struck home. The reason, then, my dear friends, why, in the Lutheran congregations of our former home country, Germany, unbelieving preachers are nearly always in the ascendancy, is unquestionably this. The sermons of the Christian preachers are aimless efforts. Unbelievers are increasing in the congregations about as fast as the Christian preachers are increasing, of whom there are considerably more now than when I was young. Why do they accomplish nothing? Oh, would to God that these dear men had the humility to sit down at Luther's feet and study his apostles! 
they would learn how to preach effectively, for the word of God, when preached as it should be, never returns void. May God help you in your future ministry not to become aimless prattles, so that you will have to complain that you accomplished so little when nobody but yourselves is at fault, because you have no definite aim when preparing your sermons, and do not reflect, to such and such a person, I want to drive home a lesson, not to this or that person whom I am going to name, but persons in whose condition I know to be such and such. However, while it is important that your sermons do not lack a special aim, it is equally important for your aim to be the right one. If you do not aim properly, your preaching, after all, will be useless, whether you preach the law or the gospel. Pieces 8. In the fourth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror on account of their sins, or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. In the opening lecture on our series of theses, we got acquainted with the six points of difference between the law and the gospel. They differ, one, as regards the manner of their being revealed to men, two, as regards their contents, three, as regards the promises held out by either doctrine, four, as regards their threatenings, five, as regards the function and the effect of either doctrine, six, as regards the persons to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. As a rule, point six is named last. The reason is not that it is less important, but this point introduces a difference of especially great importance. It is this, the gospel must be preached only to bruised, contrite, miserable sinners, the law to secure sinners. Inverting this order means confounding both, and by confounding them, commingling both in the most dangerous manner. Of the truth of this, we became convinced in our first lecture, from the statement in 1 Timothy 1, 8-9, We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. No law is given to a person who is made righteous by Christ, but to the unrighteous and disobedient. These are the persons to whom the law must be preached. To make a miserable, contrite sinner the subject of the law preaching is to commit a grievous sin against him, for the gospel ought to be preached to him. Isaiah says, chapter 61, 1 through 3, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The phrase, day of vengeance, does not signify a day of judgment upon men, for to proclaim such a day would not be proclaiming an acceptable year. The meaning is this, the Son of God meant to take vengeance on Satan, who had hurled the human race into misery. For this reason the proclamation of the day of vengeance is a cheering, comforting message to us. If God had not avenged our fall upon Satan, we should be lost. If Christ had not redeemed us from the devil, we could not rejoice, but would have to remain in sadness. The picturesque phrases which follow in this text must all be understood figuratively as pointing to spiritual gifts of grace. These texts show us that according to God's word not a drop of evangelical consolation is to be brought to those who are still living securely in their sins. On the other hand, to the broken-hearted, not a syllable containing a threat or a rebuke is to be addressed, but only promises conveying consolation and grace, forgiveness of sin and righteousness, life and salvation. That was the practice of our Lord and Saviour. One day he was approached by a woman which was a sinner, Luke 7.37, who, in the presence of self-righteous Pharisees, knelt down, washed his feet with her hot tears, and dried them with her hair, 
with which in former days, no doubt, she had frequently made a display of vanity. She was crushed when she came to Jesus. There was no one to comfort her, but she turned to Jesus, for she had realized that where he was, there was the throne of grace. What did the Lord do on that occasion? He did not utter one word of reproof because of the sins she had committed in darkness, for she had no doubt lived in the worst sins of fornication. No, not a word. He simply said to her, Thy sins are forgiven. In another, a similar instance, he dismissed the guilty woman with the assurance, Neither do I condemn thee, and with the brief admonition, Go and sin no more. The same treatment the Lord accorded to Zacchaeus, the nefarious publican who had defrauded people throughout the land. He may have heard some things from Christ directly, and many more things from the report of others. He had gained the conviction that he could not go on in his sinful ways, but must amend his conduct. When the Lord was about to pass in the neighborhood, he mounted a sycamore tree, because he wanted to see this holy man. What did the Lord do? Catching sight of him in the tree, he called to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus surely expected that the Lord would go over the record of his sins with him, and hold up to him all the evil he had done. But Jesus did nothing of the kind. On the contrary, in the house of Zacchaeus he said, This day is salvation come to this house, forasmuch as he also is a son of Abraham. It is Zacchaeus who says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. The Lord did not demand this of him, but his own conscience, first alarmed but now quieted, demanded this joyful act of generosity to the poor from him. No doubt he kept his promise. The parable of the prodigal is another illustration. The Lord pictures him to us, after he had wasted everything he had with harlots, as returning to his father with a contrite heart. The father receives him without a word of censure, but falls upon his neck, kisses him, and exclaims, Let us be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. A joyous banquet is prepared, but not a word of reproof is spoken. This attitude the Lord maintains even while hanging on the cross. Next to him hangs one who has led an infamous life. The patient suffering of Christ has given him a new understanding, which he voices in these words. We indeed are justly in this condemnation, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. Turning finally to the Lord, he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He recognizes in Jesus the Messiah. And now observe that the Lord does not reply, What, thee I am to remember? Thee, who hast done so many wicked things? No, he does not cast up his sins to him at all, but simply says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. By these incidents the Lord shows us what we are to do, even today, for a poor sinner who may have led a shameful life, but has become crushed and contrite, full of terror because of his sins. In such a case we should not lose any time in censuring and reproving him, but absolve and comfort him. That is the way to divide the gospel from the law. The practice of the holy apostles was identical with that of the Lord. You will recall the incident of the jailer at Philippi. He was on the point of committing a shocking deed, the mortal sin of suicide, when Paul called to him, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. All through the night he had heard Paul and Silas singing praises to God. No doubt a new knowledge had begun to dawn on him. When he heard Paul's warning cry, he called for a light, came trembling, and falling down before Paul and Silas, said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They do not tell him a number of things that he will have to do first, for instance, to feel contrite. They simply say to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. They simply invite him to accept the mercy of God, for that is what faith is accepting the divine mercy or grace. Let me now cite for you from Luther's writings, not so much passages in which he insists that the gospel, pure and unalloyed, must be proclaimed to poor sinners, but rather a particular incident which illustrates how, 
Luther brought consolation to a person who had fallen into a great and grievous sin. The party in question was that splendid man Spalatin, born 1482, who had a great share in the work of the Reformation. He became ecclesiastical counsellor to the elector of Saxony, and lived at Altenburg. He was Luther's intimate friend. He had been party to an advice given to a certain pastor to marry the stepmother of his deceased wife. The marriage was absolutely contrary to God's word, and the advice was more appalling since the Apostle Paul, in dealing with a similar offence in 1 Corinthians 5, had declared that it involved fornication such as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. When the truth dawned on Good Spalatin, he refused to be comforted. Luther learned that he had fallen into melancholy. No comfort offered him would take effect. He imagined that no consolation of Scripture could apply to a man like him who had known the Word of God so well and had derived so much consolation from it. How did Luther proceed to comfort this man? He wrote him a letter which began as follows, St. Louis edition 10, 1729 and following, Grace and peace from God in Christ, and the consolations of the Holy Spirit, to my worthy master in Christ, George Spalatin, superintendent of the church of Misnia, most faithful pastor of Altenburg, my beloved in the Lord. Amen. My dearest Spalatin, I heartily sympathize with you, and earnestly pray our Lord Jesus Christ to strengthen you and give you a cheerful heart. I should like to know, and am making diligent inquiries to find out, what your trouble may be, and what has caused your breakdown. I am told by some that it is nothing else than depression and heaviness of heart caused by the matrimonial affair of a parson who was publicly united in marriage to the stepmother of his deceased wife. If this is true, I beseech you most earnestly not to become self-centered and heed the thoughts and sensations of your own heart, but listen to me, your brother, who is speaking to you in the name of Christ. Otherwise your despondency will grow beyond endurance and kill you. For St. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 7.10, The sorrow of the world worketh death. I have often passed through the same experience, and witnessed the same in 1540, in the case of Magister Philip, who was nearly consumed by heaviness of heart and despondency on account of the Landgraves affair. However, Christ used my tongue to raise him up again. I say this on the supposition that you have sinned and are partly to blame for the aforementioned marriage, because you approved of it. Observe that Luther grants that Spalatin had committed a grievous wrong by approving the marriage, by advising in favor of it before it was contracted. Luther proceeds, Yea, I shall go further and say, even if you had committed more numerous and grievous sins in this present and other instances than Manasseh, the king of Judah, whose offenses and crimes could not be eradicated throughout his posterity, down to the time when Jerusalem was destroyed, while your offense is very light because it concerns a temporal interest and can be easily remedied. Nevertheless, I repeat it, granted you are to blame, are you going to worry yourself to death over it, and by thus killing yourself commit a still more horrible sin against God? Luther means to say, this marriage can be dissolved, for it is not legitimate. It would be a greater sin now to despair of the mercy of God than it was to advise this marriage. For despairing of God's mercy is always the most horrible sin, because it means that we declare God to be a liar. Luther goes on. It is bad enough to know that you have made a mistake in this matter. Now do not let your sin stick to your mind, but get rid of it. Quit your despondency, which is a far greater sin. Listen to the blessed consolation which the Lord offers you by the prophet Ezekiel, who says, chapter 33, 11, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Do you imagine that only in your case the Lord's hand is shortened? Isaiah 59, 1. Or has he in your case alone forgotten to be gracious and shut up his tender mercies? Psalm 77, 10. Or are you the first man to aggravate his sin so awfully that henceforth there is no longer a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities? Hebrews 4, 15. Do you consider it a new marvel when a person living this life in the flesh with innumerable arrows of so many devils flying about him is occasionally wounded and laid prostrate? 
Luther means to say, Why are you surprised at your grievous fall? That is a common occurrence. The terrible part is only that we refuse to rise again, and, like miserable reprobates, crawl back to the throne of grace. Luther continues, It seems to me, my dear Spalatin, that you have still but limited experience in battling against sin, an evil conscience, the law, and the terrors of death. Or Satan has removed from your vision and memory every consolation which you have read in the Scriptures. In days when you were not afflicted, you were well fortified, and knew very well what the office and benefits of Christ are. To be sure, the devil has now plucked from your heart all the beautiful Christian sermons concerning the grace and mercy of God in Christ, by which you used to teach, admonish, and comfort others with a cheerful spirit and a great buoyant courage. Or it must surely be that heretofore you have been only a trifling sinner, conscious only of paltry and insignificant faults and frailties. There are only two ways in which Luther can explain to himself why Spalatin refuses to be comforted. Either he has hitherto failed to perceive his misery and wretchedness under sin, he has not been aware of the fact that he is a great sinner by nature. His grievous fall had to occur in order that his eyes might be opened to these facts. Or, Satan must have hidden every consolation out of Spalatin's sight. Practically, Luther says to Spalatin, Had you fully realized the awful corruption of your heart in its relation to God, you would not be so inconsolable. For you would say to yourself, Alas, the fountain is so polluted, that is why such filth has to flow from it. To return to Luther. Therefore my faithful request and admonition is that you join our company and associate with us who are real, great, and hard-boiled sinners. You must by no means make Christ to seem paltry and trifling to us, as though he could be our helper only when we want to be rid from imaginary, nominal, and childish sins. No, no, that would not be good for us, he must rather be a saviour and redeemer from real, great, grievous and damnable transgressions and iniquities, yea, from the very greatest and most shocking sins, to be brief, from all sins added together in a grand total. To the company of real, great, abominable sinners to which Spalatin is invited, Luther feels that he belongs himself. He argues that by making our sins small we make Christ small. That would practically amount to saying, Christ can forgive small, but not great sins. When a person has committed a great sin, and is unconcerned about it, he is beyond help. But when he worries about it, his help has already come. Luther relates, Dr. Staupitz comforted me on a certain occasion, when I was a patient in the same hospital, and suffering the same affliction as you, by addressing me thus, Aha! You want to be a painted sinner and accordingly expect to have in Christ a painted Saviour. You will have to get used to the belief that Christ is a real Saviour, and you are a real sinner. For God is neither jesting nor dealing in imaginary affairs. But He was greatly and most assuredly in earnest when He sent His Son into the world and sacrificed Him for our sakes, and so forth. Romans 8.32, John 3.16 These and similar reflections drawn from consolatory Bible texts have been snatched from your memory by the accursed Satan, and hence you cannot recall them in your present great anguish and despondency. For God's sake, then, turn your ears hither, brother, and hear me cheerfully singing, me, your brother, who at this time is not afflicted with the despondency and melancholy that is oppressing you, and therefore is strong in faith, so that you, who are weak and harried and harassed by the devil, can lean on him for support until you have regained your old strength can bid defiance to the devil, and cheerfully sing, Thou hast thrust sore at me, that I might fall, for the Lord help me. Psalm 118, 13 Imagine now that I am Peter, holding out my hand to you, and saying to you, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Acts 3, 6 For I know I am not mistaken, nor is the devil talking through me. But since I am laying the word of Christ before you, it is Christ who speaks to you through me, and bids you obey and trust your brother, who is of the same household of faith. It is Christ that absolves you from this and all your sins, and I am partaker of your sin by helping you to bear up under it. On the occasion to which Luther refers, 
he had gone to Dr. Staupitz to pour out his sorrowful heart to him. He had not committed any gross and manifest sins, but he was worried over the sinful condition of his heart. God had granted Luther an extraordinary measure of knowledge that made him understand the corruption of human nature. His remark about a painted Savior is striking. If we do not want such a Savior, we must not be surprised when we discover ourselves to be real, actual sinners. Luther's appeal to Spalatin to receive him not for his person's sake, but because he is laying the word of God before him, is a fine touch. Spalatin is to see Christ standing before him, and speaking to him in the person of Luther. Also, the remark about Luther's sharing Spalatin's sin by helping him bear his burden is excellent. When a minister absolves a person who has confessed his sin to him, he takes that sin of the other on his own conscience. He can cheerfully do this, for the party that came to him to confess, perhaps the most horrible sins, came with a bruised heart. He may cheerfully pronounce absolution to such a person and say, I shall assume the responsibility for what I am doing, for I know that on the great day of judgment Christ will say to me, You did right. For he came to you with a bruised conscience, and it was proper that you ministered the gospel to him. Luther concludes his letter with these urgent remarks. See that you accept and appropriate to yourself the comfort I am offering you. For it is true, certain, and reliable, since the Lord has commanded me to communicate it to you, and bidden you to accept it from me. For if even I am cut to the quick by seeing you in such awful distress because of your deep melancholy, it gives God a far greater displeasure to behold it. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Joel 2.13 Therefore do not turn away from him who is coming to comfort you and announce the will of God to you, and who hates and abominates your despondency and melancholy as a plague of Satan. Do not by any means permit the devil to portray Christ to you differently from what he is in truth. Believe the scripture which testifies that he was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 Your melancholy is a work of the devil, which Christ wants to destroy if you will only let him. You have had your fill of anguish. You have sorrowed enough. You have exceeded your penance. Therefore do not refuse my consolation. Let me help you. Behold, my faithful heart, dear Spalatin, in dealing with you and speaking to you, I shall consider it the greatest favor that I have ever received from you, if you allow the comfort which I am offering you, or rather the absolution, pardon, and restoration of the Lord Christ to abide in you. If you do this, you will, after your recovery, be forced to confess yourself that you have offered the most pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to the Lord by your obedience. For in Psalm 147.11 it is written, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Again, Psalm 34.18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and saveth such as are of contrite spirit and in Psalm 51.17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Therefore let the accursed devil with his despondency scamper away like a whipped dog. He wants to make me sad on your account. He wants to blast my joy in the Lord. Yea, if he could, he would swallow us all up at one gulp. May Christ our Lord rebuke and chastise him, and may he strengthen, comfort, and preserve you by his Spirit. Amen. Comfort your wife with these in your own more effectual words. I have not the leisure to write also to her. Given at Zeitz, August 21st, A.D. 1544. Your Martin Luther. Luther argues that sharing a brother's sin entitles you to claim that the brother must in turn share your comfort. God takes no pleasure in beholding a person stricken with remorse and laboring with might and main to remain thus stricken. When the hammer of his law has crushed us, we are to flee from Moses to Christ. That is the right procedure. Luther's exegesis of 1 John 3, 8 is beautiful. The term works of the devil is commonly interpreted to signify horrible and gross sins, but Luther comprises in that term also doubt and melancholy, 
as being the most grievous sin. Christ did not come to fill us with sadness, but with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Luther wrote this letter to Spalatin while stopping during a journey at Zeitz. The only thanks which he craves for the task of composing this letter, no doubt with heartfelt signs to God, is that Spalatin accept his consolations. I wanted to communicate this letter to you in its entirety, hoping that it may have pleased you so much that you will often read it again. Think of it particularly whenever a sorrowing, disconsolate sinner approaches you in your pastoral capacity. Read this letter as a preparation for the evangelical treatment which you are to accord such a sinner. Remember, Luther admits that Spalatin has sinned, but he realized that in the particular moment he must not for God's sake say anything to Spalatin that might strike his friend's heart like an arrow. Let me read another letter to you which Luther wrote, as far back as 1516, to the Augustinian friar Spainlein, who was in great agony concerning his state of grace. Spainlein had been an intimate with Luther in the Augustinian monastery at Wittenberg. In the judgment of all who are familiar with Luther's writing, this letter is most excellent. One marvels that Luther could write such a letter even at that early date. It is sterling gold and pure honey. I wish to know, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 21a, twenty and following. The condition of your heart, whether you have at last come to loathe your own righteousness and desire to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ, and to be of good cheer because of it. For in these days the temptation to presumptuousness is very strong, particularly in those who strive with might and main to be righteous and godly, and do not know of the altogether immaculate righteousness of God, which is freely given us in Christ. As a result of this, they are searching for something good in themselves, until they become confident that they can pass muster before God as people who are properly adorned with virtuous and meritorious deeds, all of which is impossible. While you were with us, you held this opinion, or rather this error, just as I did. For my part, I am still wrestling with this error, and am not quite rid of it yet. Therefore, my dear brother, learn Christ, Christ crucified, Learn to sing praises to him, and to despair utterly of your own works. Say to him, Thou, my Lord Jesus, art my righteousness, I am thy sin. Thou hast taken from me what is mine, and given to me what is thine. Thou didst become what thou wert not, and madest me to be what I was not. Beware of your ceaseless striving after righteousness, so great that you no longer appear as a sinner in your own eyes, and do not want to be a sinner. For Christ dwells only in sinners. He came down from heaven where he dwelt in the righteous for the very purpose of dwelling in sinners also. Ponder this love of his, and you will realize his sweetest consolation. For if we must achieve rest of conscience by our own toil and worry, for what purpose did he die? Therefore you are to find peace in him by a hearty despair of yourself and your own works. And now that he has received you, made your sins his and his righteousness yours, learn also from him firmly to believe this, as behooves you, for cursed is every one who does not believe this. We note that Luther tells Spainlein not to be surprised when he finds nothing meritorious in himself but only sin. He must learn to sing praises to Christ and to despair of himself as of a person in whom nothing good is found except what the good God has done through him. He is not to strive after a righteousness of his own, which would make him seem no longer a sinner. For in one that knows what God's word says about this matter, that would be an impudent denial of his Redeemer. The remark of Luther that Christ dwells only in sinners, Wolf, the editor of Luther's works, has annotated by a gloss that limits Luther's remark to poor sinners. That is self-evident. Bold sinners do not acknowledge that they are sinners. What others call sin, they call human weakness and the natural inborn disposition. Their occasional display of godliness is sheer hypocrisy. They may say, we are such poor sinners, but they do not mean that statement in the scriptural sense. They say, well, we cannot help but being weak mortals, but one is a drunkard, another a fornicator, the third a thief, and so forth. All these vices are to pass for mere weaknesses. Verily, 
Christ dwells only in sinners who are such in their own estimation. He had dwelt among the angels, but came down on earth because he wanted to make his abode also with sinners. Luther's surprised query, Why then did Christ die? is an excellent point. Anyone who is troubled on account of his sins is a fool for not promptly taking refuge with Christ and for imagining that his evil conscience is proof that he may not come to God. No, this is what the evil conscience states. You should come to Christ. He will give you a cheerful conscience, causing you to praise God with a joyful heart when you rise in the morning and lie down to rest at night. For what does it mean that Christ died for you? Accordingly, when you have committed this, that, or the other sin, and are perplexed about a way out of your sin, do not try to make a way out yourself. Go to him who alone knows a way. Go to Christ. It is a remarkable statement of Luther, but certainly true, that we are to find peace by wholly despairing of our own works. When a poor sinner regards himself, he does despair. When he looks at Christ, he is made confident. What Luther wrote to Spain line is the most beautiful gospel that can be preached, for it declares that Christ has come in behalf of everybody, that he has borne every man's sin, that he calls on everyone to believe in him, to rejoice and rest assured that his sins are forgiven, and that in the hour of death he will depart saved. End of Lecture 12Lecture 13 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteenth Evening Lecture, January 9, 1885 To achieve creditable results, my friends, a minister must needs preach the word of God in its truth and purity without any adulteration whatsoever. This is the first and foremost requisite for success. Some preachers of our time hush certain teachings that are offensive to worldly people. They do this with the good intention of not shocking their hearers. But this is a great mistake. You cannot make a person a true Christian by oratory, though it be ever so sublime and fervent, but only by the word of God. The word of God alone produces repentance, faith, and godliness, and preserves men therein unto the end. The second requisite for effective preaching is that the preacher not only himself believe the things he preaches to others, but that his heart be full of the truths which he proclaims, so that he enters his pulpit with the ardent desire to pour out his heart to his hearers. He must have an enthusiastic grasp, in the right sense of the word, of his subject. Then his hearers get the impression that the words dropping from his lips are flames from a soul on fire. That does not mean that the word of God must receive its power and life from the living faith of the preacher. For the Lord says distinctly, The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. John 6.63 Moreover, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. But when a preacher proclaims what he has ever so often experienced in his own heart, he easily finds the right words to speak convincingly to his hearers. Coming from the heart, his words in turn go to the hearts of the hearers, according to the good old saying, pectus desertum facet. That is, it is the heart that makes eloquent. This does not mean the artificial eloquence acquired in a school of elocution, but the sane spiritual art of reaching the hearts of hearers. For when the hearers get the impression that the preacher is in full and dread earnest, they feel themselves drawn with an irresistible force to pay the closest attention to what the preacher is teaching in his sermon. This is the reason why many simple, less gifted, and less learned preachers accomplish more than the most highly gifted and profoundly learned men. Would that you, my dear friends, were first of all real Christians, filled with ardent zeal for the truth. That is the equipment for becoming, in the course of time, powerful preachers, whose spirit seizes the hearers with irresistible force, as the example of the apostles' evidences. The people could not tell why the preaching of these simple men made such a powerful impression on them. 
Far from suggesting that great gifts and thorough theological learning are not to be highly esteemed, I should rather claim the contrary to be true. For if to the living faith of the preacher there are added great gifts and thorough learning, he will be in the end a mighty, efficient tool in the hands of God, since all natural endowments and whatever we have acquired by our natural zeal is not put aside by God when we enter the ministry, but is purified and pressed into his service. That is the reason why great happenings took place and great results were achieved in the kingdom of God, whenever great gifts and thorough learning were coupled with living faith. First and foremost, I wish to point to the Apostle Paul, who was the only scholar among the apostles. According to his own testimony, he labored more and accomplished more than the rest. Another instance is that of Luther, the great reformer. If he had merely had a heroic faith, and would not at the same time have been a great, highly gifted and learned man, he would never have become the reformer who so gloriously accomplished the greatest work of his age. Accordingly, I would exhort you during this period of your studies to strive day and night to attain the highest mark in every branch of theological knowledge, not only in didactic but also in practical theology. My cordial good wishes are with you, and I pray the Lord that they be fulfilled. If they are, you will be living proofs of the importance of joining these two factors, a living faith and good endowments, with faithful and diligent study. I pass on to another point, but do not regard my remarks so far as the usual introduction. It was merely a preamble. I wish that my words, though spoken in weakness, would find permanent lodging in your hearts. God the Holy Spirit grant it. For much, my friends, very much, depends not only on your bearing aloft the light when you enter upon your public activity, but on being lights yourselves. You are to be such, not by immediate, but by mediate illumination. Let us now pass on to our subject. We finished our consideration of the first part of Thesis 8, which declares that the word of God is not rightly divided if the law is preached to such as are already alarmed over their sins. We proceed to the second part of the thesis, which tells us that the word of God is not rightly divided if the gospel is preached to such as live securely in their sins. The latter error is as dangerous as the former. Incalculable damage is done if the consolations of the gospel are offered to secure sinners, or if one preaches to a multitude in such a manner that secure sinners in the audience, by the preacher's fault, imagine that the comfort of the gospel is meant for them. A preacher who does this may preach crowds of people into hell instead of into heaven. No, the gospel is not intended for secure sinners. We cannot, of course, prevent secure sinners from coming into our churches and hearing the gospel, and it devolves upon the preacher to offer the entire comfort of the gospel in all its sweetness. However, in such a manner that secure sinners realize that the comfort is not intended for them. The whole manner of the preacher's presentation must make them realize that fact. Let me offer you a few proof texts from Scripture for what I have said. Matthew 7, 6, our Lord says to his disciples, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. A remarkable utterance. What is meant by that which is holy? Nothing else than the word of Christ. What is meant by pearls? The consolation of the gospel with the grace, righteousness, and salvation which it proclaims. Of these things we are not to speak to dogs, that is, to enemies of the gospel, nor to swine, that is, to such as want to remain in their sins, and are seeking their heaven and their bliss in the filth of their sins. Isaiah says, chapter 26, 10, Let favor be showed to the wicked, Yet will he not learn righteousness? In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. It is quite useless to offer mercy to the godless. They imagine either that they do not need it, or that they already have all of it. The trifling sins, they say, of which they are guilty, have long been forgiven, and grass has grown over them. To a person of this strife I am not to preach the gospel. In other words, I am not to offer him mercy, for that is what preaching the gospel means, because he will not be benefited by it. 
A wicked person who wants to remain in his sins, whether they be gross or refined sins, for the devil can bind men not only with the ropes of filthy gross sins, but also with such delicate threads as pride, envy, lovelessness. Such a wicked person, Isaiah says, does not behold the majesty of the Lord. He does not see what a great treasure is offered him. He does not understand the doctrine of salvation by grace. Either he spurns it, or he shamefully misapplies it. He thinks, if mere faith is all that is necessary for my salvation, my sins too are forgiven. I can remain such as I am, and I shall still go to heaven. I too believe in my Lord Jesus Christ. The preacher who is to blame when secure sinners misapply the gospel loads himself with a great guilt and responsibility before God. Proverbs 27.7, we read, The full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. You may set screened honey before a person who has eaten his fill, and even this dainty food will nauseate him, while it is relished by a hungry person. The gospel, which is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb, is to be preached only to hungry souls. The bitter thing, that is the law, is for those who are not hungry. A pattern after which we are to model our preaching we find in the first place in our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Observing his conduct in the gospel records, we find that whenever he met with secure sinners, and such the self-righteous Pharisees in those days certainly were, he had not a drop of comfort for them, but called them serpents, and a viper's brood, denounced a tenfold woe against them, revealed their abominable hypocrisy, assigned them to perdition, and told them that they would not escape eternal damnation. Although he knew that these very persons would nail him to the cross, he fearlessly told them the truth. That is a point to be noted by preachers. Though knowing in advance that they will share the fate of the Lord Jesus, they must preach the law in all its severity to secure reckless sinners, to hypocrites and men who are their enemies. I do not mean to say that we are able to endure what our Lord endured, we cannot drink the cup that he has drained, but we shall feel the enmity of people. They will either oppose us openly or plot against us continually in secret. But there is no way out of this dilemma. Whenever the preacher faces this class of people, he dare not preach anything else than the law to them. Moreover, when he preaches before a multitude, his hearers must get the impression that what he says does not apply to all of them indiscriminately, but to the would-be righteous who claim the gospel for themselves. True, our Lord says, Come unto me all. But he immediately adds, Ye that labor and are heavy laden. Thus he serves notice upon secure sinners that he is not inviting them. They would only ridicule him if he were to lay his spiritual heavenly treasures before them. On a certain occasion, a rich young man approached Jesus and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus declined the title good master, because it would have put him in the same class with a self-righteous young man who considered himself a good master. That rich young man was not sincere in addressing the Lord thus. If he had regarded Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of the world, if he had believed in Christ and for that reason called him good master, it would have been quite proper but because he merely wanted to offer the Lord a bit of flattery, Christ declined at the title, and turned to the young man with the challenge, Keep the commandments. When the young man asked, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man replied, all these things I have kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? He meant to say, If thou hast no other teachings to propose, thou art not such a wise man as some consider thee to be. What thou hast told me I have known for a long time. How does Jesus answer the young man's last question? Does he say, You lack faith? By no means, since he is dealing with a miserable, secure, and self-righteous person. He does not preach one word of gospel to him. Though knowing in advance, by reason of his omniscience, that all his efforts would be in vain, he felt that he must first bring him to a realization of his spiritual misery. 
god in his love does many things that to us may seem useless in order that on judgment day no man may have an excuse for not committing to faith in christ god will say to many this and that i did for you but you spurn me jesus accordingly said to the rich young man if thou wilt be perfect go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me now the record states when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions he departed with an accusing conscience which no doubt told him that is indeed a different doctrine from the one i used to hear what he tells me i cannot do i have become too greatly attached to my possessions i would rather forfeit my fellowship with him than do what he says i am not going to roam the country with him like a beggar probably his conscience also testified to him that according to the teaching of christ he was damned that hell was his goal that was the effect which the lord had intended to produce in dealing with this young man whether he was converted later we do not know nor is it of any consequence here the point is that in this episode we have an example to guide us when we are dealing with such as are still secure and self-righteous true we cannot issue orders such as christ the lord of lords issued but there are enough questions that we can ask to make a person of this kind realize that he is still deeply steeped in sins and a lost creature this episode with the rich young man is recorded in matthew nineteen a similar episode with a lawyer is recorded in luke ten the apostles we find observe the same practice as their lord and master they first preached the law and with such force that their hearers were cut to the quick let us examine acts two in his first pentecostal sermon peter first fastened the murder of christ upon his hearers and that charge went home they were frightened and asked men and brethren what shall we do and now peter says to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins preaching the gospel to them he tells them that they can have forgiveness of all their sins even of the worst ones that was the general practice of the apostles everywhere not only in jerusalem but also in athens corinth ephesus and so forth everywhere they preached repentance first and then faith for they knew that everywhere they were as a rule facing secure sinners who had not yet realized their most miserable sinful condition however they did not only apply the law sternly to those who had not yet heard anything about the christian religion but also to those who pretended to be christians but were living securely in their sins there is a remarkable instance of their practice in the two concluding chapters of the second epistle to the corinthians the holy apostle writes i fear lest when i come i shall not find you such as i would and that i shall be found unto you such as ye would not lest there be debates envyings wraths strifes backbitings whisperings swellings tumults second corinthians twelve twenty he means to say you will imagine that i am going to preach the gospel to you but you will be surprised when i come and you will hear me preach among the things that he is going to preach he does not mention knavery fornication theft blasphemy murder but all such sins especially hypocrisy as are still found in all christian congregations he proceeds verse twenty one and lest when i come again my god will humble me among you and that i shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed they were not at that time living in fornication and uncleanness but they had formerly lived in these sins they had become christians by a process of reasoning but had not truly repented of their sins they professed the christian religion with their lips but their faith was not faith of the heart they had not been regenerated and renewed by the holy spirit continuing the apostle says this is the third time i am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established i told you before and i foretell you as if i were present the second time and being absent now i write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if i come again i will not spare 
2 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. We have here an excellent example for a preacher to follow. When people begin to engage in all manner of sinful practices with impunity, and imagine that everybody will have to regard them as good Christians, provided they attend church and go to communion, the pastor must say to himself, It is time that I lay down the law to my people, lest I live in careless case while my hearers are going to perdition, and lest they rise up to accuse me on the last day and say, You are the cause why we have to suffer eternal torment. The apostle had to reflect that when he resumed his ministry in the Corinthian congregation, he would still find secure members whom he would have to rouse. In those godless, sodomitical times, the apostle did not care whether the people would turn against him and become his enemies. He told them in advance that he was not going to spare them. He would tell to their very faces that eternal damnation was awaiting them unless they would repent. He would rebuke them as people who had been found out as continuing to sin against their conscience and yet claiming to be Christians. Accordingly, we may not preach the gospel, but must preach the law to secure sinners. We must preach them into hell before we can preach them into heaven. By our preaching, our hearers must be brought to the point of death before they can be restored to life by the gospel. They must be made to realize that they are sick unto death before they can be restored to health by the gospel. First, their own righteousness must be laid bare to them, so that they may see of what filthy rags it consists and then by the preaching of the gospel they are to be robed in the garment of the righteousness of Christ. They must first be induced to say from the heart, I, a lost and condemned creature, as the Catechism puts it, in order that they may be induced next to exclaim joyfully, O blessed man that I am! They must first be reduced to nothing by the law, in order that they may be made to be something to the praise and glory of God by the gospel. We cannot indeed prescribe to sinners a certain degree of penitence, for an examination of the Holy Scriptures on this point reveals the fact that the degree of penitence with those persons whose conversion has been recorded has been quite different. But every person must have experienced something of the bitterness of penitence, or he will never even begin to relish the sweetness of the gospel. In leading a person to salvation, God may permit him to obtain faith without previously passing through a great deal of anguish and fear but he always compensates for that later. Those whom God in his mercy has led quickly to faith and joy in their Saviour must, by the same mercy, be merged again and again in genuine sorrow over their sins, lest they fall away. Time-believers, Zeitgläubigen, those who believe for a time, have been described by the Lord as follows. The seed of the divine word promptly takes root in them, causing faith to spring up in them rapidly. They receive the word with joy, but are not profited by it. Unless the rocky subsoil in their hearts has been pulverized by the law, the sweet gospel is of no benefit to them. It is indeed a common observation that all those who have passed through great and profound sorrow at the beginning have become the best and most stalwart Christians. Those who in their youth were deeply merged beneath floods of anguish and sorrow on account of their salvation turned out to be the best pastors and theologians. This is illustrated by the instance of our beloved Luther. The reformation of the Church, the greatest task that any one could have accomplished in that age, had been entrusted to him. Without giving him any premonition, God prepared him for this task, not by making him very smart and enduing him with a keen knowledge of men, or by giving him immediately a very clear understanding of the Word of God, for he did not possess such understanding at the start and did not obtain it until the Holy Spirit kindled the true light in his soul. But by forcing him upon his knees in anguish and terror, so that he was in danger every moment of yielding to blasphemous thoughts. That, however, was the proper school from which the future reformer was to be graduated. Another instance is that of Flacius, who, beyond question, was the greatest theologian of his time, second only to Luther. Pity that he fell into error at a later time, and would not accept correction. He, too, was for a long time at the brink of despair. Luther ministered to him until he was in a condition at last to receive the consolation of the gospel. Furthermore, we read that John Gerhardt, one of the very greatest dogmaticians, during his college days was, for
for more than a year in deepest anguish and sorrow. Nobody succeeded in raising him up until John Arndt, his spiritual physician, healed him with the comfort of the gospel. When Gerhardt had emerged from this infernal anguish and realized that he was a miserable sinner, he became a great man. Much of the life story of all great theologians, as a rule, has not been published, and will not be known except in the hereafter. Could we know it now, we would observe that all those great men became great after previously having been made small and worthless. They became the great men in the kingdom of God, and the great instruments of God that they are acknowledged to be, after they had been freed from their anguish and distress, began to believe the gospel, and thus became new men. A young man who has arrived at faith in God's word by a sterile conviction of his intellect is a pitiful sight. If he is an acute reasoner, he can easily be led to accept all sorts of errors and become a heretic, because he has never passed through any real anguish of soul. But any one who has experienced the power of the word, and passed through the ordeal of genuine and serious penitence, will not easily slip into the hidden spiritual sinkholes for he has been made wary by experience. When his reason begins to hold forth to him, he clings to the word and bids his reason be silent. God grant that you have not only been polite listeners to my remarks, and resolved to put them to practice in the ministry, but that you also have experienced them in your own hearts. Let me submit a few testimonies from Luther on this matter. First, one from his commentary on chapters in Exodus, St. Louis edition, 858 and following. The gospel is not fit to be preached to gross, vulgar, reckless sinners who spend their lives without a thought of the hereafter. On the contrary, it is a consolation intended for afflicted souls. Matthew 11.28 For it is a delicate food which requires a hungry soul. Accordingly, the Blessed Virgin Mary sings in her Magnificat, Luke 1.53, he hath filled the hungry with good things. Otherwise the rude masses will fall upon it, all claiming to be evangelical and Christian brethren, and then start schisms and all sorts of distress. They are headed wherever the devil leads them. A Christian is not reckless, wild, and vulgar, but his conscience is timid, low-spirited, and despondent. He feels the gnawing of his sin and trembles at the wrath of God, the power of the devil, and the thought of death. A heart bruised and crushed like this relishes the Lord Christ greatly. Furthermore, redemption from sin, death, devil, and hell are much appreciated by those who are being swallowed up by death, who are feeling their distress and yearn for rest. They obtain rest if they have believing hearts, but they feel at the same time what a frail thing their old Adam is. When I reprove a person and he becomes angry with me, he shows that he is not a true Christian. For a Christian receives reproof meekly, even if the reproof is uncalled for. He is not greatly surprised that people should charge him with wrongdoing, knowing that no person who is still in his natural state can be expected to do good. If he knows himself to be innocent of the charge, he says, God be praised, I am not guilty. It is an important remark of Luther when he states that those are certainly no Christians who do not feel the gnawing of their sin, are not wrestling with it, and are even apt to ask, Why, what wrong am I doing? He who speaks thus is in a sorry condition. Were he a true Christian, he would say, Indeed, my sins go over my head. That was my plight not only in the days when I was not converted, but it is still my plight. I do not believe this merely because I read about it in the Bible, but I experience every day what a wicked thing my heart is and how frail my old Adam. Furthermore, in his treatise Concerning Councils and Churches, Luther writes, St. Louis edition, 16, 22, 41 and following, My friends, the antinomians preach exceedingly well, and I cannot but believe that they do so with great earnestness, concerning the mercy of Christ, forgiveness of sin, and other contents of the article of redemption. But they flee from this inference as from the devil, that they must tell people about the third article of sanctification, that is, of the new life in Christ. For they hold that we must not terrify people and make them sorrowful, but must always preach to them the comfort of grace in Christ and the forgiveness of sins. 
they tell us to avoid for god's sake such statements as these listen do you want to be a christian while you are an adulterer a fornicator a swill belly full of pride avarice usurious practices envy revenge malice and so forth and mean to continue on in these on the contrary they tell us that this is the proper way to speak listen you are an adulterer fornicator miser or addicted to some other sin now if you will only believe you are saved and need not dread the law for christ has fulfilled all tell me prithee does not this amount to conceding the premise and denying the conclusion verily it amounts to this that christ is taken away and made worthless in the same breath with which he is most highly extolled it means to say yes and no in the same matter for a christ who died for sinners who after receiving forgiveness will not quit their sin nor lead a new life is worthless and does not exist according to the logic of nestorius and eutyches these people in masterful fashion preach a christ who is and is not the redeemer they are excellent preachers of the easter truth but miserable preachers of the truth of pentecost for there is nothing in their preaching concerning sanctification of the holy ghost and about being quickened into a new life they preach only about the redemption of christ it is proper to extol christ in our preaching but christ is the christ and has acquired redemption from sin and death for this very purpose that the holy spirit should change our old adam into a new man that we are to be dead unto sin and live unto righteousness as paul teaches romans six two and following and that we are to begin this change and increase in this new life here and consummate it hereafter for christ has gained for us not only grace gratium but also the gift donum of the holy spirit so that we obtain from him not only forgiveness of sin but also the ceasing from sin any one therefore who does not cease from his sin but continues in his former evil way must have obtained a different christ from the antinomians the genuine christ is not with them even if they cry with the voice of all angels christ christ they will have to go to perdition with their new christ the antinomians you know were followers of john agricola of eisleben who taught that the law must not be preached in the christian churches because it belongs in the courthouse on gallows hill and so forth luther has given an extreme description of antinomian preaching none of you will readily imitate that method but it is easy to fall into something like it when you are about to comfort people effectually who are in anguish and distress because they imagine that their sins are too great that they have sinned too long a time and so forth then you must proceed to glorify grace and say though you had committed all sins that have ever been committed on this earth though you were judas's and cain's and had persecuted jesus you need not despair of the mercy of god however this correct statement must be delivered in such a manner that reckless sinners will feel that the statement applies only to such sinners as are alarmed and in distress over their sins and not to people like themselves who think that after all matters will not be so bad as the preachers say be careful then for god's sake when preaching the gospel not to make sinners secure and thus become seducers into sin and defenders of sin luther's remark about this class of sinners for whom christ died must not be interpreted to mean that christ did not die for all sinners luther manifestly means to say that christ did not die to make sinners secure luther's remarks about eastern pentecost preachers deserve to be remembered it is well if on easter day you emphasize with great force and expatiate on the victory of christ over sin death devil and hell but you must also be a good pentecostal preacher and say to your hearers repent for then the holy spirit will come with his grace and comfort enlighten and sanctify you we shall never attain to perfect sanctification in this life but we must make a beginning and progress in this endeavor for he that does not increase decreases and he that decreases will ultimately cease entirely using what god has given him finally he will be a dead branch on the vine what a stern utterance are these remarks against the antinomians by luther 
who is known throughout the Christian Church as the greatest witness for the magnitude and riches of the grace of God in Christ, and who, as few others in the Christian Church, had the gift of speaking words of comfort to men. You see, when it is incumbent upon him to preach the law, he is stern and incisive. He spares no one. He brings the staff hands down on all the secure. In his Instruction for Visitors, written in 1528, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 10, 1636 and following, As regards doctrine, we find, among other things, this to be the chief fault, that while some preach the faith by which we are to be made righteous, they do not give a sufficient explanation how we are to attain faith. Thus, nearly all of them omit an integral part of the Christian doctrine, without which no one can understand what faith is or what deserves the name faith. For Christ says, Luke 24, 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. However, nowadays many speak only of forgiveness of sins and say little or nothing regarding repentance, notwithstanding the fact that without repentance there is no remission of sins, nor can remission of sins be understood without repentance. If remission of sins without repentance is preached, the people imagine that they have already forgiveness of sins, and thereby they are made secure and unconcerned. This is a greater error and sin than all errors of former times, and it is verily to be feared that we are in that danger which Christ points out when he says, Matthew 12.45, The last state of that man shall be worse than the first. Accordingly, we have instructed and admonished the pastors to do their duty and preach the gospel entire, not one part without the other. For God says, Deuteronomy 4.2, that nothing is to be added to his word, nor anything to be taken from it. Our preachers nowadays scold the Pope for having made many additions to Scripture, which, alas, is but too true. But these men who do not preach repentance tear a great portion out of the Scriptures, and meanwhile talk about the eating of meats and such other trifling matters. Of course, on the proper occasion these matters are not to be passed over in silence, for Christian liberty must be defended against tyranny. But what else does the practice of the preachers to whom I have referred mean than straining at gnats and swallowing camels, as Christ expresses it in Matthew 23.24? We have admonished them, therefore, to exhort the people diligently and frequently unto repentance, contrition, and sorrow over their sin, and the fear of the judgment of God. We have warned them not to omit from their teaching the important and necessary element of repentance. For both John and Christ rebuked the Pharisees more sharply for their saintly hypocrisy than ordinary sinners. In like manner, pastors are to reprove the common people for their gross sins, but make their exhortations to repentance much sterner when they discover spurious sanctity. Shouting at masses of people, Believe! only believe in Christ, and you will be saved, leaves them in ignorance as to the preacher's object. The acts of the law must first come down on them. When they hear the thundering of the law and look up at the preacher startled, they begin to reflect, if the preacher is right, what is to become of us? Woe upon us! Then they are ready for the consolation of the gospel. Luther's statement about the greatness of the antinomian error as surpassing the errors of former times deserves to be noted. Before Luther began his activity, the law alone held sway. The poor people were in anguish and terror. When Luther had come to understand the gospel, he preached it in all its sweetness to these poor, stricken sinners. He was misunderstood by many who concluded that to preach like Luther they must preach faith justification and righteousness without the deeds of the law every Sunday. This practice of theirs Luther denounced as a greater error than the error of the papists. By preaching faith only, and saying nothing about repentance, the preacher leads his hearers to that awful condition where they imagine they are not in need of repentance, and finally they get so that they are past help. Note also this point in Luther's remarks that while it is indeed necessary to preach against gross vices, yet that is not what is meant by forcibly preaching the law. Such preaching produces nothing but Pharisees. End of Lecture 13
Lecture 14 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourteenth Evening Lecture, January 16, 1885 As regards the difference between the Lutheran and the Reformed Church, my friends, the Lutheran people, at least in former times, imagined that the whole difference was this, that in reciting the Lord's Prayer in German, the Lutheran put the word Father first, the Reformed the word Our, and that in the Lord's Supper wafers which are not broken are used in the Lutheran Church, while the Reformed Churches use ordinary bread which they break at the distribution or before. For this horrible ignorance the unfaithful ministers of our Church are to be blamed. They have shamefully neglected their people. In view of this ignorance, it is, of course, not surprising that these poor Lutherans finally yielded to overtures for a union with the Reformed. Recently, however, a change has taken place. The violently enforced establishment of the United Church in the very country where it was attempted first, in Prussia, has brought about a reconsideration by our beloved Lutheran people of the points of difference between the Reformed and the Lutheran Church. In 1817, when the Union was inaugurated, Klaus Harms, pastor and professor at the University of Kiel, published a new series of 95 theses for use at the celebration of the tercentenary of the Reformation. In Thesis 95, he says, A copulation is now contemplated, which is to enrich that poor handmaiden, the Lutheran Church. However, he adds this warning, Do not attempt it on Luther's grave. His bones will take on new life, and then the Lord have mercy on you. His prophecy has been fulfilled. Nowadays, any Lutheran child that has received at least a passable instruction in the Christian doctrine knows that there is indeed a great difference involving the principal articles of Christian doctrine between the Lutheran and the Reformed Church. Today the Lutheran people are well informed on this point. Lutherans adhere firmly to the words of Christ, forever true, this is my body, this is my blood. Lutherans accordingly believe that the body and blood of Christ are substantially and truly present in the Lord's Supper, and are administered to and received by the communicants. While those clear words, plain as daylight, are interpreted by the Reformed to mean, this signifies the body of Christ, this signifies his blood. Accordingly, the Reformed contend that the body and blood of Christ are removed from the Holy Supper as far as the heavens are from the earth, because they are limited to the heavenly mansions, and his return to earth is not to be expected until the last day. Nowadays all Lutheran people know that according to Scripture, the book of eternal truth, holy baptism is the washing of regeneration, a means by which regeneration is effected from on high through the Holy Spirit, while the Reform contend that baptism is merely a sign, symbol, or representation of something that has previously taken place in a person. Nowadays, all Lutheran people know that the human nature of Christ, through its union with the divine nature, has received also divine attributes, namely, that omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and the honor of adoration have been communicated to it. While the Reformed contend that between the man Christ and other men there is a difference only of degree, namely, that Christ has received greater gifts. However, even the highest gifts which his human nature possesses are claimed to be creature gifts, the same as in other creatures. Nowadays all Lutheran people know that according to the Holy Scriptures the saving grace of the Father is universal, so is the redemption of the Son, and likewise the effective calling of the Holy Spirit through the Word, while the teaching of the Reformed Church on these three points is particularistic because the Reformed most emphatically contend that God has created the greater part of the human race unto eternal damnation, and has accordingly assigned them even in eternity to everlasting death. In the clear light of the precious saving gospel, this is an appalling, a horrible doctrine. To be brief, every Lutheran knows nowadays that the difference between the Lutheran and the Reformed Church is fundamental. It lies not on the circumference, but in the very center of the Christian doctrine. What is the reason, then, that in spite of these facts, many who claim to be Lutherans have allowed themselves to become enmeshed in the unionistic net, 
and while claiming to be Lutherans, calmly remain in the union, which is nothing but an emergency device. They are in a church that has not been established by Christ, but by an earthly king, a church in which not all speak the same things, nor hold the same views, as the Apostle requires in 1 Corinthians 1, a church in which there is not that one faith, one baptism, one hope, which the Apostle, Ephesians 4, predicates of the church of Jesus Christ. What is the reason? It is nothing else than the notion that, spite of the many and grave errors of the Reformed Church, there is an agreement between it and the Lutheran Church in the principal points. It is claimed that the relation between these two churches is entirely different from that existing between the Lutheran and the Romish Church. There is truth in the claim mentioned last, but if the Reformed Church were in agreement with us in the main points, a consummation devoutly to be wished, it would speedily reach an agreement with us also in the few points of minor importance. But what the Reformed Church lacks is just this. It cannot correctly answer the question, What must I do to be saved? In the very doctrine of justification, the cardinal doctrine of the Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church is not in agreement with us. It does not point the right way to grace and salvation. Few there are in our day who perceive this point. All the Reformed, and the sects that are derived from the Reformed Church, affirm that a person is saved by grace alone. But the moment you examine their practice, you immediately discover that while they hold this truth in theory, they do not put it into effect, but rather point in the opposite direction. The thesis which we are approaching tonight invites a discussion of this subject. Thesis 9. In the fifth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when sinners who have been struck down and terrified by the law are directed not to the word and the sacraments, but to their own prayers and wrestlings with God, in order that they may win their way into a state of grace. In other words, when they are told to keep on praying and struggling until they feel that God has received them into grace. The doctrine which is denounced in this thesis is common to all the Reformed, and to the sects of Reformed origin, including the Baptists, the Methodists, the Evangelical Alliance, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians. All these are only branches of the great tree of the Reformed Church. The pure evangelical doctrine of the way in which a poor, alarmed sinner arrives at the assurance that God is gracious to him is not heard among these people. This way is not shown by any of these sects. In order to obtain a divine assurance regarding the proper way of rightly dividing the word, so as to meet the errors named in our thesis, let us examine a few pertinent examples recorded in Scripture. Let us observe the holy apostles, who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and, being prompted by Him, no doubt divided the word of God rightly, and showed alarmed sinners the right way to rest and peace and assurance of their state of grace with God. In order to remove every possible doubt, let us examine the treatment which the apostles accorded the greatest and grossest sinners. In Acts 2, we have a record of the way in which the Apostle Peter treated people who a few weeks previously had cried, Crucify, crucify him. These recreants, who at the tribunal of Pilate had shouted, Away with him! Hustle the cursed wretch to the gibbet! We shall gladly exchange him for Barabbas! Had been led by curiosity to the house where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place. They heard the roaring of the mighty wind, and came to investigate the phenomenon. We observe that Peter, to begin with, reproved those who mockingly said the apostles were filled with new wine. He showed them that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was nothing but the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. He next rehearses the story of the suffering, death, resurrection, and final ascension of Jesus, concluding with these words, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Though expressed in a few words, that was a terrible law sermon. Accordingly, we are told in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. When these words of the apostle struck their hearts, they had the sensation of having been stabbed there with a dagger. They trembled, they were horrified, and the Holy Spirit drove the apostles' thrust home and made them realize what a terrible sin they had committed 
by crucifying their own Messiah. And they said to Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? How does the apostle act in this instance? Does he say, You will have to make a personal effort to amend your conduct. You must come to a still more penitent knowledge of your sins. You must go down on your knees and cry for mercy. Perhaps God will then help you and receive you into grace. Nothing of the kind. He said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Metanoita, repent ye, means change your minds. It refers quite plainly to what is called the second part of repentance, namely, faith. The term is here used in the figure of a synecdoche, because the law had already done its work upon these hearers. Accordingly, it was far from the Apostle Peter's mind to bring about their salvation by hurting them into still greater distress, anguish, and terror. Now that their heart had been pricked, he was satisfied. They were now prepared to hear the most blessed gospel and receive it into their hearts. Therefore the Apostle now addressed them thus, You must change your minds and believe the gospel of the one crucified, you must dismiss all your errors and be baptized at once in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins this answer of the apostle testified to them when they received baptism your sins are forgiven you are now in a right relation to god your terrible sins are remembered no more the apostle adds these words and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost and the record of this incident is concluded thus for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. That is the whole story. Other demands the apostle did not make. His hearers were only to listen to his words and take comfort in these soothing words of consolation, this promise of the forgiveness of their sins, of life and salvation. We are not told about measures such as the sects in our day employ. More about these anon. That was the first sermon delivered by Peter, coming, so to speak, fresh from the forge of the Holy Spirit. He went to work with the most intense ardor of faith and with a single sermon gained three thousand souls, to whom he brought rest and peace and the assurance of salvation. In verse 42 we are told, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Hence, theirs was not a transient fervor, such as that frequently produced by itinerant enthusiasts in our day at their revivals. No, their hearts had been profoundly stirred and completely changed. They rejoiced, and cheerfully took upon themselves all ignominy and persecution, all sufferings which the Christians of that time had to endure. To this first example, illustrating the apostles' practice, let me add a second one, the conversion of the jailer at Philippi, which is recorded Acts 16. While we met with Jews in the first instance, we are here told about a heathen, and a very godless heathen at that. In verses 19 and 20 we read, and when her masters, the masters of the damsel from whom Paul had expelled the soothsaying spirit of divination, saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. That was their politic move. The Jews were universally hated and despised. They raised this further charge in verse 21 and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. These noble people claimed to be baked from better dough than any other nation. The record proceeds, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Mark you, without their having been given a due hearing. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Verses 22-24 
the jailer had not been ordered to apply the severe measures last named he did not know whether the apostles had been lawfully committed to jail but he did not care he was an inhuman brute the story continues and at midnight paul and silas prayed and sang praises unto god and the prisoners heard them verse twenty five undoubtedly the jailer too heard them and it surely must have made a powerful impression on him very likely he had expected them to sit in their cell gnashing their teeth and cursing the jailer instead he hears them chanting praises to god he must have mused these are queer men never before did i have prisoners in this house of correction like these and now we read and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and every one's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled verses twenty six through twenty seven inattention to duty was no joke under the government of the romans if prisoners escaped from jail the keeper of the prison was held responsible in the case of especially dangerous characters the jailer was apt to be punished with death if they escaped now this jailer did not believe in a god who would judge him accordingly he calculated thus since i am to be sentenced to death anyway what is life worth to me i prefer to be my own executioner but paul cried with a loud voice saying do thyself no harm for we are all here verse twenty eight imagine the impression that cry made on the jailer he had thrust the apostles into the inner prison and instead of bearing him a grudge for that and plotting revenge upon him they arrest his suicidal hand by shouting to him as they did from the psalms the apostles had sung the jailer had very likely understood this much that they were men who wished to tell people how to find a happy fate beyond hades in his great distress he now beseeches the apostles sirs what must i do to be saved verse thirty if the apostles had been fanatics they would have said to him my dear friend this is no easy matter before a godless reckless man like you can be saved an elaborate and extensive cure is necessary which we shall prescribe to you not a word of this they behold in the jailer a person fit to receive the gospel he was as godless as before he had not yet conceived of hatred of sin he says nothing about that all he wants is to escape the punishment of sin and obtain a happy blessed fate beyond the grave notwithstanding this we read and they said believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house and they spake unto him the word of the lord and to all that were in his house and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straightway verses thirty one through thirty three that same night the jailer is converted obtains faith and the assurance that he is accepted with god and reconciled he is become a beloved child of god what measures did the apostles apply to him nothing beyond proclaiming the gospel to him without any condition attached to it they tell him unqualifiedly believe on the lord jesus christ that makes the apostles practice plain in every instance where their word had produced faith they administered baptism immediately they did not say we have to take you through an extensive course of instruction and expound to you accurately and thoroughly all the articles of the christian creed after that we shall have to put you on probation to see whether you can become an approved christian nothing of the sort the jailer asks to be baptized because he knows that is the means for receiving him into the kingdom of christ and they promptly administer baptism to him compare with this apostolic practice that of the reformed church in our day i am referring to all the sects that have sprung forth from the reformed church if they were to see a lutheran minister adopting the practice of the apostles they would cry out how can that godless and lax preacher act that way why he ought first to impress on the sinner that he must feel the grace of god in his heart instead of that he comforts him and even baptizes him however that is the biblical method and being biblical it is the lutheran method for the lutheran church is nothing else than the bible church it does not deviate from the bible does not take aught away or add to it but stands squarely upon the word of god 
that is the leading principle which the Lutheran Church carries out in all its teachings and in its practice. In conclusion, we read, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. He had a good reason for rejoicing. He meant to declare that, while formerly he had no God and was without hope in this world, he had now found God and a Saviour who had redeemed him, having purchased him with his precious God's blood, and had given him the promise that he would come again and receive him into the kingdom of glory. That is the second example from the Apostles' practice, which exhibits their method of procedure when it devolved upon them to lead a person to the assurance of the grace of God. Let me now introduce the instance of the conversion of the Apostle Paul himself, recounted very beautifully by himself, Acts 22. How was this abominable man, who had horribly persecuted the Christians, converted? Speaking from the temple stairs to the excited Jewish mob, he begins the story of his conversion thus. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I now make unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. Verses 1 and 2. Nearly on every occasion when he appeared in public, especially before an audience of Jews, Paul told the story of his conversion. On this occasion he addressed them in Hebrew to arouse their attention. Few people at that time understood Hebrew well, but Paul, being a learned man, understood it well. In the complete silence that now fell upon his audience, not a word was lost to his hearers. He told them, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye are all this day. And I have persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went unto Damascus to bring them which were there, bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. Verses 3-5 through five. Paul classifies the Jews in their present state with himself in his unconverted state. He too had persecuted the new religion, forcing its adherents by painful tortures to renounce and abominate Christ. He proceeds, And it came to pass, that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around about me, and I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. Paul was to know that he was meant. He alone heard the voice. For that reason, too, Jesus addressed him by name. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Verses 6-10 through 10. He was to be converted by nothing else than the word, the Saviour at this point does not preach conversion to him. He is to learn through men what he is to do to be saved. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, Paul proceeds, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight and the same hour I looked upon him. Verses 11-13 through 13. Ananias had had a vision from the Lord in which he had been told what to say when he would see Saul. In view of the instruction he had received, he immediately, upon entering, addressed Saul as brother. Continuing his account, Paul relates, And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
verses 14 through 16. Ananias then does not say, first you must pray until you have a sensation of inward grace. No, he tells him, having come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus, your first step must be to receive baptism for the washing away of your sins, and then call upon the Lord Jesus. That is the true order of saving grace, not praying first for the grace of God, but after one has learned to know the grace of God. Prior to that he cannot pray acceptably. In this instance, the practice of the Lord himself is exhibited to us. He surely knows how to deal with poor sinners. As soon as Saul became alarmed about his sins, Jesus approached him with his consolation. He did not require him to experience all sorts of feelings, but promptly proclaimed to him the word of grace. That shows a true minister of Christ how to proceed when his object is to lead sinners who have been crushed by the law to the assurance of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. What now is the method of the sects? The very contrary of this. True, they also preach the law first with great sternness, which is quite proper. We do the same, following the method of the apostles and of Christ. The only wrong feature in this part of their preaching is their depiction of the infernal torments, which is usually done in such a drastic manner as to engage the imagination rather than make their words sink into the depth of the heart. True, they frequently preach excellent sermons on the law with its awful threatenings. Only they do not bring out its spiritual meaning. The faulty effect in the law preaching of most sects is this. Instead of reducing their hearers to the condition where they profess themselves poor, lost, and condemned sinners, who have deserved everlasting wrath, they put them in a state of mind which makes them say, Is it not terrible to hear God uttering such awful threatenings on account of sin? If you do not lead a man by the law to the point where he puts off completely the garment of his own righteousness, and declares himself a miserable, wicked man, whose heart is sinning day and night with his evil lusts, thoughts, desires, dispositions, and wishes of all kinds, you have not preached the law aright. A preacher of the law must make a person distrust himself even in the least matter until his dying hour and keep him confessing that he is a miserable creature, with no record of good deeds except those which God has accomplished through him, spite of the corrupting, deteriorating, and poisoning effects of his own act. If the heart is not put in such a condition, the person is not properly prepared for the reception of the gospel. But the incorrect preaching of the law is not the worst feature of the sects. They do not preach the gospel to such as are alarmed and in anguish. They imagine they would commit the worst sin by immediately offering consolation to such poor souls. They give them a long list of efforts that they must make, in order, if possible, to be received into grace. How long they must pray, how strenuously they must fight and wrestle and cry, until they can say that they feel they have received the Holy Ghost and divine grace, and can rise from their knees shouting Alleluias. In order to accelerate this process in larger gatherings, Methodist preachers induce the brothers and sisters to kneel with the candidate for conversion and cry for the forgiveness of his sins. Sometimes the effort is futile. Sometimes the desired result is not attained in weeks and months. If a sincere candidate confesses that he only feels his inability and is full of evil inclinations, he is told that he is still in a sorry condition and that he must continue to wrestle in prayer until he finally experiences a feeling of divine grace. Then he is told to praise God because he is rid of sin. All is well with him, the penitential agony is over, and he has become a child of God's grace. But the required feeling may rest on a false foundation. It may not be the testimony of the Holy Spirit in the heart, but a physical effect, produced by the lively presentation of the preacher. That explains why sincere persons who have become believers not infrequently feel one moment that they have found the Lord Jesus, and in the next that they have lost him again. Now they imagine that they are in a state of grace, at another time that they are fallen from grace. What distress is created for such souls in their dying hour, when they have no sensation of grace, and are worried with the awful thought of damnation and eternal perdition? This may happen oftener than we think. I have no doubt, however, that the Holy Spirit comes to the aid of such poor souls that have been in the hands of such bad practitioners, 
and makes them cast all their reliance on their own laboring, wrestling, and striving overboard, throw themselves into the arms of the free grace of God, and die in peace. However, that blessed effect, wherever it occurs, is not due to Methodist preaching, but to the operation of the Holy Spirit, spite of the Methodist preaching. We gather from what I have stated, that the faulty practice under review is based on three awful errors. In the first place, the sects neither believe nor teach a real and complete reconciliation of man with God, because they regard our Heavenly Father as being a God very hard to deal with, whose heart must be softened by passionate cries and bitter tears. That amounts to a denial of Jesus Christ, who has long ago turned the heart of God to men by reconciling the entire world with him. God does nothing by halves. In Christ he loves all sinners without exception. The sins of every sinner are cancelled. Every debt has been liquidated. There is no longer anything that a poor sinner has to fear when he approaches his heavenly Father, with whom he has been reconciled by Christ. However, people imagine that after Christ has done his share, man must still do his, and man is not reconciled to God until both efforts are met. The sects picture reconciliation as consisting in this, that the Saviour made God willing to save men, provided men would be willing on their part to be reconciled. But that is the reverse of the gospel. God is reconciled. Accordingly, the Apostle Paul calls on us, Be ye reconciled to God. That means, since God has been reconciled to you by Christ Jesus, grasp the hand which the Father in heaven holds out to you. Moreover, the Apostle declares, If one died for all, then we're all dead. 2 Corinthians 5.14 That means, if Christ died for the sins of all men, that is tantamount to all men's dying and making satisfaction for their sins. Therefore, nothing at all is required on the part of man to reconcile God. He already is reconciled. Righteousness lies ready. It must not be achieved by man first. If man were to attempt to do so, that would be an awful crime, a battle against grace and against the reconciliation and perfect redemption accomplished by the Son of God. In the second place, the sects teach false doctrine concerning the gospel. They regard it as nothing else than an instruction for man, teaching him what he must do to secure the grace of God, while in reality the gospel is God's proclamation to men, Ye are redeemed from your sins, ye are reconciled to God, your sins are forgiven. No sectarian preacher dare make this frank statement. If one of them, for instance Spurgeon, does do it in some of his sermons, it is a Lutheran element in the teaching of the sects, and an exception to the rule. Moreover, he is being severely criticized for it as going too far. In the third place, the sects teach false doctrine concerning faith. They regard it as a quality in man by which he is improved. For that reason they consider faith such an extraordinarily important and salutary matter. It is true, indeed, that genuine faith changes a person completely. It brings love into a person's heart. Faith cannot be without love, just as little as fire can be without heat. But this quality of faith is not the reason why it justifies us, giving us what Christ has acquired for us, what hence is ours already, and only need be received by us. The scriptural answer to the question, What must I do to be saved? is, You must believe. Hence you are not to do anything at all yourself. In that sense the apostle answered the question when it was addressed to him. He practically told the jailer, You are to do nothing but accept what God has done for you, and you have it, and become a blessed person. That is the precious teaching of the divine word. Having this doctrine, what exceedingly happy and blessed people we Lutherans are! This teaching takes us to Christ by a straight route, it opens heaven to us when we feel hell in our hearts. It enables us to obtain grace at any moment without losing time by following a wrong way, striving for grace by our own effort, as we sometimes do with a good intention. We can approach Christ directly and say, Lord Jesus, I am a poor sinner, I know it. That has been my experience in the past, 
and when I reflect what is going on in my heart now, I must say, that is still my experience. But thou hast called me by thy gospel. I come to thee just as I am, for I could come no other way. That is the saving doctrine which the evangelical Lutheran Church has learned from Christ and the apostles. Use this doctrine to your own advantage, my friends. It would be awful if one of you would have to retire this evening with the thought in his heart, I do not know whether God is gracious to me, whether he has accepted me as his child, and whether my sins are forgiven. If God were to call me hence to-night, I would not be sure whether I should die saved. God grant that no one of you will retire in that frame of mind, for he would lie down to rest with the wrath of God abiding on him. God's disposition toward us is as we picture it to ourselves. If one believes that God is gracious to him, he certainly has a gracious God. If we dress our Heavenly Father up as a scarecrow, as a God who is angry with us, we have an angry God, and his wrath rests upon us. However, the God that is angry with us has been removed by our Savior. We now have a God who takes pity on us. I cherish another wish concerning you, to wit, that you may be filled with great cheerfulness to proclaim this most blessed doctrine some day with joy to your congregations. If you had to preach nothing else than sterile ethics, you might consider that a tedious task, yielding meager results. But if you have experienced in your heart what it means to convey to poor, lost, and condemned sinners the consolation of the gospel, and say to them, Do but come and believe, I say, if you believe this and ponder the full meaning of this, you cannot but look forward with joy to the day when you will stand for the first time before your congregations to deliver this august message. Moreover, you will surely be forced to say, I have certainly chosen the most beautiful and glorious calling on earth, for a messenger of good tidings is always welcome. God grant that by his gracious help such may be your good fortune. End of Lecture 14《ラクチュー15 of the proper distinction between law and gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifteenth evening lecture, January twenty third, eighteen eighty five. My dear friends, beloved in the Lord, you know that the papists teach that even godly persons do not enter heaven immediately after death, but before being admitted to the vision of God must first pass through a so-called purgatory, where they are supposed to become purged by fire, with horrible torments, from sins for which they had not made full atonement. Worse than this, the papists teach that no person, not even a sincere Christian, can be assured in the present life that he is in a state of grace with God, that he has received forgiveness of sins and will go to heaven. Only a few, they say, are accepted from this rule, namely the holy apostles and extraordinarily great saints, to whom God has given advanced information by revealing to them in an extraordinary manner that they will reach the heavenly goal. This is the doctrine of the Antichrist, absolutely without comfort. You know that our Lutheran Church teaches the very opposite. It is a pity that the great majority of nominal Lutherans, while cherishing a kind of human hope that they are accepted with God, that they have obtained forgiveness of sin and will be saved, nevertheless have no assurance of these matters. This sad phenomenon proves that such Lutherans, far from having received the Lutheran doctrine into their hearts, have no knowledge of it at all. How could the Christian doctrine be called the Evangel, that is, glad tidings, if those who accept it must be in constant doubt whether their sins are covered, whether God looks upon them as righteous people, and whether they will go to heaven? If even a Christian cannot know what his relation to God is and what his fate will be in eternity, whether damnation or salvation, what difference would there be between a Christian and a heathen, the latter of whom lives without God and without hope in this world? Does not Holy Scripture say, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? Hebrews 11.1 1. Luther translates, Faith is having a sure confidence regarding things hoped for, and not doubting things unseen. Does not our blessed Lord Jesus say, 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11.28 Does he not say, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst? John 4.14 Does he not say, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand? John 10.27-28 if the aforementioned doctrine of doubt were true, would not all these sayings be empty delusions? Yea, I shudder to say it, lies and cheats. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ requires of his followers that they wrestle with their own flesh and blood, the world and the devil, and that they be faithful unto death. He requires of them that they renounce all that they have, come to him, take his cross upon themselves, deny themselves and follow him. He tells them in advance, that if they side with him, the world will hate them, revile them, and persecute them unto death. If the aforementioned doctrine of doubt were right, who would desire to come to Christ, side with him, and fight all the great and dreadful battles of this life, following his crimson banner? Who could muster the strength to follow after holiness, if he had to doubt whether he will ever reach the heavenly goal? Indeed, any one who has received this doctrine of doubt into his heart is an unhappy man, he remains forever a sorry slave of the law. He is constantly told by his conscience, It is not well with you. Who can tell what God's thoughts are concerning you, what punishment is awaiting you? Unquestionably, this doctrine of doubt is the most horrible error into which a Christian can fall, for it puts Christ, his redemption, and the entire gospel to shame. It is, therefore, no jesting matter. Where are we to look for the root of this error? nowhere else than in the commingling of law and gospel. Let us learn then rightly to divide the word of God, the law and the gospel, which the Apostle Paul requires of every servant of the church of God. A week ago we gained the conviction that preaching the word of God, namely the gospel, to a person who is sincerely alarmed over his sins, simply to call upon him to believe and apply it to himself, and never question the truth of this heavenly message of grace, that this is the only right way to give him assurance of the forgiveness of sin, and a like assurance of his salvation. After that he is to be exhorted, if he is still unbaptized, to receive baptism for the remission of sins. For evidence that this is the only right way, three examples from Holy Writ, recounting instances of conversion, were given us, namely, the conversion of the three thousand on the first festival of Pentecost by the preaching of the Apostle Peter, the conversion of the jailer at Philippi, and the marvelous conversion of the Apostle Paul, as told by himself in Acts. We also learned that it is a false method to prescribe to an alarmed sinner all manner of rules for his conduct, telling him what he has to do, how earnestly and how long he must pray and wrestle and struggle until he hears a mysterious voice whispering in his heart, Your sins are forgiven, you are a child of God, you are converted or until he feels that the grace of God has been poured out into his heart. That is the method adopted for conversion by all the reformed sects and their adherents. Would that this method of conversion were not found in the Lutheran Church, but alas, such is the case. At first the pietists tried to convert people by this method. In some points they were quite right. The Lutheran Church in those days had gone to sleep. It lay shrouded in spiritual death. The pietists desired to come to the rescue. However, instead of going back to the purity of teaching of the Church of the Reformation, and learning from that age how to quicken the spiritually dead, they adopted the method of the Reformed. Let me illustrate this by the example of Dr. John Philip Fresenius, born 1705, died 1761. Since 1748, he was senior of the ministerium at Frankfurt on the Main. He was a most excellent man, unquestionably a sincere Christian, a godly, pious author of many beautiful devotional writings, in which there is little to criticize. With great earnestness he wrote against the Papists, the Jesuits, and the Herrenhutters. His attacks upon the Herrenhutters put him under a cloud in circles of believers at that time. Even in his boyhood, Fresenius was a zealous Christian. In gatherings of the boys in his place, he did mission work among them and tried to convert them. He kept up this spirit until he entered the University of Strasbourg, where he studied with sturdy zeal and became a profound scholar. His father, who was in poor circumstances, did not like to see him enter the university, 
but John Philip went to Strasbourg, relying on the help of God. Frequently he was in pitiful straits, living for quite a while on bread and water in a miserable lodging, until his professors heard of it and secured free lodging and board for him. One of his most popular books is his book on Confession and Communion, which was published in 1745. In a short time it went through eight editions. There were no believers in those days who did not own this book. In 1845 it was published in a new edition by Meyer, who not only failed to remove its errors, but even added some of his own. My reason for illustrating by this very book how even Lutherans mingle the law with the gospel is because I had some very sad personal experience with this book. After graduating from college, I entered the university. I was no outspoken unbeliever, for my parents were believers. But I had left my parents' home already when I was eight years old, and all my associates were unbelievers. So were all my professors, with the exception of one, in whom there seemed to be a faint trace of faith. When I entered the university, I did not know the Ten Commandments by heart, and could not recite the list of the books of the Bible. My knowledge of the Bible was pitiful, and I had not an inkling of faith. However, I had an older brother who had entered the university before me. Not long before my arrival he had joined a society of converted people. Upon my arrival he introduced me to this circle of Christian students. I had no premonition of the fate I was approaching, but I had great respect for my brother, who invited me to come with him. At first I was attracted merely by the friendly and kind manner in which these students treated me. I was not used to such treatment, for at our college the intercourse of students had been a rather rough affair. I liked the manner of these students exceedingly well. At first, then, it was not the word of God that attracted me. But I began to like the company of these Christian students so much that I gladly attended even their prayer meetings, for they conducted such meetings. Lo and behold! It was there that God began to work on my soul by means of his word. In a short time, I had really become a child of God, a believer who trusted in his grace. Of course, I was not deeply grounded in Christian knowledge. This state of affairs was continued for nearly half a year. Then an old candidate of theology, a genuine pietist, entered our circle. He could not expect ever to obtain pastorate in the state church, as at that time rationalism held sway everywhere. The other students thought we were crazy and shunned us as one does people who are afflicted with a contagious disease. That was the sad state of affairs in Germany at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, this candidate who came to us said, You imagine you are converted Christians, don't you? But you are not. You have not yet passed through any real penitential agony. I fought this view day and night, thinking at first that he meant to take us from under the sway of the gospel and put us back under the law but he kept repeating his assertion until I finally began to ask myself whether I really was a Christian. At first I felt so happy, believing in my Lord Jesus Christ. Now there began for me a period of the severest spiritual afflictions. I went to the candidate and asked him, what must I do to be saved? He prescribed a number of things that I was to do and gave me several books to read, among them Fresenius's Book on Confession and Communion. The further I got in reading the book, the more uncertain I became whether I was a Christian. An inner voice kept saying to me, The evidence that you have the requirements of a Christian is insufficient. To make matters worse, the aforementioned candidate was more pietistic than Fresenius himself. At that time, when opening any religious book treating of the order of grace and salvation, I would read only the chapter on repentance. When I would come to the chapters on the gospel and faith, I would close the book, saying, That is not for me. An increasing darkness settled on my soul as I tasted less and less of the sweetness of the gospel. God knows I did not mean to work a delusion on myself. I wanted to be saved. In those days I regarded those as the best books, which spoke a stern language to sinners, and left them nothing of the grace of God. Finally, I heard of a man who was reported to be a real spiritual physician. I wrote to him with the thought in my mind that if he were to say something to me about the grace of God and the gospel, I would throw this letter into the stove. However, his letter was so full of comfort that I could not resist its arguments. That is how I was brought out of my miserable condition into which I had been led, chiefly by Fresenius. What happy students are those 
who are immediately given the blessed and comforting doctrine of the gospel. However, experience teaches that the very abundance of the pure doctrine of the divine word is treated with growing contempt. This is deplorable indeed. In his book, Fresenius divides all communicants into nine classes. I did not fit into any one of them. The sainted Pastor Kyle, who certainly was a sincere Christian, assured me that he had no better luck. That is the result of dissecting a person's spiritual condition, as Fresenius had done, who enumerates the types of communicants as follows. 1. Unworthy communicants. 2. Such as are sincere seekers after grace, but have obtained no assurance. 3. Such as are assured of their state of grace, especially spiritual infants, or puny beginners in Christianity. 4. Young men, or such as have attained to some strength of faith. 5. Fathers, or tried Christians. 6. Such as are in great spiritual afflictions. Though I was afflicted, I did not qualify for this class. 7. Such as rejoice in God. 8. Such as are fallen from grace. 9. Such as are in a state of distress. Speaking of the first, Fresenius writes, chapter 3, paragraph 11, If sinners of this type are to be able to obtain the forgiveness of sins and to receive the body and blood of Christ worthily, everything depends on their conversion. Accordingly, I shall here offer a faithful instruction regarding the points that have to be observed on their part, in order that they may be thoroughly converted in a short time. The remark, in a short time, sounded like gospel to me, and I wish that it might be so in my case. I have tested the good quality of this instruction on many sinners in the past, and found that it resulted in the certain salvation of every one who faithfully followed it. With great heartfelt joy I observed that even such sinners as had been bound by Satan with exceptionally strong fetters were, in a short time, by this method, brought into a state where they could be regarded as new creatures in Christ. It is a straight and simple method, without any great subtleties, and requiring no efforts on the part of the patient. All he has to do is to let God work in him, for it is he, after all, who must give us everything that we need. All depends on three rules which the sinner must observe. They are derived from the inmost nature of the divine order of salvation, and are such that, if faithfully applied, the worst slaves of the devil are helped by them. If any one is not helped, he must blame his own unfaithfulness for it, and not the rules. I resolve gladly to obey all the rules. The first rule is, pray for grace. The second, be watchful, lest you lose grace. The third, meditate upon the word of God in a proper manner. Since a sinner cannot convert himself, he must pray for the grace of conversion. Since the grace which he has obtained in answer to his prayers can easily be lost, he must be watchful. Since the word of God is the means of grace by which we are enlightened and regenerated, or the change of heart is accomplished in adults, he must meditate upon it in a proper manner. This shows that these three rules have been derived from the inmost nature of the divine order of salvation. A brief explanation of these rules, one by one, will be of help towards learning how to observe them. As regards the first rule, the person desiring the grace of conversion must pray for it. As if an unconverted person could seriously pray for conversion. He should have said, he must hear the word of God. But that he has put into his third rule. His whole scheme makes conversion dependent upon man's own effort to obtain grace. This prayer must be of different quality than formerly, when he was still under the rule of sin. It must not be a frigid, unfamiliar, lifeless operation of the lips, but must be offered up with great heartfelt earnestness. You enter your closet, as the Savior advises in Matthew 6.6, 6, or wherever you can speak to God in private. Bow your knees, and with all your might cry for grace, not only for the grace that God may forgive your sins, but also for the grace that your heart may be changed, and the love of sin destroyed in you. Since Christ has acquired for us even the first, or converting grace, you base even your first prayer on his merit, and call upon God to grant you converting grace for the reason that the Lord Jesus has paid so precious a ransom for you. This prayer you should offer not once or twice, but you must continue offering it daily, with sighs and strong crying, until you obtain grace, 
which assures you from your own experience that your heart has been truly changed. Fresenius actually speaks of a person in whom sin is still dominant. His primary error, proton pseudos, is the false distinction between being converted and quickened. As a matter of fact, any one who has been quickened, that is, raised from spiritual death, is converted. After his conversion, he must indeed pray and wrestle. His faith at the beginning is like an infant that can easily die if it is not given nourishment. Praying and wrestling is not an exercise for unconverted, however, but for converted persons. Fresenius speaks as if forgiveness of sins and renewal of the heart were two different things, occurring at different times. The fact is, that when I have the forgiveness of my sins, my heart is changed, and the love of sin has been destroyed. As regards the remarks of Fresenius about continuously crying to God until he bestows grace, has he ever heard that God is a hard-hearted being that must be softened by a person's prayers and by wrestling with him? He talks of a converted person as of one who is still to be converted. For basing one's prayer on the merits of Christ means believing in Christ. No matter how good the intention of Fresenius was, what he writes is awful. While speaking of the merits of Christ, he directs man to his own works, by which nothing will ever be achieved. His advice to cry to God, until you obtain grace, means, as the words that follow show, until you have a feeling of grace. That sweet sensation which satisfies their hearts is what these people call grace. But grace is not something for which I must look in my heart. It is in the heart of God. Grace cannot be found in me, but is outside of me. If good old Fresenius had said all these things of a believing Christian, they would be correct. A Christian must do all these things. But before he is a Christian, he is spiritually dead. He has no spiritual vision, no spiritual hearing, no spiritual sensorium. Fresenius proceeds. Some of my readers may say, Granted that grace is obtained by praying, Yet how can a sinner pray in the manner stated? Is not prayer itself an effect of divine grace, which we do not produce in ourselves while we are dead in sins? Answer. This kind of prayer is indeed an operation of grace, which the sinner, dead in trespasses, cannot perform by his own power. But we know that prevenient or quickening grace quite often and earnestly knocks for admission into our heart for the purpose of rousing us from our sleep in sin. Whenever this happens, grace offers to the sinner something that he has not, namely, the strength to utter sighs and cry for help from the abyss of sin, as he should. The sinner himself can observe this if he is attentive. Often he is thrown into unrest because of his condition by the word of God, by sickness, by the death of other people, by terrible dreams, by the thought of his own death, of the future judgment, of hell and heaven, and like things. In that moment, a desire for salvation and a mysterious sign for grace begins to stir in him. Now this desire and sign is not a natural action of his, but it is from an energy which quickening grace has already produced in him. If he accepts this energy, it is no longer impossible for him to call upon God, pray and cry as his condition requires. And while he is so doing, his strength to pray is continually increased by grace. Imagine giving this advice to a person dead in sins, as if such a person could do anything by an alien force. By these dangerous directions, sincere hearts that have not passed through all these required experiences will be led to believe themselves quickened, but not yet converted. Thousands, yea, millions, have been tormented with the thought that they are still unconverted. The sign for grace of which Presenius speaks is nothing else than the first spark of faith. It is never a power that is given a person for the purpose that he may achieve grace by using it. There is not a word of all these directions in Scripture. After we have become believers, we are told to wrestle with the devil, who wants to rob us of the grace we have received. It is indeed, as I have stated, while a person is still unconverted, he is spiritually dead, hence without any strength. Even if strength were breathed into him, he could not use it as long as he is dead. Try and breathe strength into a statue, and see whether it will move. 
Modern theology is completely under the control of this error that man converts himself by spiritual powers that are conferred on him. Presenius continues, Other readers may object that even Scripture declares that God heareth not sinners. John 9.31 Hence it is useless for them to want to pray, for God testifies distinctly to the Israelites, When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Isaiah 1.15 I answer, These and similar passages of Scripture refer only to such sinners as pray for the averting of the vindictive judgments of God, for forgiveness of sin, or for nothing better than help in the temporal affairs, not, however, for a change of heart. While offering their prayers, they retain the settled purpose to continue in their ruling sins and discharge their prayer not in the power of the Holy Spirit, but by their natural powers. In the nature of their case, then, they cannot be heard, while in their perverse condition and cherishing their false purpose. David says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The sinners, however, to whom we refer, seek not only forgiveness, but also a genuine change of heart, and their earnest endeavor is to be converted. Accordingly, also, their prayer is an effect of divine grace. Now, God cannot despise his own work. It follows, then, that a prayer of this kind is truly heard, and the experience of many persons confirms this fact. Fresenius is right in what he says about the faulty object of many prayers. But a prayer for a change of heart will not be offered except by a person in whom such a change has been begun. Only a believer is a person of this kind. While still an unbeliever, a person is dead in sins, takes serious matters lightly, and is unconcerned about whether he will go to heaven or hell if he should die the next night. He trusts in God's goodness in a carnal fashion. However, a person who is concerned about his conversion already is converted. Unconverted persons have no such concern as true Christians have, who are always concerned about their soul's salvation. The last remark of Fresenius comes natural to a theologian who makes a false distinction between being quickened and being converted, and even ascribes enlightenment to a person still in spiritual blindness. The second rule, Fresenius continues, is this. A person earnestly desiring to be converted must be on his guard to keep the grace which God has conferred on him. When God bestows the power to pray, he bestows at the same time the power to be watchful, and this power must be exercised with great care and earnestness. Such a person guards his own heart, lest it be ruled by sinful thoughts, which hinder the operation of divine grace. He guards his eyes and ears, lest new filth be carried into the heart by these avenues of approach, and the inner work of the Holy Spirit be disturbed. He guards his tongue, lest by insincere and sinful words it grieve the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4, 29-30 And the heart be deceived. James 1, 26 he guards his associations when mingling with other people, so as to keep away from anything evil, to quit once and forever the sinful friendship of the world, which is enmity against God. James 4.4 4. And whenever his professional duties lead him into the company of evil men, to make his heart firm against their evil doings, lest he become a partaker of other men's sins. He guards his entire conversation, lest he be contaminated again with intentional sins. He guards the operations of divine grace, so as to give them more room, and to heed particularly the seasons of gracious visitation, when God rouses him afresh into prayer, the meditation of his word, the wrestling with sin, the exercise of neighborly love, in order that at such times he may enter more thoroughly into grace by his signs and supplications. This watchfulness is greatly needed in conversion, and the person failing in it, and giving room to sin in his inner life or outward conduct cannot possibly be brought around to the right way. Many persons make an earnest beginning of the task of their conversion. They beg and cry for grace, and God gives them as much grace as they are willing to accept. For a while they will run well, Galatians 5.7, but they are not in earnest about being watchful. They are not constant, and thus they lose the grace which they have obtained and the enemy again takes possession of their heart. In this connection it is to be noted 
that watchfulness offers some difficulties in the beginning of a person's conversion. However, if he is but faithful, it becomes increasingly easy, until, by exercise, the person obtains such a happy aptness for this work that he thinks he cannot but constantly be on his guard. But in view of the aforementioned difficulty, it occasionally happens, at the beginning of conversion, that a person, by imprudence, suffers damage from the enemy, either in his inner life or in his outward conduct. Whenever this happens, we are not to despair, but to take fresh courage, flee to Jesus, and heartily pray for forgiveness of the imprudent act, and for the grace of greater circumspection. Accordingly, praying and watching take turns about in a Christian, and cooperate harmoniously. What Fresenius says is well enough when said in reference to a beginner in the Christian faith. He describes the complete work of sanctification and expects all these things of an unconverted person. It is almost inconceivable that so learned and experienced a minister should have failed to see this point. Even the love of a person's fellow man is assumed prior to his conversion. That is the dangerous feature of this instruction. Any honest Christian reader will say to himself, Since all these things are first to take place in me, I must pass for an unconverted person. It is awful to hear Fresenius speak of entering more thoroughly into grace, since grace is something in the heart of God. Grace is obtained either entire or not at all. It is never given piecemeal, as Luther puts it. A person is either a child of the devil or a child of God, either in the kingdom of darkness or in the kingdom of light, either in the state of grace with God or under his wrath. There is no middle ground. What Fresenius says about the necessity of watchfulness for conversion involves an equivocal use of the term grace, which is the cause of his error. He overlooks that Paul's charge against the Galatians, chapter 5-7, was directed against people who were already converted. The dangers attending a person's carelessness which he depicts are true, but it is wrong to say that by the opposite conduct a person is converted. It seems a mere afterthought in the scheme of Fresenius to remind his readers of the refuge that is open to them in Christ. Now we take up Fresenius's third rule, namely, that the word of God must be meditated in the proper manner we shall see that he is speaking exclusively of the power of the divine word to change the heart of man. He is not speaking, and it seems he is entirely ignorant, of the collative power of the word of God, by which gifts, like justification, are not only described, but at the same time conferred and communicated. The statement, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, produces faith in the statement, and therewith communicates the blessing described. When listening to a preacher, we must imagine that God stands behind him. When he speaks words of comfort to me, I must say to myself that it is God who is speaking to me. When he pronounces forgiveness of sin to me, I must not merely think that because these words are in the Bible, I am to derive some benefit from them, but I must say to myself, by these words God himself imparts forgiveness of sin to me. But this doctrine, alas, has vanished from the Lutheran Church for a long time. Presinius writes, A person desiring to be converted must meditate upon the word of God in a proper manner. This is done by reading as well as by hearing the word. The word is read in a proper manner by a person when he reads it for the purpose of being enlightened by it and being transformed into a new man by its power. Before, during, and after reading there must be a prayer for grace. Not a great quantity, but a little must be read. At every powerful passage there must be a halt. The heart must be lifted up to God, and the passage must be recited with a brief sigh and prayer that it may become effective in the reader. Beginners in particular are to be advised to read in this manner. First, the four Gospels, because they set before us the Lord Jesus with his grace and example. After that, the same method may be followed for the reading of the remainder of the New Testament, the Psalms of David, and other books of Holy Writ. Anything that the reader fails to understand, he should reverently pass by, not stopping for doubtful musings, but holding on to what is clear and plain, in the certain hope that, of the remainder, God will gradually open up to him as much as he needs. 
The word of God is heard in a proper manner when it is heard from preachers who present it in its purity, when it is heard with the same purpose as when it is read, when God is invoked for his gracious power and work before, during, and after hearing the word, when it is gladly received, and those passages in particular are noted which apply to that person's condition, finally, when it is kept and revolved and permitted to enter even more deeply into the heart. Fresenius does not say a word about this, that whoever believes the Scriptures receives what they say. They do not merely tell about gifts of grace, but also offer and confer them. The Word is a distributing and appropriating instrument of grace. In Fresenius's scheme, everything is made to depend on the person's conduct. It is a questionable piece of advice to read little of Scripture. Halting occasionally at particular passages is proper, but a true Christian must also read the entire Bible rapidly in order to have a general knowledge of its contents. A quiet reflection upon these contents should go hand in hand with the reading. Fresenius's advice would be excellent if he had not offered it to a person who is still to be converted. That is what makes his scheme wrong. Fresenius concludes his explanation of the three rules for such as are not yet converted but would like to be, with these remarks. Anyone putting these three rules to practice, with all possible fidelity, will in a short time become a different person, and the grace of God will work in him so effectively that he will discover in himself, with growing distinctness, the marks of a new creature in Christ. I ask you now, where do we find an advice of this kind in the Bible? Whenever the apostles preached, and their hearers asked them what must we do to be saved, they returned no other answer than this, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only correct method to be adopted by a preacher who wants to lead men to faith and to an assurance of the forgiveness of their sins and of eternal life. When following this method, he must not omit urgently to recommend prayer, wrestling and struggling, and the proper use of the word of God at all times to those who have been led by this right way to the assurance of the forgiveness of their sins and of the state of grace. For, from the opposition of orthodox Lutherans to this wrong method, you must not infer that they are no friends of genuine, earnest Christianity, of earnest and incessant prayer, of earnest wrestling with sin and constant watchfulness. On the contrary, sincere Lutherans show as great zeal in these matters as in their refusal to lead men to Christ by a roundabout way. End of Lecture 15